Halloween used to be my favorite time of the year. I was kind of a horror freak. I loved horror novels, movies, and games. I spent hours absorbing all the YouTube creepypasta stories I could find. But that all changed one Halloween night when myself and a few friends found something that would change our lives forever. This is the story of the Dead House. I always did love that air of chaos that presents on Halloween night. That twisted, festive feeling that adds a spark of excitement to an otherwise dark and dreary time of the year. We were too old to be trick-or-treating, but we still wanted to wander the streets and soak up the atmosphere. Besides, there's a lot you can get away with in costume, especially when you pour your bottle of adult beverage into a Mountain Dew bottle and label it Spooky Juice. Our buddy Spike had comprehensively won our internal costume contest with his own homemade proton pack and Ghostbusters jumpsuit. He'd spent weeks on it, watching little YouTube painting tutorials and binge-watching the movies for minor details. It looked amazing and he wasn't about to miss out on the opportunity to show the thing off. So off we went, wandering around the neighborhood and eating store-bought candy. Since we were way too old to be trick-or-treating, part of the fun of these Halloween walkabouts was seeing the spectacular ways that fellow Halloween enthusiasts had decorated their houses. Over the years, it became something of a competition, and each year the decorations became more and more elaborate. I remember one family had gone as far as digging a small pit in their front lawn. They put some red lights in there, then covered the thing over with wooden boards that were complete with fake zombie fingers reaching out between the slats. It looked amazing and we found ourselves joining a gaggle of parents and taking selfies with the chillingly original decoration. We saw some pretty impressive stuff that evening, from fake bodies hanging from trees to chained up dogs that had been dressed up as adorable little hounds, but nothing caught our attention like the house at the end of Bachman Street. So a lot of you have heard of these hell houses that crop up around Halloween every year. The most infamous being these guerrilla operations where people can make a few bucks while indulging in a little of the Halloween spirit. So when you saw the house at the end of Bachman Street with its doors wide open, we figured it was just part of the display. A couple was heading away from the house looking pretty scared so we asked them what the deal was with the front door being left open. Oh man... They really went all out this year, one of the pair said. It's so realistic in there. We left a few dollars on the table as a thank you. There's no tip jar anywhere, so you guys gotta see it, though. On that, we agreed. Something that was actually scary, right here in our own neighborhood? We had to see it. We studied the house intently as we wandered down the street towards it. The facade was barely decorated compared to the others we'd seen. Just a carved pumpkin and a few plastic hanging skeletons were all we could see on approach. But there was something odd about the way the cars were parked in the driveway. Something weirdly chaotic. Anyway, we wander up to the front door, peering inside before entering. But again, there doesn't seem to be any extensive decoration on the inside either. That all changes once we enter the kitchen. One of the dining chairs was dripping with gore ropes around the armrests hanging freely as they'd been cut away from someone's arms. Lay down on the table nearby were all kinds of bloody kitchen utensils, some still clogged with shredded flesh. Flies buzzed around us, landing on the body in various bloodstains around the room. Wow, one of us said softly. You can see where they use corn syrup to make the blood. House flies love that stuff. How did they get that kind of stink up in there? Another asked. But we didn't put too much thought into it. We were so overwhelmed and impressed that we just carried on moving through the house. The living room was somehow even more disturbing than the kitchen. Sat on a small, dark wood coffee table was a kind of homemade doll. It was a cluster of roots and twigs, all bound and woven together with reeds and dry grass. The face of the thing was made of clay, a single shiny stone pushed into it, resembling a kind of cyclopean eye. Arranged around it in a perfect circle were severed fingers, toes, and plucked out eyes. There was also a cluster of dollar bills from the couple's recent visit. I took out my wallet, 
taking out a few old singles before asking around to see if my buddies had anything to leave as a kind of thank you. There must have been about fourteen dollars in ones and twos in my hand by the time I let it drop onto the coffee table. Now come on, let's see the upstairs, then get out of here, this place is giving me the creeps. I said. My buddies wouldn't let me hear the end of it. Scared by a family-run hell house, what an idiot. But when we saw the kids' bedroom, they were scared too. Inside, sitting among a carpet of stuffies and kids' toys, was a man. At first, all we could see was the back of him. He had long, thin gray hair and had somehow fit himself into a little girl's pink, frilly nightgown. We all froze in the doorway, staring wide-eyed as the creepy-looking old guy just sat there, playing with the toys, putting on little childish voices as he played at making them talk to one another. It was one of the most disturbing things I'd ever seen in my entire life. Whoever had thought that character up must have had one seriously disturbed imagination. The man turned still as a statue for a moment, sensing our presence behind him. When we turned, we saw his milky white eyes and blackening teeth and ran for the door. We weren't exactly terrified, but we were still spooked and laughing nervously to ourselves as we bounded back into the street outside. But as we began to walk back out of the cul-de-sac road, blue and red lights began to flash before our eyes. It was the cops, screaming down past us down the street before rushing into the house we'd just left. There was nothing remotely fake about that house. The old man was an escaped psychiatric patient who had lived in the house as a child. The newspaper said he busted out of the institution he was being held in before he walked 30 miles into town back to his childhood home. He must have thought the people living there were intruders. At knife point, he tied them up and tortured them till he finished them. We never found out what happened to the kids inside the house, and quite frankly, I'm not sure I could handle it. Timothy O'Brien lived with his family in Deer Park, Texas, with his parents and little sister. His father, Ronald O'Brien, worked as an optician at Texas State Optical in Sharpston, Houston. He was the deacon at the Second Baptist Church where he also sang in the choir. He was a trusted member of the community, being placed in charge of the local bus program. On Halloween night of 1974, O'Brien took Timothy and his sister trick-or-treating in a Pasadena, Texas neighborhood, along with his neighbor and their two children. When the group knocked at a house but the occupants failed to answer, the children grew frustrated and skipped ahead to the next home in search of candy. When O'Brien caught up with them, they showed him five 21-inch pixie sticks they had been given. When they returned home later in the evening, the young Timothy asked if he could eat one of the candy he and his friends had collected, opting for the huge pixie sticks he had prized so dearly. The young boy had trouble getting the powdered candy out of the plastic straw that contained it, so his father helped him loosen the sugary powder before offering it to him. When he ate it, Timothy remarked that the candy had a bitter flavor, so his father fetched him a glass of Kool-Aid to wash away the unpleasant taste. But this was followed by Timothy complaining that his stomach hurt. Ronald took his son to the bathroom where he immediately began to violently vomit. But the discomfort did not ease, and soon the young boy was shaking and convulsing after collapsing to the bathroom floor. Ronald held his son close, but he soon went limp in his arms. Timothy O'Brien died on his way to a nearby hospital, just less than an hour after consuming the candy. Timothy's autopsy revealed that the pixie stick he consumed was laced with a fatal dose of potassium cyanide. There was enough cyanide in his system to kill three to four fully grown adults. Timothy's death from the apparent poisoned Halloween candy prompted intense fear and paranoia in the local community. Numerous parents in Deer Park and the surrounding area promptly returned all of the candy their children acquired from trick-or-treating to the police for fear it was laced with the same deadly poison. 
During police interviews, Ronald O'Brien claimed that he could not remember exactly which house gave the children the pixie stick. However, the group of adults and children had only visited two streets worth of homes due to heavy rain that had begun to fall that evening. This narrowed down the search considerably. Houses were searched, recent receipts seized as evidence. Yet suspicions were raised when it was discovered that none of the homes the group visited were giving out pixie sticks. Police accompanied Ronald O'Brien through the neighborhood in question several times. Each time, he led them to the home that the group had visited, but those occupants did not answer the door. There, Ronald claimed that he had in fact revisited the house before he caught up with the children. He claimed that the owner had cracked the door open, that he inside of the house was dark, and a hairy, scarred arm reached out and handed him all five of the 21-inch pixie sticks. Police discovered the homeowner in question was a man by the name of Courtney Melvin. Melvin was employed as an air traffic controller at nearby Hobby Airport and asserted under questioning that he did not get home from work until 11 p.m. on the night of the 31st. When nearly 200 witnesses confirmed this, Courtney Melvin was rolled out as a potential suspect. But as their investigation continued, police made a shocking discovery that turned all theories upside down. It was learned that Ronald O'Brien was actually more than $100,000 in debt after a history of being unable to hold down a steady paying job. In the 10 years previous to the death of his son, Ronald had held a grand total of 21 jobs. During interviews with his current employers, police were told by Ronald's bosses that he was suspected of workplace theft from Texas State Optical and was dangerously close to being fired. His car was on the verge of being repossessed. He had defaulted on several bank loans, which had in turn led to the family home being foreclosed on. Although he presented himself as the clean-cut pastor, Ronald's life was a mess of lies and deceit. It was discovered that Ronald O'Brien had taken out life insurance policies on his children in the months preceding the poisoning. One $10,000 policy with two additional $20,000 policies on both children. This was in spite of the advice given by the insurance agencies not to do so. When asked, Deneen O'Brien, the mother of Timothy and Ronald's wife, claimed she was completely unaware of any insurance policies on her children's lives. The final clue came when police learned that Ronald O'Brien had stopped by a chemical supply store in Houston and asked to purchase cyanide. However, he left empty-handed when he learned the smallest amount purchasable was five pounds. Despite repeatedly protesting his own innocence, O'Brien was now a major suspect. Texas police never did find out just where or when Ronald O'Brien had bought the cyanide that he used on his son. But regardless, on November 5th, 1974, he was arrested for Timothy's murder. Ronald was charged with one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder, given that the other children were in extreme danger of consuming the poison intended for Timothy. He entered a plea of not guilty to all five counts. During the trial, a chemist who was familiar with O'Brien claimed that he had contacted him the previous summer regarding lethal dosages of cyanide. Another chemist took the stand testifying that Ronald had asked him how he could go about purchasing the deadly chemical. Additionally, Ronald's friends and co-workers also said that in the months preceding Timothy's death, Ronald had shown an unusual interest in cyanide and spoke about how much it would take to end a person's life. Those that attended Timothy's funeral told the court how Ronald had casually talked of taking a long vacation, only possible through the money accrued from Timothy's life insurance policies. O'Brien continued to maintain his innocence throughout the trial. Bizarrely, his defense hinged on the decades-old urban legend of the Mad Poisoner, who was purported to hand out Halloween candy laced with needles, broken glass, razor blades, or poison. Despite absolutely no documentation of such malice, these stories have persisted among those with a rich imagination. On June 3rd, 1975, a jury took just 46 minutes to find O'Brien guilty of capital murder. The jury then took just over an hour to sentence him to death. Shortly after he was convicted, his wife filed for divorce. 
She later remarried and her new husband adopted their surviving daughter, Elizabeth. The case and subsequent trial garnered national attention and the press gave Ronald O'Brien a nickname I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. The Candyman. In the early afternoon of Halloween 2010, Ohio resident Devin Griffin was returning home after a brisk Sunday morning of singing in his local church's choir. He never missed a Sunday service, and this All Hallows' Eve would be no exception. After walking through the front door of his family home, the 16-year-old trudged up to his bedroom to relax and play video games. It was something of a routine for him. Getting up early on a Sunday meant a guilt-free afternoon of online gaming with his friends. After a few hours of gaming, Devin took a quick break to grab a snack but began to notice something unusual about the household. It was just past 1.30 in the afternoon when Devin started to wonder where his family was. His mother, Susan Lisk, worked night shifts so it wasn't entirely unusual for her to sleep late into the morning but never did she stay in bed until the early afternoon. Out of curiosity, Devin wandered downstairs from his attic room and knocked on the door of the family's home's master bedroom. There was no answer, but that didn't stop him. Devin opened the door to see his mother lying in bed next to his stepfather, William Liss Sr. A maroon comforter was pulled over their heads. In a soft voice, Devin began to ask if they were planning on getting out of bed anytime soon. Again, there was no response. He walked around to her side of the bed and saw his mother's foot jutting out from underneath the goose-down duvet. He tapped on it. Again, no response. As Devin continued to talk, he instinctually pulled down the covers a little. It was her pillow. It was soaked with blood. For a moment or two, Devin could not compute what he was seeing. He later told detectives that he thought it was just some Halloween prank, albeit one done in extremely bad taste. But as he continued to look, he saw the large wound in her neck, dark clots of blood forming around it. Devin ran screaming from the house, frantically begging neighbors to summon emergency medical services. Upon his arrival... Ottawa County Sheriff Bob Bratton said 53-year-old William Lisk, his 46-year-old wife Susan Lisk, as well as her 23-year-old son Derek Griffin, were all found murdered. A preliminary coroner's exam had indicated that their deaths were caused either by gunshot or a blunt object. A suspect identified as 24-year-old William Lisk Jr., thought to be the son of the murdered father from his previous marriage, was arrested almost 200 miles away and was initially charged with only one count of murder in the first degree. After receiving a tip that the suspect killer would be hiding out in the log cabin owned by a distant family member, Deputy Michael Balash was ordered to pay the cabin a visit. Upon his arrival, the deputy spotted a white Ford pickup truck matching the description given of the vehicle List Jr. would be driving. When he approached the man's residence, it's reported that after List Jr. casually walked out of the brown single-story cabin, still smoking a cigarette as he leaned against a porch post. Debbie Belash then pulled in with gun drawn, took List to the ground and held him at gunpoint until backup arrived to assist with handcuffing the suspect. Carroll County Sheriff Dale Williams said that evidence was found on the suspect that also indicated that he was guilty of killing his stepmother and stepbrother. But to those that knew William Lisk Jr., the murders hardly came as a surprise. As early as 2002, his father Bill had called law enforcement on more than one occasion because the then 16-year-old had threatened to harm himself. The boy was on house arrest at the time for other offenses. According to police records, Lisk Jr., proceeded to attack the responding officers when they arrived, and later faced charges in juvenile court of assault on a peaceful officer. Then, in October 2004, Liss Jr. got into a violent altercation with his stepmother and struck her hard into the chest. 
Two months later, police charged him with felonious assault and robbery for allegedly hitting his stepmother Susan with a coffee cup before stealing her car keys. He was found incompetent to stand trial on those charges, which were eventually dropped. Bliss Jr. had at least three more encounters with the police after he moved to a group home for mental health patients. Among those incidents was a physical fight between Liss Jr. and his father after Bill Liss drove to the group home to pick him up. In the immediate aftermath, police struggled to establish a clear motive for the killings. It was clear from the records that Liss Jr. had repeated run-ins with law enforcement that included jail time and mental health treatment. But what exactly drove the young man to commit such an act of senseless cruelty and malice to his own parents? In the course of the investigation, it came to light that Susan Lisk had filed a police report against her stepson, claiming that he had assaulted her. The report was filed less than a month before her murder. It is entirely possible that this had been the final straw for Lisk Jr.'s father. His past behavior and drug use had been antisocial to say the least, but William Sr. had fought time and time again to prevent his son becoming trapped in a cycle of addiction and incarceration. However, to assault his own stepmother was without a doubt a bridge too far. In court, Liss Jr. admitted he was guilty of all three counts of murder in the first degree. A judge then quickly sentenced him to serve three life sentences with no chance of parole. Without shedding a tear, Liss told a courtroom filled with those who knew and loved his father, stepmother, and stepbrother that he could not explain why he brutally murdered them on that fateful Halloween. I love my dad very much, and it makes me feel sick every time I think about what I did. Liss said, I can't really explain why this all had to happen, but I think most of all of it had to do with my mental illness. Liss Jr.'s defense attorney said it was ridiculous that his client could be declared legally sane, especially when he had a history of poor mental health. He said it's unknown whether Lisk was taking the medication that was prescribed for his schizoaffective disorder on the night of the murders, although he had been drinking alcohol. Clearly he should have not been provided alcohol, something that was a constant problem in his life, the mixture of alcohol and his mental illness. Liss Jr.'s sister, Lisa Curl, told the court that her family's lives had been changed forever. We just don't understand how something like this could happen. You see stuff like this on TV and think it will never happen to your family. You love someone so much and then they take something away from you. I just don't know how you could do it when he loved you so much. On March 31st of 2015, William Liss Jr. was found dead in his cell at Ross Correctional Institution in Chillicothe, Ohio, from a self-inflicted injury. He was 29 years old. Back in high school, just after the start of my junior year, me and some buddies got the Halloween spirit pretty heavy. We were obsessed with metal and horror movies, and they were all we talked about, so throughout the month of October we got into visiting creepy places and holding these like do-it-yourself parties. Literally a group of about 30 of us would carpool to some abandoned house one weekend or to some secluded forest the next, spending the days at school in between searching for more places like this in the area. Anyhow, given that we weren't necessarily believers in the supernatural, we had this cavalier nature about us when it came to potential hauntings. At some point, a friend of mine was several years older than me told me about how he and his friends would do similar things when they were young. His childhood home backed up to a huge farm and he and his friends would spend their days fishing or hanging out on this farm, so they were quite familiar with it. The owner apparently a very religious man, a priest or pastor maybe, had owned the farm and a small house on the property. The story went that the owner had been locked up for murder and died in prison, leaving the farm to whomever and it wasn't kept up. However, upon hearing the news of this man's demise, 
My friend told me that T and his friends had decided to go into this house. I guess the windows had been busted out as they managed to unlock a door and just walk in. He described them fooling around and trying to scare one another, but he had decided to walk up the stairs and upon his reaching the second floor, he saw a coffin in the main open room. The way he had explained it to me was that he didn't know what it was immediately and sort of sauntered over to check it out, only to have the sudden flash of realization that this was an actual coffin in an abandoned house. I suppose he and his friends made a quick retreat from the house. Of course, he told this part of the story much better, peppering in more details about the man who owned the property that gave the story that mythical lore sort of feel. I remember being frightened by his delivery and sincerity, though it is quite likely he had rehearsed it before for occasions like this. This story had taken place 15 years or so previous to him telling me. I told one of my adventurous cohorts the story and we thought it would be a good idea to investigate it, to see if the guy was actually telling the truth. So one Halloween we packed his car, snacks and supplies, then set off to set the record straight. I knew where this person had lived, so we assumed we could simply walk behind his house, find the farm, then find the house. We had a grand plan to bring the whole group out on the weekend, but we weren't sure if we were being strung on a lie or if this place was still there, if it were true. Anyhow, after football practice one weekday, he and I drove out to the street my friend lived on. There was definitely a farm behind his and his entire street's homes. That part he had been telling the truth about. We decided to go ahead and sneak through someone's yard and onto the farm to see if the house was there. Once we made it through the manicured suburban yard and through the brush separating the farm, we were knee deep in an overgrown field. We sort of hacked our way through a bit and sure enough as we made it to the edge of the hill, the house was only a hundred or so yards away. We had made it that far so we decided to go in and investigate. As we approached this house, there was a huge black bird perched on its roof. Once we were within 20 feet of the house, the bird flew away from the house and perched upon a tree adjacent to the house. Being a bit nervous, we began questioning why the bird had made such an odd move, but thought better of making a big deal about it. Now, this house is the prototypical haunted house. It had that quaint historical look to it, with the broken windows, eerie shadows, and sort of ominous stature one associates with a haunted house. There was even a grave marker in the front yard. So again, we were increasingly nervous as we approached this house. The door was jammed shut, but the window had been completely removed, so we played rock, paper, scissors for who would climb through first. I had the luxury of going in second, but did so quickly as being on the porch by myself was just as unsettling. The inside of the house had literally not been touched. Besides weather damage, most everything was intact. There were pictures and decorations still up with a bit of furniture remaining. We eventually became comfortable with being inside and began to snoop around. Of course, we were fearful of trekking upstairs, afraid to find something we didn't want to find. Alas, we squeamishly crept up the stairs to find an empty space. At this point, we became at ease with walking around the house, laughing off the ghost story mystique. As we looked through the main floor again, I noticed that there was a tiny door in the kitchen. It was about knee high. Undauntedly, we flung it open only to reveal a dark stone stairwell that a person would literally have to crawl down. Its presence alone was terrifying, for some reason, but it had a landing about halfway down, with the stairs turning a different direction and out of our sight. However, perched on the landing and partly concealed by the walls to the other part of the stairwell was a large rectangular wooden box, a coffin. Now my friend and I weren't exactly small people, so I would imagine the sight of us pale-faced with a cartoonish hair on neck shocked expression trying to both squeeze out of a window at the same time would have been quite comical. Not to mention the both of us in a dead sprint heading away from this house through waist-high weeds. I still laugh thinking about both of us running like that. Anyhow, we turned to look back about halfway to the end of the farm just in time 
to see that massive black bird fly back from the tree and onto the house. We probably made double time from that point on. In hindsight, the whole thing was a bit odd, most especially the behavior of the bird. My friend and I joked about it possessing some sort of supernatural power, but looking back, I think that was just to mask how scared we really were. Years ago now, a few mates and me had managed to secure an invite to a Halloween house party. We didn't really know anyone else there, having only secured the invite because one of us worked with the girl whose student house it was. But since it was literally the only house party we could actually get into, we weren't arguing. A big thing about house parties is, the older you get, the harder it is to find a good one. Most people make their big house party mistake earlier in life and vow never ever to have one again. So the idea of one big hurrah before we started on that late 20s, early 30s, quiet drinks bollocks was wildly appealing. We agreed to meet up in my flat for some pre-drinks and get changed into our various costumes. Fancy dress was a must, according to our mate's colleague. You have never seen such awful Halloween costumes in all your life. One lad just bought a wig and badly applied his mum's makeup claiming to be Frankenfurter from Rocky Horror Picture Show. But without having the stones to rent the suspenders and corset, he just looked like he was in the middle of a bad sex change. Another fella just threw on some old army cadet gear so he could be a soldier or whatever. But it had been a good couple of years since he'd last put it on and he was considerably wider around the waist. So what I suppose was meant to be intimidating just ended up looking completely ridiculous. The winner, without a doubt, was our mate Danny, who'd actually pulled off a pretty convincing Michael Myers costume. So for those that don't know, the mask used in the film Halloween is actually a Captain Kurt Star Trek mask that the prop guys roughed up a little. Yep, one of the most iconic images in horror comes from a crummy piece of sci-fi merch. Crazy, right? Anyway, Danny had actually managed to get his hands on a replica of said mask from his older brother, who was and is something of a horror freak. Then all he had to do was borrow a set of his dad's old mechanic overalls, get hold of a plastic butcher's knife, and he actually looked the real deal. So after we've filled our bellies full of cheap supermarket lager, we make a move for the house party. The place the party was at was only like 5-10 to ten minute walk from my flat, so we decided to walk around to soak up a bit of the Halloween atmosphere. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe a few rooms full of people chatting away with a bit of music playing meekly in a back room. But the closer we got to the right street, the more we could hear this thumping bass sound drifting through the air. Imagine if that was the party we're going to, one of us joked. But it was the party. We're in the middle of this actual residential area, all of the other houses are settled in for the night, and there's this one house with its door wide open, people in costume wandering in and out. These colored lights, a smoke machine, even an actual bloody DJ set up in a bedroom with speakers all through the house. Enjoy it while it lasts, boys. I can guarantee you the police are on their way. Right now. One of us said. Laughing, we piled into the house and started mingling with complete strangers. I won't deny it. They might have been posh kids from down south, but they knew how to throw a party. They actually laughed at us when they realized we'd brought our own beer. The host taking us into the back garden to show us these buckets full of beer and ice water, we were welcome to drink as much as we liked. In exchange, we put our room temperature cans into their fridge as a kind of communal offering. Yeah, we met a few snobs sneering with the who invited you look in our direction, but mostly people were lovely, especially when they found out we brought a special kind of tobacco with us. We drank long into the night somehow. The police didn't actually turn up for the first few hours. They must have been busy with the other more criminal stuff, but eventually, turn up they did. But honestly, it was all part of the experience. It's not a true house party unless the busybodies show up. They were actually pretty cool about the whole thing too. They didn't shout, 
They didn't stop, search, or arrest anyone. They just told us there had been a noise complaint and we had to clear out if we didn't leave there. They even laughed when someone in the crowd anonymously shouted, Are you the male strippers we hired? And this is where the story gets weird. So, throughout the party, our mate Danny had been kind of... in character, walking silently and scarily into rooms, moving his head all slow as he looked around, just like Michael Myers. He'd then break into some weird dance and have people laughing, but it's important to know that he seemed to be enjoying playing the part. Anyway, we all managed to find each other in the throngs of people outside, despite being absolutely smashed. Only, we're not exactly ready to call it a night. So, we decide to walk quite a bit of our way to visit the 24-hour off-license to buy more booze. So, the whole way, Danny doesn't say a word. It might be worth mentioning that he isn't the most talkative when he's sober, so when he's angry, he pretty much says nothing at all. Just does his signature wheeze laugh when anything amusing happens. So, just as we're outside the off-license queuing by the little hatch to get served, I noticed something unusual about Danny's toy butcher knife. I swear he had a fake one at the start of the night, but right then I noticed the knife in his hand is bloody real. Before the fellow in the offie notices and calls the police thinking it's real, I slowly take the knife out of his hand, having a sort of mini freak out that the bell end would be daft enough to steal a real knife from the house party. Right then, like something out of a movie, my phone starts going in my pocket. I pull it out and on the screen is the name Danny. Now, I'm still bladdered at this point, so my first thought is that Danny lost his phone or something and someone is calling my number, the last person he call, to let them know where to safely find it. So I answer with something like, Yeah, I know, my mate's an idiot, I hope he's not stolen anything else. But the voice on the other end is Danny. Definitely, definitely Danny asking where we've gone. He passed out in the bathroom of that student's house and had only just been kicked out of. Cue an actual bloody freakout as I point the knife at this total bloody stranger and demand to know who they are. It all hits me at once. The guy had gloves on. Danny didn't. The strange guy had actual boots on. Danny just had black trainers. My mates have no idea what's going on. As far as they know, I'm on the verge of ending one of our closest mates' lives. But when they too realize what's going on, they too start freaking out on the fella, asking him what he was planning on doing with that knife, following us halfway around town like a proper creep. The lad ended up laying it down the street as we chased him, I have no idea what we were going to do, but we were angry and scared. So I'm sort of glad we didn't catch up to him. Halloween is that certain time of year when we give ourselves over to ghosts, horror stories, and all kinds of macabre entertainment. But is it the case that such a spooky atmosphere pushes humans to express the darker side of their nature? Here's how 10 places in the United States deal with crime and antisocial behavior on the scariest day of the year. Police in the New York City borough of Queens, acting under the state's Operation Halloween Zero Tolerance program, check in on paroled offenders on Halloween, as well as the days before and after. As part of the surveillance program, Those who have done acts convicted against children could have their homes checked to ensure that they don't have any X-rated material, which would violate the terms of their parole. Offenders are not allowed to wear any kind of masks or costumes. They're also forbidden to participate in any related Halloween activities and are prohibited from opening their doors to trick-or-treaters. There is certainly nothing more frightening than the thought of one of those men opening their door to innocent children. A state patrol source is quoted as saying, There is also a curfew for all offenders from 3 p.m. in the afternoon of Halloween to 6 a.m. the following day. Offenders who don't follow these rules could have their parole revoked and be sent back to prison. 
the city of Orange in California employs similar measures to protect children. It passed an ordinance that offenders must post signs on their doors on Halloween to keep trick-or-treaters from knocking there. Police required these offenders to place a sign on the door at least 12 by 24 inches in size, reading, No candy or treats at this residence. Repercussions for failing to do so included a possible $1,000 fine or a year in jail. Police officers in Orlando had reported that around Halloween every year, an uptick in crime occurs by criminals wearing Halloween masks. This has included two men with gorilla masks pistol whipping a man depositing money at a credit union and two robbers wearing Halloween masks stabbing a man behind a restaurant. Of course, the decision to put on a Halloween mask or that scream disguise to commit a crime is not unique to Orlando alone, but wearing a mask could result in other consequences in the state. For example, in Florida, anyone committing a crime while wearing a mask can face ramped up charges. As well, a Florida law prohibits anyone over the age of 16 from wearing a mask or hood in a public place or during a meeting except on Halloween. Yes, sad to say this dates all the way back to the Klan and was enacted to prevent members from wearing hoods during their Klan marches. Perhaps even scarier is that this law has been used more than 200 times following its 1951 passage. It may seem curious that police in South Los Angeles say they see no spike in crime on Halloween, but that may be because they deploy extra units to help with the safety factor, as reports South Carolina Public Radio. However, by safety factor, they mean the tendency of trick-or-treaters to run out between moving or parked cars. However, a captain of another division, its 77th Street Division, did admit to concerns about Halloween spikes in crime. In fact, in 2011, that division had 34 incidences of crime on Halloween, 10 of those being burglaries. That captain told the radio station that that number was extraordinarily high. Georgetown in Washington, D.C. reported that incidences of burglary tend to be more common on Halloween or on Halloween weekends in Georgetown compared to other regular days and weekends of the year. That said, however, it is theft that has been the most prevalent crime to occur on Halloween in Georgetown, more than double the incidence of the next reported crime of robbery. And when it comes to crimes committed on Halloween weekends, the occurrence of theft becomes even greater, nearly four times as frequent as the second most reported crime of theft from autos. It seems that the spooky season makes people much more willing to commit petty crime in the nation's capital. A North Korea news outlet reported that crimes occurring on Halloween have remained steady since 2007 when a spat of larcenies from motor vehicles and stolen bicycles reported on the UNC Charlotte campus. Campus Police Lieutenant Josh Huffman remarked that the campus also does see a slight increase in vandalism and alcohol-related offenses on Halloween but for the most part of the day is like any other in terms of crime on campus. However, it is also worth remembering a lesser-known law that exists in North Carolina, General Statute 1421.7, that prohibits anyone over the age of 16 from wearing a mask in public. Although crime occurring on Halloween dropped 8% from 2010 to 2011, Theft, vandalism, and simple assault have remained the most frequently occurring crimes in Tempe, Arizona on Halloween. In fact, in 2011, theft accounted for 20.7% of crime in the city, according to the East Valley Tribune. In 2010, simple assault topped the list, accounting for 19.1% of all crimes. Of course, alcohol-related incidents are also common, particularly in the city's Mill Street area near the Arizona State University campus, and fights that occur at these can lead to charges such as simple assault. Halloween parties can generate a lot of different things, Lieutenant Jeffrey Glover of the Tempe Police Department said. We have a lot of calls for service, so more officers are responding to calls at that time of hour. Also, you have the drinking that goes on. Sometimes people don't make the best decisions. Even though Halloween fell on a Saturday in 2009, it may be cold weather that prevented its crime numbers from reaching anything out of the ordinary for the holiday in Blacksburg. Since it was cold and rainy on Saturday night, there wasn't a lot of people hanging out outside, 
said Sergeant Nathan O'Dell of the Blacksburg Police. One of the things you'll see when it's cold is that between the peak hours, which are between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., people aren't usually outside. That actually helps with the crime itself. In fact, in the city that year, there were only 12 arrests made on Halloween, but almost 100 calls received by dispatch. Of those, most were related to noise complaints or simply nervous people reporting on otherwise normal behavior. On the Virginia Tech campus, six arrests were made related to alcohol and drug offenses. However, it may be other events on campus that result in higher number of arrests and citations. For example, a football game occurring the same week as Halloween that year led to arrest numbers more than six times that than for the holiday. 39 taken into custody and most for alcohol-related offenses. They take a different, friendlier approach to discouraging crime in the month of October in the Southern California town of Lompoc. This approach involves Halloween flocked flamingo lawn ornaments appearing in people's front yards, according to the Lompoc record. Yes, that means birdie lawn ornaments decked out for Halloween. The event supports the Lompoc Valley Police Activities League, which provides programming for area youth with the idea of helping them stay out of trouble. People can request an anonymous flocking at a charge of $25 or ask for removal for a small fee. They can also purchase insurance to protect them from a flocking. All raised money goes to Lompoc's Police Activities League organization, which was founded in 1998 and provides athletic, educational, and recreational activities to build bonds between teen and law enforcement officers. So... Maybe it is the case that certain kinds of offenses are more frequent around Halloween, but it is also the case that our own fears and perceptions of danger increase around the spooky season. On Halloween night 2002, 21-year-old Chris Jenkins, a University of Minnesota student, went to celebrate the spookiest night of the year down at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill with his girlfriend, Ashley Rice, and three other friends. Shortly after midnight, Chris was separated from his friends and ejected from the bar. According to reports later given to police, a drink was accidentally spilled on his pants, and the security supervisor assumed that Chris was so intoxicated that he urinated himself. After Chris was removed, the security guard in question was given instructions not to let him back inside. Unfortunately for Chris, since his Native American Halloween costume had no pockets, he had asked Ashley to keep his wallet, keys, and cell phone in her purse for him, and his coat was left inside the bar on what turned out to be a chilly 20-degree night. Since he was not the designated driver, Chris was unable to get a ride home and could not contact his friends inside the bar. He was last seen headed away from the bar on foot but did not return to his residence and was eventually reported missing. On February 27th the following year, Chris Jenkins' bloated, decaying corpse was found floating beneath a bridge on the Mississippi River. He was still dressed in his Halloween costume and had gotten wedged in the branches of a large tree located next to the upper St. Anthony Falls Dam. The medical examiner found no signs of foul play on Chris's body, so the official cause of death was listed as drowning. Despite the police ruling it a death by misadventure, his family launched their own independent investigation and discovered a number of odd discrepancies. The Jenkins family hired a private detective, Chuck Loesch, to further investigate their son's disappearance. When Loesch questioned staff at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill, they maintained that Chris left the bar on his own and the venue's owner eventually issued a gag order instructing employees not to speak to anyone without an attorney. Loesch also contacted the Federal Reserve Bank, who happened to be the owners of the two CCTV cameras that had a good view of the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. The bridge was on the route that Jenkins was likeliest to have taken, but when the bank checked the surveillance footage from the earlier morning hours of November 1st, there was no sign of him. Loesch's investigation also led him to multiple witnesses who each independently recalled a fight that had occurred in front of a local pizza place. Though it was unclear if the victim was Chris, 
a gang of around 9 or 10 people had violently attacked another outside of the restaurant. Mike Casey, an off-duty police officer, was present in the area on the night of Jenkins' disappearance. He was moonlighting as a security guard for the nearby Hennepin Center for the Arts and was introduced to Jenkins by his girlfriend, Ashley Rice. Ashley happened to work at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill and was familiar with Casey, well enough that she had borrowed pieces of his uniform to complete her cliched sexy cop costume. There are rumors that Casey had in fact masterminded Jenkins' removal from the bar as a way to get to Ashley, given that he actually gave her a ride home later that night when her shift finished. The Minneapolis Police Department never formally questioned Casey, but stated that he's a married man with children. We don't want to break up a family, an incriminating statement indeed. The Jenkins family went as far as hiring two separate groups of bloodhound trackers to trace Chris's scent from the Lone Tree Bar across the street to an underground parking garage. The scent trail led to parking stalls that one of the bar's bouncers was reportedly parked in on Halloween night. A bloodhound produced a mild hit for Chris's scent on this person's vehicle. Droplets of blood residue, a piece of red string and red feather fragments which possibly belonged to the headband of Jenkins' costume were also found in the garage. Jenkins' blood alcohol was only 0.12%, so he could not have been particularly drunk, but coroners noted that traces of GHB were found in Chris's system. However, since GHB is a substance which is produced by the body naturally, this did not necessarily mean Chris was drugged. Forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden took issue with Jenkins' body being found with his arms crossed in front of him. Drowning victims who accidentally fall into water are almost always found face down with their arms outwards towards their sides and their clothing disheveled. Yet Jenkins' shirt was tucked into his drawstring pants and his oversized slip-on moccasins were still on his feet. This led to speculation that Chris was already dead when he was placed in the river. Hydrologists who studied the Mississippi River were highly skeptical that Chris's body could have been in the water for as long as four months without ever being seen, as the river did not freeze over until January 2003. What's more, the area beneath the Third Avenue Bridge was searched in the weeks following his disappearance with no sign of him. A daytime thawing occurred on February 27th, the day Chris was found, so he possibly floated from another location before his body got wedged in the trees. Jenkins' family found it extremely unusual that there was no bruising on his body. Their son was an enthusiastic lacrosse player, a goalie in fact, who often came home from practice with huge purple and yellow patches on his legs and forearms. Since these bruises were not present, his parents believed he may have been alive for a couple of days after he went missing, allowing enough time for his bruises to heal. Three years later in 2006, the Jenkins family met with Minneapolis Police Chief Tim Dolan, who had decided to reopen the investigation based on the newly attained evidence. Chris's death was eventually reclassified as a homicide and Chief Dolan held a press conference to issue a formal apology to the Jenkins family. Years later, Dolan would state that he estimated Jenkins' death was 50% chance of homicide, 30% chance of accidental death, and 20% chance of ending his own life. Once the case of Jenkins' death was reopened, an informant told authorities he had witnessed somebody throw Chris's body off the Hennepin Avenue Bridge into the Mississippi River, but there was skepticism about this story since Chris had no broken bones or injuries, and it would not have been possible to toss him over the bridge's high safety railing without his body hitting a steel support beam and vertical metal cables on the way down. In July 2007, the Hennepin County District Attorney's Office announced that they had been approached about filing charges against a suspect for Chris's murder, but declined to do so. The suspect in question was one Jeremy Alford, who was serving a life sentence for the brutal murder of a man by the name of Douglas Miller. Alfred admitted to being a regular drinker down at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill around the time of 2002. Chris's case also had been connected to the infamous Smiley Face Killer, as his death took place around the same time that many college-aged men in the Midwest were discovered dead in bodies of water after a night of drinking. 
but unlike many of the other cited cases, no smiley face graffiti has ever been discovered in relation to Chris's death. My name is Kayla, and I live just outside of Charleston here in West Virginia. Halloween used to be my favorite time of the year. Everything about the spooky season just filled me with a kind of childlike excitement. Like I honestly preferred it to Christmas by a whole lot, and as soon as the months ticked over from September to October, it kicked off a whole 31 days of celebratory spookiness for me. I even got a job in a Halloween store that was open all year round, just so I could get some of that spooky holiday feeling during the spring and summer. But not anymore. Not since one Halloween brought one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life with it. And that thing was a visit to an unlicensed Halloween haunt attraction out here in Appalachia. A haunt, as they become known, are Halloween-themed scary events that are put on every year from the end of September to October. After the success of more well-known haunts like Halloween Horror Nights and the Netherworld Haunted House, similar attractions popped up all over the country. Some were a little more fast and loose, whereas some, as I found out, are downright dangerous. I've never actually been to one of those things at the time a friend of mine suggested visiting one, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't extremely curious. Erica, my best friend for as long as I can remember, said she'd heard about a haunt over near the Big Ugly Wildlife Park. There wasn't much info available about it online, but there were a few reviews of the place on Reddit, some of which were written by self-proclaimed horror junkies one of which said they've been to a bunch of haunts and that the one near Big Ugly was probably the most immersive, intense experience they'd ever been subjected to. Another was from a guy who said that he'd lasted hours on end in other haunts up and down the country who'd laugh more than he'd jumped for the most part, but their visit to the Big Ugly had him tapping out before even an hour had elapsed. I told Erica that it might not be the best idea to go to the haunt if it was too much for even hardened horror fans, but she responded that they were probably just talking up the attraction after being given free entry or something. Like what happens with Instagram influencers only for gore hounds and not teenage girls. So, somewhat reluctantly, I agreed to go along with her. Only, unlike some of the more mainstream Halloween haunt attractions, this particular haunt didn't just let you walk up, buy a ticket, and stand in line. As far as we knew, it didn't even have a name. Some just referred to it as the haunt south of Charleston, others as the scariest place in West Virginia. But the most common reference to it seemed to just be the Big Ugly, so that's what we started calling it too. So as you can imagine, there was no website, no Google info tab, nothing like that. All there was was this weird email address that you had to message in order to receive a date and time when you were permitted to visit. We got the email address from one of the Reddit reviews, and it was something cryptic looking like 819v9l-33 at protonrocker.onion. I was over at Erica's place when we sent over an email saying like, how can we get ourselves a time slot? A reply came in within minutes. We rise from the ocean, with our names burned under our heads. Our command and control come from the winged one. But how many crowns do we wear? Erica read the reply aloud in pure confusion, wondering just what in God's name such a weird reply could have meant, and what it was referring to. She copied and pasted the reply into a Google search bar, but all she got was hits on poetry and Shakespeare. Nothing about crowns or dragons or anything like that. She had no idea what the email was talking about, but something about it seemed oddly familiar to me, and for some reason, an answer came to mind. I told her to reply with just the word 10. She was all like, is that a guess? How do you know that? But I insisted it had to be 10. She fired off a reply, and again, the response came back in minutes. It was the right answer. Erica was astounded, and by that point, I'd realized how I knew the answer. 
You see, my grandpa was a preacher out in rural West Virginia, one of the fire and brimstone kinds that screamed at his congregation from his pulpit every Sunday. He knew the Bible off by heart, but there was one section of it that he was particularly obsessed with, and that was the book of Revelations. He always used to bark the same verse whenever he talked about the Day of Judgment, something about a great beast rising out of boiling waters, one that was like a leopard and a bear with the mouth of a lion. Sounds pretty dumb now, but when I was a kid it used to scare the life out of me, and I never, ever forgot the part about it wearing ten crowns upon its horns. We thought the correct answer to the cryptic question would be enough to get us an appointment at the Big Ugly, but instead of getting our time slot, we only got another weird puzzle as a reply. Go to where the lonely Dutchman did his final dance, and paint a welcoming picture. Now it was my turn to be like... What in God's name does this even mean? If they wanted us to go all the way to the Netherlands to get some painting done, we really were up the creek. But this time, it was Erica who had one of those light bulb moments. You see, she's really into true crime stuff, so like serial killers, mass murders, all kinds of detective stuff, and missing 411 stories. They're just her jam. She said the moment she heard the word Dutchman and Final Dance, she knew immediately who they were referring to, that person being a dude named Harry F. Powers. Born Harm Drenth in Groningen, Holland, Harry Powers baited his victims through lonely hearts ads, claiming he was looking for love but ended up murdering them for their money. He was executed by hanging in Moundsville, West Virginia, hence the part about his final dance, which apparently referred to the death spasms that occur when somebody dies that way. Moundsville is up in the very north of West Virginia, a four-hour round trip from Charleston. So to save us the time of driving all the way there and back, we took a gamble on just getting a picture of the Welcome to Moundsville sign from Google Images and sending a copy of it to the Big Ugly email address. It worked. We got a reply that just said, 2100, October 30th which we deduced was them telling us to go looking for the place at around 9pm on the 30th of October, only a few days away from the time we got in touch. We were on. Cut to the day in question and we set off in the late afternoon. It's just less than an hour's drive from Charleston out to the big ugly wildlife park, but we figured we'd better give ourselves a few hours to actually find the place, given that we hadn't been given an actual location, only to search the area around Mudlick Hollow. I was pretty apprehensive about the whole thing on the drive out there, having heard some pretty grim stories about people's experiences at these gorilla style haunts, but Erico told me I was being a big baby that they wouldn't have gotten such glowing reviews if they weren't legit and, more importantly, didn't keep people safe. We were on foot around Mudlick for maybe like 40 minutes or so before we saw a trail of smoke rising into the air. Folks aren't allowed to camp anywhere in the Big Ugly, so we figured that the smoke trail had to be the haunt. And if it wasn't, we could at least rule out the location as being the place we needed to be. But after we hiked up and down steep hills and finally came across a piece of fairly flat land set between two inclines, all we saw was a trio of wooden teepee looking things and not a single living soul around to greet us. We weren't even sure it was what we were looking for, but Still, we started clambering down this fairly steep slope in the direction of the wooden structures, keeping our eye out for anyone who might look like they were in charge of the haunt. It was deathly quiet as we wandered up to the teepees, and I started to get seriously uneasy as the sun was just starting to dip onto the western horizon. It would be dark soon, and it wouldn't be easy to find our way back to Erica's car. We had, like, no food on us at all, with only these cheap flashlights to light our way. Right as I'm about to raise this point to Erica and suggest that we just get out of there before anything bad could happen, we heard a voice from the slopes above us. You girls lost. We looked up to see this rough looking dude peering out at us from behind a tree, a black bandana covering his face. I knew things were about to get weird as soon as I saw the face covering. No one who's up to anything wholesome ever covers their face up, like ever. Uh, we're just looking for the big ugly haunt, Erica replied, and I heard it in her voice that she was nervous too. You heard of it? Haunt. 
the guy replied. Don't know what you're talking about. Right when he said that, I heard something behind us and was so sure that I saw something moving behind one of the other trees. I started giving Erica this look as if to say, like, let's just scoot, and she nods and the whole thing had been a bad idea, and now she was firmly aware of that too. Erica thanked the man anyway and told him we'd be on our way, but he called back that he had a better idea, and it's then that he produced a crossbow like out of nowhere and pointed the thing at us. His better idea, as he put it, was for us to lie flat on our faces in the dirt, and right as he says that, a bunch of other guys start appearing from behind the trees and walking down the slopes towards us. Run, and we'll catch you, one of the other guys said. Hide, and we'll find you. Scream, and I'll cut your tongues out for I fry them up in their skillet. Apparently, we hadn't found the haunt. We'd found something far, far worse. For what seemed like hours, those masked up guys subjected us to the most terrifying, traumatic experiences of our entire lives. They stripped us, tied us to the trees, slapped us, fired crossbow bolts at us, and threatened us with things I don't think I really want to repeat here. The treatment got progressively worse as time went on, and the whole time they laughed and whooped as we begged them not to hurt us and to let us go. We swore we wouldn't tell anyone that they were out there. We promised them that we'd just leave and never come back. But they told us they didn't believe us. They said there was only one way to make sure we wouldn't tell on them, and that was to put us in the ground. We were half naked when they untied us from the trees and dragged us by the hair over to a patch of dirt behind their teepee things. Then, with crossbow and pistols pointed at us, they made us dig into the earth with our bare hands, telling us we were digging out to our own shallow graves. I don't think I cried like that since I was a little girl, but still, I dug, tearing up my fingers on rocks and roots as I thought about what a silly little girl I'd been to even risk trying to find some unlicensed haunt in the middle of nowhere. Suddenly, Erica refused to carry on digging, screaming at the guys if they were going to kill us that she wasn't going to waste any time digging a hole. I remember not being able to decide if she was being stupid or brave, dumb or defiant. She turned her tear-streaked face up to those psychos and just straight up told them no. But they just laughed, hooting and hollering before one of them asked us what we were thinking coming out this far into the woods. I can't remember what exactly was exchanged, but Eric had said something about how they wouldn't get away with what they'd done that killing us would be the biggest mistake of their lives. Then one of the guys was like, Wrong on both counts. We are going to get away with this, and it's not a mistake, because you're not going to die. I remember they said that last part for sure because I immediately stopped digging and looked up, this feeling of hope going through me, like a warm feeling spreading in my chest. Congratulations, girls, the guy with the crossbow said. You just survived the big ugly haunt. We just sat there in the dirt, shivering, unable to believe what had just happened to us. Even Erica, who had been spitting bile at these guys just a minute before, seemed shell-shocked. One of the guys came along and threw our clothes at us, then offered us some hot coffee from a flask he had, along with a few cigarettes. Erica refused both, but I took the cigarette. I'd quit a few years before, but I just couldn't turn it down. It dawned on us during the car ride back home that they hadn't actually done anything seriously to physically harm us. Aside from the cold, a few slaps and the hair pulling, they barely touched us, and they didn't actually strip us naked at all. The whole thing had been a psychological game albeit one that had scared the life out of us. They didn't even ask us for any money at the end of it. They just let us go. We talked about going to the police or writing up a warning on Reddit about the haunt, but we ended up doing neither. It was our own fault for looking for something like that, for even considering it to be a good idea or a remotely fun time. Well, I mean, 
I suppose this is a warning, written years later way too late, and it haunts me how many other people they will have gotten away with mentally torturing, but at the end of the day, we had gone looking for something to scare us. Maybe we were just super naive or whatever, but the point stands, they didn't come to us, we went to them. We went looking for something truly terrifying, and by God, did we find it. My name is Danny, and I live here in Liverpool in the UK. I'm 33 this year, so obviously my trick-or-treating days are well behind me. But the times I got to throw on a scary costume and head into the night with my best mates are some of the fondest memories I have from my youth. That's even aside from the free sweets and we all know how stuff just tastes better when it's free. But maybe I'm looking back through rose tinted glasses to a degree because I do remember one Halloween that was most definitely not all fun and games. In fact what happened that night was probably one of the most terrifying things that's ever happened to me even if it did take me a little while to realize the significance of it. So me and my childhood friends are all either 15 or 16 during the Halloween of 2003, right on the verge of being too old to trick-or-treat anymore. Saying that, considering most of our voices had broken at the time, us turning up at people's houses was less cute kids begging for sweets and more like moody teenagers extorting people out of their haribu minis under the threat of egging. People were generally pretty sound about it, and only once did we have to actually throw an egg in anger, but there were many, many occasions where a homeowner would take a peek through the living room curtains before just refusing to answer the door. It's not like we could egg everyone. We only had a pack of six and had to use them sparingly. Fun fact, a lot of places around ours just refused to sell teenage boys eggs during the Halloween season. As one bloke said to me, You don't look like the type to take these home to Spanish omelette, do you lad? Good point, well made. Point being, there came a point during the evening when we were pretty dismayed at the pathetically low amount of chocolate we'd managed to get our hands on, which is what directly led two of us to make a huge error of judgment. So later on in the evening, maybe at about nine-ish, we're in this fancier neighborhood near the river, knocking on house after house and generally getting the knock back from the owners, until we come to this one house, where an older guy actually answers the door with a smile. We give it the old trick-or-treat greeting, to which he responds by laughing warmly and giving us a little clap, which was unusual, but not entirely unwelcome. He starts telling us how not a single set of trick-or-treaters had knocked at his house all evening, and since he finds Halloween a great deal of fun, it had left him pretty dismayed. We get into a casual conversation with him about our costumes, who we were supposed to be and all that, and although I don't think he managed to pick up on a single reference, he was very complimentary. He then goes on to tell us that since it's getting late in the evening and he was unlikely to get anyone else calling at his house, that we were welcome to as much chocolate and sweets as we wanted. He told us that he'd stocked up on like a shed load of stuff, thinking he was going to get many more house calls than he ended up getting, and since he was off to bed soon, we could just help ourselves. Otherwise, all the chocolate would just end up sitting in his cupboards for a year, and he wasn't about to give kids year-old sweets come next Halloween. We basically hit the jackpot, thinking we could just rinse the old fellow of his sweets and make up for the paltry amount we'd collected over what had been an unusually fruitless trick-or-treating session. Only, he said there was one small problem. Since he was getting on in years and didn't get out much, his oldest grown-up son had come by to drop off all the sweets along with his usual weekly shopping. Then, without having thought it through, his son had put all the sweets in the top cupboard of his back pantry, one that was way too high for him to reach without doing his back in. If a couple of us were willing to help him reach the cupboards and take a few tins of soup for him in the process... The sweets were ours. All of them. Now I know what you're thinking. Who in God's name is daft enough to just wander into a complete stranger's house in the middle of the night? Apparently we were. And I'll explain why. Firstly, we were in the middle of our teens and most of us were big lads, hardly in a position not to be able to defend ourselves. 
Secondly, this fellow seemed pretty old and infirm, hardly a big threat to us, especially since the two lads who volunteered to go inside to help him outnumbered him two to one. And thirdly, the fact that one of us had managed to pilfer a bit of peach schnapps out of his parents' booze stash, which we promptly shared as soon as we were able, had seriously impaired our judgment. So pretty much as soon as the old bloke laid out the terms, two of us, Sam and Corky, volunteered to go inside and help the fellow get a soup so we could get our sweets. They went inside. The old fellow shuts the door behind him after saying something about keeping the cold out and we wait outside in the street, buzzing about having hit the chocolate jackpot. Like I mentioned, we were all pretty tipsy from having shared that bottle of booze, so we're just sitting on the stone wall outside the bloke's house, chatting up and waiting. A few minutes go by, Sam and Corky haven't appeared yet, but I think we're just in too high spirits to really notice. A few more minutes go by and we start getting a little bit impatient, wondering what's taking so long. It had gotten colder and colder as the night went on and by that point it was actually starting to drizzle and none of us fancied getting soaked on the walk back home. So one of us gets their phone out and starts trying to ring Sam and Corky on their mobiles to which there was no response. We actually started cursing them out now, speculating that they were stashing some of those sweets away in their costumes or something so they don't have to share with the rest of us. The lad who tried to ring them does so again shaking his head and getting annoyed as the rain started to get a bit heavier. Then, right at that moment, we hear a bang of something smashing against the wooden gate at the side of the old fellow's house. It was loud enough to make us all a jump, so we stand and turn around to see what could have made the noise. That's when I see Sam climbing over the wooden gate at the side of the house, like scrambling over it as fast as he could, looking like he'd see a sodding ghost or something. We're all like... What's going on, mate? Watching him clambering over the wooden fencing near the back gate, before basically throwing himself over the other side and hitting the concrete driveway with a thud. God, the pure fear in his eyes when he started running down the driveway at us, shouting for us to run. We all start backing off like getting ready to leg it when Sam stops, turning back towards the house and saying something like, God, Corky's still in there. He's still bloody in there. Everyone starts asking him what just went on for him to come running out like that, but he doesn't respond. He just looks up towards the second floor of the house with a gasp. I turn to try to see what he's looking at, and watch as one of the top windows of the house opens up. It was one of those kinds that opens by, like, rotating from the bottom, like it didn't open like a door, but like a hatch, if that makes any sense. We can't really see what's behind it thanks to the darkness inside the room, but... Out of like nowhere, we just see Corky emerging from the window, climbing out backwards while gripping onto the ledge. He's trying to edge out, Tomb Raider style, so he can drop feet first into a section of flower beds that were very fortunately placed underneath the window. I say very fortunately because I'm not messing. It must have been a 15 foot drop from the second floor window, like at least 15 feet. Then as we're watching him do this, there's like a flash of movement in the room above Corky, who then screams this proper, horrible, blood-curdling scream before crashing into the flower beds beneath him. He fell so awkwardly too, like the first thought was that he had to have broken something having fallen that distance in such a way. So I start rushing toward him to help him up and get him moving, but to my surprise, he just bounces back up out of the flower bed and starts legging it down the driveway towards us, that same horrible look of fear on his face that Sam had. Then, that was that. We just bailed, sprinting as fast as we could down this long dark road that led towards the river, not stopping until we reached the promenade which was lit up in this ominous pumpkin orange streetlight glow. Pretty apt for Halloween, right? Not that it had occurred to me until months after. Only when we were certain we were a safe distance away from the bloke's house did we stop to catch our breath, but it didn't take long for those of us that had waited outside to demand and know what had happened. Only then did we see the blood pouring out of Corky's head. From a cut so deep, we could actually see this pale bit of tissue in the orange light, which turned out to be one of his actual bones. 
The old fella had stabbed at his hand as he'd been hanging from the window frame, and that's what caused him to scream and drop. I remember Sam just sitting down on the concrete near the railings, just with his head in his hands. Maybe he was trying to fight back tears, I couldn't quite tell. But it was Corky that spoke up first. Fella pulled a knife on us, got us into the back pantry and pulled a freaking knife on us, he said, hands on his knees still panting. He had something else too, like his phone. He was a taser lad, he had a bloody taser and my auntie had one that looked exactly like it. I'd know it anywhere. Sam interrupted. We were all just in shock and listened as they went on to describe how the nice old fellow we thought we were dealing with turned out not to be so nice or so old at all. Corky told us as soon as he had gotten them into the back pantry, he'd risen up from behind all hunched over and started to move a bit more limberly, which is right when Corky said he'd started to get the creeps realizing that something wasn't right about the bloke. The old bloke pointed at the cupboard where the sweets were, told Sam and Corky to help themselves, then just sort of disappeared after telling them that he'd be back in a minute. The cupboard was apparently so high up that Sam had to give Corky a boost up to actually open it, and when they did actually open it, there was nothing inside at all. No soup, no sweets, no nothing. Then the next thing they knew... The fella was blocking the exit to the pantry, holding a knife and what was, according to Sam, definitely a taser, and was ordering each of them to go upstairs. But that's not all. Apparently when the fella turned up again, he was bollock naked, with only his shoes and socks on. We didn't get all the grim details out of either of them for a few months, but apparently the fella wasn't suffering from any dysfunction, if you catch my drift. They'd said they'd listened to him at first, heading towards the staircase before they attempted to escape, with Sam heading out the back door, into the yard, and over the fence. But Corky was sort of trapped on the stairs of the bloke blocking his escape, so as I mentioned, he had to run upstairs, find a front-facing window, and just climb out of it. We considered calling the police right then and there. I mean, he'd obviously just stabbed one of our mates in the hand, but Corky had this other idea... Even with his adrenaline pumping, he explained, and pretty coherently, that there was no way we could complain to the police, that he could see the older fella putting on that innocent old man act again, and just telling the police that we'd forced our way inside and tried to rob him, that he'd defended himself, and that's how Corky ended up with the wound on his hand. I remember the lad was about to phone the police just stopping dead, thinking about it for a second, and putting his phone away. Five lads way too old to be trick-or-treating, stinking of booze, versus the word of one sweet old man who was apparently no threat to anyone at all. It'd be an open and shut case for the police, or at least that's what he got into our heads. I'm sure there's people who might read this and disagree, knowing there was some way of us having evidence in our favor, or I don't know, something to prove we weren't lying. But I suppose we'll never really know, since we didn't act on it to find out. We stayed away from the neighborhood for years. We eventually managed to get it together to enact some kind of revenge, but when we backed the place, we found out it was some young couple living there, the older fellow apparently being long gone. We didn't get any closure at all, but closure is overrated. There's a lot to be said for the power of just forgetting, you know? But yeah, anyway, this has gone on long enough, I reckon, so I'll wrap it up the story of the scariest thing to ever happen to me or anyone I know during Halloween, and honestly, it's probably the most disturbing thing to happen to me in my entire life, too. Me and my buddies used to trick-or-treat like every year when we were kids, without fail. And there used to be this one house that we always used to go to where this horrible family used to live. Like their kid was a huge bully in middle school, got suspended a bunch of times, and her parents didn't seem to be any better. Like most kids would just stop going to that house after they'd been told to buzz off year after year, but we grew to kind of relish the confrontation in a way. Like it's not like the mom who used to answer the door knew exactly who it was each year. We had masks on, we different stuff. 
we just got a kick out of seeing her get increasingly irate as the years went by. Only one year in particular, she gets really, really angry with us knocking over and over and actually chases us down her driveway and out into the street, which wasn't nearly as fun as just trolling her and seeing her get all angry. So that year, we decided it was time for the nuclear option. You see, we were heavy on the treat side of trick-or-treating, not so much the tricking sides of things. Even houses that told us to get lost or had ran out of candy didn't get anything bad thrown their way, we just sort of took it on the chin. But that time, getting chased away was a little too much for us to stomach, so we started hatching a revenge plot. One of us runs back to their parents' place, grabs a pack of toilet paper, then meets back up with us like a few minutes walk away from the house we planned to TP. We head back over there like we're on a secret mission or something, all hyped up to strike deep at the heart of killjoys everywhere. It was dumb, but we were just kids, maybe only like 12 or 13 at the time, so I guess being dumb was just part of the package of being that age. Anyways, we get there, sneaking up the driveway in pairs, hiding behind bushes and the car and whatnot, and getting in position to strike. Then, like some little team of cartoon commandos, one of us gives the signal and we spring into action, hurling the rolls of toilet paper over the house, over the car, into the big tree that they had in their front yard, everywhere we could. Then boom, there's a gunshot, and the dad of the family runs around the back of the house, aiming a pistol in the air and hurtling towards us. He looked like a man possessed, sprinting towards us at terrifying speed, despite the fact that he was rocking a big old spare tire in his gut. We just bolt, running back down the driveway and pounding it into the street, splitting off into different directions as we're all just intent on getting out of there. But you know that saying, you don't have to be fast enough to outrun the bear, you just gotta be faster than your slowest friend? Yeah, that. Because as we're all running, I hear the scream from behind me, then the guy shooting. I turn to see one of my buddies on the floor, getting the snot kicked out of him by the sky, his bag of candy having spilled open with all the contents just glittering in the street lights. I run back and start begging the guy to stop, and he points the gun right at me, at which point I literally pee my pants. I'm not scared to admit it. I was a kid, and it's scary enough having a gun pointed in your face as an adult, let alone when you're like 13. Only when he takes the gun away from me and points it to my buddy's head that I find the will to start screaming. No, please don't. We're sorry. We're really sorry. Please don't shoot him. And the guy doesn't respond or even look at me that time. He just whips off my friend's mask and keeps the gun pressed against his temple and growling stuff about how he's going to blow his brains out right then and there. Who do you think you are creeping up on my family like that? I should waste you right here and now. And all this other stuff that has my young friend basically bawling his eyes out. It was horrifying. Actually horrifying. Scarier than any horror movie I'd ever seen. Scarier than any super realistic costume or Halloween decoration that any sick horror freak could have possibly dreamed up. I mean, I really did think the guy was about to straight up kill my friend in front of me. And it didn't take long until I was crying too. Then the guy does something to the pistol, cocks it back, puts the barrel to my friend's face again. I'm screaming, don't kill him, don't kill him, over and over. Then he pulls the trigger. But there's no bang, there's just a click. But even the click was enough to send my friend into absolute spasms of terror and wailing. I didn't know anything about guns at the time and... I really did think he'd done whatever you do to prep the thing to fire, and I think I was just too terrified to see or realize that what the guy had done, what he must have done thinking about in retrospect, is eject the clip, clear the chamber, then dry fire the pistol into my friend's face, making it look like he was about to shoot him, but actually not doing so at all. Then once we were good and broken, once we were too scared to do anything but stand or lie there, bawling our little eyes out, the dude says something about us learning our lesson, then walks off back up the street towards his house. I remember my friends sort of lying there in the street for a few minutes, 
just sniffing and crying while I sat down next to him. I say sat down, it was more like my wobbly knees just couldn't handle it anymore and I collapsed down on my bottom near him. We didn't say a thing for the longest time, we just tried to process what just happened. How a dumb Halloween prank could possibly have escalated into something so truly terrifying. Looking back on it, I know we were little jerks tempting faith like that, going back year after year and we probably weren't the only group of kids who were angering this guy or deliberately targeting them for not being in the Halloween spirit, but I don't think we deserve that. No one does. I mean, this grown man subjected a tween kid to a mock execution in the middle of the street. After a while, we got up and I walked my buddy back to his house where we told his parents everything that had happened. Needless to say, the cops got involved and the whole thing got way, way messy for a while. The guy ended up catching charges and we got visits from the cops too to warn us about playing Halloween pranks like that. I'm not a lawyer and this is like 30 years ago now, so don't quote me on any of this. I mean, I'd actually be happy to hear from anyone who could paint a more detailed picture of the laws that were broken that night, but technically... We were trespassing on their property and breaking a bunch of other harassment laws or something and if that guy hadn't actually ran after us into the street, I think he might have actually gotten away with the whole thing. But since he did follow us and did the whole mock execution thing, he managed to pick up charges and for a while it looked like he was facing a brief stint in prison. But the family wasn't exactly in the weeds financially so from what I remember, they lawyered up and managed to get away with a suspended sentence. Although I do know the guy was banned from owning firearms in our home state, which I suppose was a win for us in some respects, but the lasting effects of that night stayed with me for a long, long time. I've had a severe fear of firearms ever since, like I can watch movies with guns in no problem. Something about it just being on a screen kind of separates the reality of it for me for some reason, but in person... I literally get a sweat on if I see a gun, which actually posed a serious problem for me during things like your run-of-the-mill traffic stop, where I see a cop's gun and get all nervous. Like I've had a canine unit called on me more than once because a cop assumes I get all nervous because I have something in my car that I shouldn't have, but I'm sure you guys can't blame me, right? That night was one of the most traumatic of my entire life, perhaps the most traumatic and I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that it was the last time I went trick-or-treating. Like sure, my parents banned me from ever going again, but even if they didn't, I never wanted to be out on Halloween night. Ever. Again. I hate Halloween. I'm sorry. I know that makes me sound like a proper buzzkill, but I have to be honest. Halloween is without a doubt my least favorite night of the year, and I really hate how it's gone from just one night of it to like an entire month of dumb, spooky fun. But I promise it's not just me being a killjoy. For me, it stems from a deeply personal experience with people who didn't just see ghosts and ghouls as some harmless form of autumn entertainment. Let me explain. I was born in Yorkshire, here in the UK, but my parents are from Libya and North Africa. I'm sure I don't have to explain much about the recent situation in Libya, as it's been in the news an awful lot over the past nine years or so, but I think there's a lot about Libyan and Arab culture in general that a lot of people don't know about, especially when it comes to things that have pre-Islamic origins, since the religion has pretty much come to dominate any news or discussion when it comes to the Arab world. One of these things is the concept of jinn. Jinn is a term used to describe spirits or supernatural creatures that exist in Arab folklore, creatures that are held responsible for misfortune, possession, and diseases. The word comes from the root word jan, which means to hide or to adapt. They're different from demons in the sense that they're not inherently evil and can sometimes be helpful and kind. In a lot of pre-Islamic works of literature, jinn can be summoned and bound to a sorcerer who can then manipulate their powers to their own advantage. 
Jinn are assumed to be able to appear in shapes of various animals such as scorpions, cats, owls, or even donkeys. Dogs are another animal often associated with jinn, especially black dogs, which explains why a lot of Muslims have a weird fear of dogs. Jinn are also commonly associated with the wind, often appearing in mists or sandstorms as shadowy ghosts with no individual structure. Now, having grown up in the UK, I don't really believe in any of that stuff. I studied medicine at uni. I'm a rather rational person. I know that mental illness is caused by chemical imbalances, etc., and not just bloody spirits. But I can't say the same for my parents, or some of my other extended family who legit believe that certain illnesses or mental disorders are caused by being possessed by jinn or tormented by a shaitan, the word we use for demons or devils. So a few years ago, when my mom started to suffer from a deep, all-consuming depression, the immediate reaction wasn't to get her an appointment with a psychologist or therapist. It was to start doing all kinds of ancient rituals on her to remove the jinn from her body. In short, my aunt had someone perform a bloody Islamic exorcism on my mom, and having to witness it was honestly one of the worst chapters in my entire life, which, coincidentally enough also happened to occur during the month of October. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember driving back from Manchester to my mum and dad's place in North Allerton, worried sick the entire time because I knew that I was about to witness something seriously distressing. I remember the look my aunt gave me when I suggested that what was about to happen maybe wasn't the most effective form of treatment and that my mum needed professional help. I mean, I wanted to tell them they were daft old bents who, medically speaking, didn't know their butts from their elbows, but you don't speak to your elders like that. Not in my culture. They scowled at me, told me I was straying from Islam and that I needed to basically get my head together and stop thinking like an English girl, even though that's exactly what I was. I feel like I should make it clear that I love my heritage and I love my religion. I'm proud to be Muslim and I wouldn't change a thing about myself, even if I don't strictly keep halal. But I'm telling you now, some aspects of my culture really annoy me. Misogyny is one thing. All those old bearded wankers telling us girls what we can and cannot do while being total bloody hypocrites themselves. But the anti-science thing is just on another level, and it baffles me. At one point, the Muslim world had some of the most scientifically advanced societies on the face of the earth. But somehow, that all just went completely downhill, but I digress. One evening, pretty much my whole family gathered in my parents' house when a sheik arrives to perform the exorcism. From what I gathered, the whole process was divided into three stages and wouldn't take place over one evening, but a few days. The first stage involved removing all forms of distraction from the living quarters of the possessed person. The sheik, with the help of my aunts, removed anything musical from my mom's room, so all the CDs, the stereo, and my mom's oud, which is like a little Arabic guitar or mandolin type thing which she always loved to play for me and my sisters when we were kids. They then took away all of her jewelry and stuff. Basically, anything pretty had to be purged from the room, which obviously my mom found really upsetting since she took a lot of comfort in the things that reminded her of home. The sheik then told my mom and the rest of my family everything that was about to happen was the will of Allah and that it was merely there as a kind of go-between, a mediator of sorts. The second stage, and perhaps the most disturbing for me, was when the sheik tried to actually communicate with the possessing spirit directly. Something came over my mom as he started to do this. At the end of the day, she believed in the process too, and she played right into his hands, saying some really horrible, perturbing stuff about being full of hate and loving the process of slowly killing the woman the thing was possessing. My aunt howled when they heard her talk like that, my sisters cried, and my dad had to leave the room to keep himself from showing the women of the family that he was about to burst into tears himself. When my aunt started screaming, so did my mom. The cacophony of wailing and crying coming from that room that evening was just horrendous and for months I used to hear it in my nightmares. The sheik demanded to know the most inappropriate things for my mom. The kind of thing a person is never supposed to ask another unless they're actually really, really intimate with them. It was absolutely disgusting. 
and in those moments I hated that man. I think I still do. The third stage took place the following day. The sheik came and cleaned the room down with the help of my aunts. Then they used a mixture of honey and water to wash my mum down with, and a kind of purification ritual that would cleanse her body and soul of any sin. She was utterly exhausted by that point. I'm also certain she hadn't eaten a thing in about three days and had barely drank any water. She looked terrible, and I was so, so scared she was going to die as a result of the stress and deprivation. Then, after the sheik put his white-gloved hand on her head and recited a few verses from the Quran, it was all over. He packed up his things as my aunts thanked him, then he left. My mum was fixed. Only she wasn't fixed. Not at all. She's never really gotten better, and for a long time I think that exorcism bollocks only made her worse. Yeah, religion helped her. Praying and believing helped her to get a little bit better, but not anything that old wanker did to her ever made her remotely better. I suppose that's why I hate Halloween so much. I had to spend the rest of October listening to stories about demons and spirits, seeing people make light out of a subject that had given my family and I so much pain and torment. Because as I said, for some people, ghosts and ghouls and goblins are just something make-believe that bring a bit of light entertainment once a year, or for my weirdo boyfriend all year round. But for some people, they're very, very real. My name is Rosa, I live up near Edinburgh in Scotland, and this is the true story of the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on Halloween. I'm going back a few years, but on Halloween night, the cinema society at our uni decided to put on an outdoor showing of that movie, Alien. I had not seen it before, but a few of my pals said it was good, and since we were too old for trick-or-treating, but too young to go out drinking, that would be a way to have a good time without spending too much money. So we had an alright time watching the film and all of that, it wasn't as good as my pals had made it out, but it was still pretty enjoyable. Only the whole time this guy in the same row as me keeps looking in my direction. You know, like when you can see the shape of someone's face in your peripheral vision, when they're staring at you. Yeah, that. I gave him a few looks as if to say, what are you looking at, but that didn't put him off. He kept staring for like the entire time the film was going on. He seemed a wee bit older than me with dark hair and quite a plain face, and he had a t-shirt with a little character wearing a blue and yellow jumpsuit type thing that was giving a thumbs up. I'm pretty sure it was from a video game, but I'm not sure which one. Anyway, when the film was over and me and my friends were walking back towards the bus stop, this car pulls up next to us really fast before slamming on the brakes. Then the same fellow jumps out of the car, the one with the video game t-shirt, and tries to actually drag me inside. I went absolutely rage and started scratching and biting him while my mates went mental too, scratching, punching him until he gave up, jumping in his car and driving off. We tried to take pictures of the number plate and all that, but they were too blurry to make anything out, so we had nothing to tell the police apart from a rough physical description. I don't think anything happened as a result of my complaint, like the police never got back in touch with me. So as scary as this whole thing was, I don't think it compares to the fact that the weirdo who tried to actually kidnap me that night is still out there, and it's probably only a matter of time before he tries something like that again. Only the next time, the girl might not be so lucky. I think for any American teenager, starting high school has to be one of the most stressful, daunting experiences of their entire education. But for me, it was particularly rough. You see, I was a real late bloomer, still very much a squeaker by the time I got to be a freshman. While the boys my age were getting growth spurts and sprouting facial hair, I could easily have still passed for like 11 or 12. I mean, I got caught up eventually, don't get me wrong but there are pictures of me from back then that my current roommate has seen and he jokes that I had the body of an anorexic bikini model. 
I'd like to argue to the contrary, but honestly, that's not far off. So unfortunately, I was an obvious target for bullying seniors, the worst of which was this big slab of meat with red hair named Josh. Josh used to push me into lockers on a daily basis like, Are you sure you're old enough to be here, short stuff? And I was in absolutely no position to be able to defend myself. So this goes on for like a month and each time I get sicker and sicker of how he's treating me. It's not like I was a total pushover either. Despite my small stature, I'd managed to deter any potential middle school bullies by being something of a pint-sized brawler. Even if you don't quite win a fight, you can still inflict a fair amount of damage, and after that, suddenly they don't want the smoke anymore. So it was honestly only a matter of time before I snapped at Josh. Sure, he was bigger than me, but... I was about perfectly positioned to nail one good punch to the balls and after that, there was little chance he'd want to lay hands on me again. Anyway, it's getting closer and closer to Halloween and some of the bullying is getting pretty intense and I said each time something happens, I get more and more furious. Up until the point where, on the morning of Halloween, me and my friends are talking about going trick-or-treating that evening, swapping costume ideas and stuff. When Josh appears like out of nowhere and starts verbally pounding on us about how we're such a bunch of nerds. I think it was how he was trying to show me up in front of my friends that really did it. I just couldn't stand the thought of losing face in front of them, so I clapped back with like, Yeah, but your mom loves it when I dress up for her. Josh just stops dead, like this blank expression on his face. My buddies are all laughing like, got him and... I'm half expecting Josh to start trying to pummel on me, but he doesn't move. He just stares off into the near distance for like a full minute while I look back at him in confusion. Then, without a word in reply, Josh just storms off without so much as looking at us, but before he disappears around a corner, he full-on throws a right hook into a locker so hard he put a dent in the thing. Just like boom punches it so loud a teacher comes out from a class screaming and asking what was that. It felt kind of good knowing I'd gotten them so mad, even if I probably would end up suffering for it. But just how much I'd suffer for it, I had absolutely no idea. So cut to a, like an hour or two later and we're all having lunch, sitting around the tables just minding our own business. One by one, seniors start coming up to our table like, did you really say that stuff to Josh about his mom? And when I say yes, they're all like, wow, dude, just wow. Walking away, shaking their heads and laughing. This happens like a bunch of times too, and at first I think they're just impressed that I flamed the bully so hard, but there's something else there too, something that kind of piqued my curiosity. So in the end, when this one senior kid asks what I'd said, I stopped and was like, why is that such a big deal? Guy had it coming. Yeah, but you brought up his mom, the kid replied, like it wasn't what kids always bring up against each other when they're trading insults. I'm like, so what? Your mama jokes are like old news by now. The kid then looks at me like I just told him I thought the earth was flat. Dude, Josh's mom died over summer break, sudden cancer diagnosis or something. It was brutal. It's hard to even sum up the mix of emotions I felt in that moment. Like I felt like a douche. Bully or no bully, losing your mom like that must be one of the worst things that can ever happen to a person, and to remind him of it made me feel terrible. Then, having not known, that just made me feel so out of the loop, just like an outsider or something. Like I had no place being there, which was already bad enough considering my physique. But what really overwhelmed me was the fear I felt, knowing I had made him so unbelievably furious. The locker punch suddenly made all the sense in the world, and I imagined the kind of revenge I'd personally want if someone made fun of my dead mom like that. Suddenly a few crotch punches didn't seem like such an effective deterrent. Josh would be wanting to tear me apart. I managed to duck him for the rest of the day. For a while, I was actually debating whether or not I should actually just bite the bullet and apologize to him. A little empathy might have been good for all involved, and it's not like I would be doing so just to save my own skin, like I genuinely felt bad about having said what I said. But I guess I was just too cowardly to actually seek him out, 
and doing so seemed like a dumb move on my part when it would just be easier to ninja around school and bail when the final bell rang, which is exactly what I did, then just headed home in the hopes that a little trick-or-treating fun would be exactly what I needed to take my mind off the whole thing. Besides, it was a Friday and whatever was going to happen over the mom insult fiasco was at least going to have to wait until Monday. I'd gotten myself what was essentially a stay of execution. So like I said, that night was Halloween and me and a few buddies had planned on going trick-or-treating together. It was a good time, I mean, anything involving free candy always makes for a good time, right? And the night was going smoothly right up until we stop at a crosswalk where this car is pulling up. The car stops, and we step out into the street as we start to walk in front of it. Then right as we're on a level heading with it, one of my buddies is like, Don't look, dude. Under his breath, nudging me and pointing towards the car. And naturally, I look. Big mistake. Because who sat in the driver's seat of that car cruising around on Halloween night with his buddies? Of all the people on the face of earth that I really, really didn't want to run into that evening, it had to be them sitting in their car at the crosswalk. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It was the slab of meat, Josh. And right then, as I'm perfectly positioned in front of his car, we lock eyes with one another. Obviously, I'm wearing a costume, but no mask. So although it takes him a minute of being like, why does this little runt seem familiar to me? He does actually recognize who I am. Now I knew he was going to be mad, but I didn't expect him to be this mad, because as soon as it hits him that it's me walking in front of the car, he guns his engine and just lurches forward, actually trying to straight up run me and my friends over. We manage to run out of the way just in time and he heads up the street while onlookers are like, oh god, did you see that? Those poor kids almost got hit and stuff while well, we watch from the sidewalk as he does a very illegal U-turn before coming right back at us. We just start running down the sidewalk trying our very best to escape but the dude was in his car so we stood absolutely no chance of getting away from him. Josh just guns it past us, cutting off our route of escape then jumps out of the car to give chase. It was a big dude, but Jesus Christ was he fast. So needless to say, he catches up to me in like no time at all and just tackles me down onto the sidewalk. Then as you can probably guess, Josh then proceeds to beat the goo out of me, with me shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know the whole time. Like he's just raining blows down on me, kicking me while I'm balled up on the sidewalk, when I hear something I still feel kind of conflicted about. He's grunting and cursing at me for a while, but then I hear something else. He's like whimpering or something as he's hitting me. Then his voice starts to break while he's calling me all kinds of names and I come to realize that he's actually crying. It was weird. I could have at least tried to get up and make a run for it but I didn't. I just shut up and let him wail on me for a while because honestly I felt like I kind of deserved it. I know that probably sounds really dumb. He was a bully and he's probably still a bully now but yeah. There it is. I just felt really, really sorry for the guy. No one deserves to lose their mom like that. No one. He only stops beating on me when he's actually full-on ugly crying, then he heads back to his car and just drives off into the night. My trick-or-treating partners had long since ran off, leaving me alone and bloodied on the sidewalk, trying and failing a few times to find my feet. I mean, I didn't blame them. Hearing that car engine revving behind us was one of the scariest experiences of our lives, but yeah, I was all alone at that point, so like I said, it took me a while to be able to stand up enough to start my walk home. But not until I gathered up some of the candy that had spilled out of my sack during the beatdown, which was going to be badly needed for some soul soothing that night. I snuck in, dodged my parents, and then told them the next morning that my bruises were just down to us play fighting and trying the kind of stuff that you don't try at home was all about. Mom was mad, but it meant I didn't have to tell them something that I was deeply ashamed of. Yeah, maybe it was like an unprovoked thing. Just Josh being the monster that he was. I'd have to tell them the truth, but given the circumstances, it'd probably come out that I'd insulted this kid's dead mom, in which case I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But there it is. 
It was the scariest thing to happen to me for that Halloween and really any Halloween to come after. And the bullying didn't stop, but then again, when does it ever? So this isn't just my scariest trick-or-treating story, this is the story of the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. It's not some dumb story about ghosties or ghoulies or anything supernatural like that. It's something very real and very tangible that left me seriously messed up for a long, long time. My parents arranged counseling sessions for me to help deal with it and I can't say those didn't help a little, but... What happened that Halloween night has stayed with me for my whole life, and every single year, without fail, I think about it a little. Like a lot of suburban neighborhoods here on the east coast of the US, Halloween decorations have become something of an art form. I remember when decorations used to be confined to just a pumpkin and maybe a few things pinned to a front door, but now it's a whole different ball game, with lawns overflowing with orange colored decor and even the occasional roof being covered in those fake spiderweb type things. Things have gotten pretty intense too, like last year I saw how someone had actually dug up a patch of their own well preened front lawn to make like a fake grave type thing that had a skeletal hand sticking out of it. It's been that way for a few years now and it's a key to how my story even happened in the first place. So on the night in question... Me and a friend of mine are wandering around our neighborhood in costume, collecting as much candy as we could possibly carry. We come to this one particular house that's totally decked out in all kinds of Halloween themed decorations. I mean, it was honestly pretty impressive how much effort the family had put into it. And if they were so into Halloween that they go to such lengths to decorate their home, there was a decent chance that they'd be incredibly generous with giving out candy too. So me and my buddies started walking up their pathway, all slow, just admiring all the decor as we went. Things got progressively spookier as we went, but nothing could compare to the scene we saw as we got close to the front door, and that buddy of mine spied through the front window of the house. Inside, the entire front room had been turned into a pure vision of hell. This family was indeed the most dedicated set of Halloween decorators we'd ever come across, it appeared that they set up an actual sort of murder scene. The whole room was trashed with ornaments strewn over the room, china plates smashed to smithereens with pieces laying all over the carpet. There was blood everywhere too, splashed all over the couch along the bloody handprints on the walls and in the middle of the room, laying on the carpet, was the most convincing looking dead body I'd ever seen. The family had done a decent job of obscuring the mannequin or whatever it was by having it pretty much caked in blood and gore-soaked, torn-up clothing. It was maybe a little much for Halloween, though. Like, I've always been something of a scary movie fan, but even I couldn't stomach to look at it for very long, so I moved up to the front door and began ringing the doorbell. I rang once, then twice, but no one answered, and all the while my buddy's just staring through the front window, white as a sheet. I try a third time, banging on the door extra loud just in case the doorbell happened to be broken or something, and still my buddy is just gawking through the front window. I remember him saying something like, God, it just looks so real. Before I finally walk over and start trying to drag him away from the window before he vomited or something, the homeowners would certainly not be giving us any candy if we went and made a big old throw-up mess on their property. Only right as I'm doing so, I happened to look through the window just in time to see one of the TV room doors opening. In walked a man who looked like he'd been crying, like a whole lot too, and in his hand were these big plastic trash bags. We're only peeking in from the edge of the window so he didn't see us right away, and we watched as he walks over to the mannequin thing and kneels down beside it. He reaches out to touch the face of the thing, and that's when I see how he's got these rubber gloves on too the kind you use for washing up. I get that he didn't want to get any of the corn syrup blood or whatever it was on his hands and I started kind of wondering how he's going to get the stains out of the carpet. I mean that's real dedication to ruin your own upholstery all in the name of Halloween decorations and that's when it hits me. 
we're not looking at Halloween decorations. The body lying on the carpet isn't a mannequin, and it's not corn syrup on the walls. It's real blood. A real body. We're not looking at a decorative setup, we're looking at an actual murder scene. My buddy says just one word. Dude. Loud enough for the guy inside to hear us. His head spins towards the window, these big tear-stained eyes just focusing on the little spot we're peering in from, and the sad look in his eyes turns to one of pure shock and anger. We lock eyes for a moment and I feel my heart rate go into overdrive, a thousand terrified thoughts flashing my mind all at once. Then the man is up on his feet, storming out the TV room and towards what I could only guess was the front door. Me and my buddy just sprint back down the path, running as fast as we can as we hear the front door open up behind us. I look back briefly to see the man, clothes soaked in blood, chasing us out into the dark street. He was bigger than us, faster than us, and had absolutely no intention of letting us get away to report what we'd seen. I can't even describe the kind of fear that I'd felt, knowing it was only a matter of seconds before he caught up with us, and when he did, we'd probably suffer the same fate as whoever it was lying on the carpet back in his house. But as luck would have it, the streets were still pretty busy with trick-or-treaters at that hour and he must have realized that chasing a pair of kids still covered in blood would arouse way too much suspicion. Even if it was Halloween and people might mistake the real blood for fakery, just like we'd done in the first few minutes appearing through the front window. We ran and ran all the way back to my parents' house where we begged them to call the police. At first, my parents figured that our imaginations had just gotten the better of us and dismissed our claims that we'd seen an actual murder scene as pure fantasy. In the end, my dad insisted on seeing the scene for himself before calling the cops out, and even if the idea of going back there sent me into fits of terror, he wouldn't take no for an answer. I had horrible visions of the bloodied man just sticking a shotgun through his front door, and blowing my dad away so that there'd be no witnesses, and the whole walk around the murder house, I was absolutely terrified. But as we got closer, we started to see a bunch of blue flashing lights. It was only then that dad actually took me seriously, and as we edged around a corner and saw a bunch of cop cars sitting outside the murder house, he realized that I'd been telling the truth. I figured someone who saw him chasing us briefly had the wherewithal to call the police before us, and I thank God that they did, because I don't know if I'd even be writing this if we'd actually been able to walk back up that pathway and back towards the house. It was all over the papers for the next few days, how this guy had stabbed his wife to death, and rumors went round that he'd found out that she was cheating or something, but I never really got that it was confirmed or not, so only God knows what actually caused him to snap and murder her. Like I said... I had to have a great deal of therapy throughout my teenage years to help me get over what I saw that night and, for a long, long time, I saw that body in my nightmares. In the worst of them, me and my buddy would be looking through the window and the body would rise up into a sitting position before the woman screamed to us to help her, blood pouring from her cut up mouth as she did so. In some others, the guy would catch us, drag us back into the house then lay us on the carpet next to the body before taking a knife to us, one at a time. It took a while, but I got past it. Yet Halloween remains a time of year when I can't quite keep those memories out of my head. A time of year when others pretend to be haunted by ghosts and whatnot, whereas I'm actually haunted by the sight of that poor woman, lying on the carpet, covered in blood. It's Halloween night of 2007, and me and my little circle of friends are all serious horror fanatics. We've just gotten done watching that Rob Zombie remake of Halloween at a local movie theater, having been snuck into a showing of it by my older sister's boyfriend, even though we were way too young to be in there. It's not a brilliant movie, I guess, but we didn't care, because we're about to go trick-or-treating in a neighborhood where Halloween is a huge deal. 
Every kid for miles around was going to be walking the streets in their spookiest costumes, streets that were decked out in decorations so lavish that it'd make even the wealthiest theme parks blush. The parents in our area seemed to turn the whole thing into something of a competition, which made for a very, very spooktacular atmosphere. Needless to say, we were pumped. We all make our way back to our various parents' house, put on our different costumes, and then meet up at the end of our street to begin our undead shuffle around the neighborhoods. It was honestly one of the most memorable nights of my life. I can barely describe the kind of youthful excitement that possessed us that evening. It was absolutely electric. And since our costumes were tip-top, we absolutely cleaned up on the candy front. Some houses we called at gave us a few extra handfuls because we were just so excited to be trick-or-treating. At one point, one of my friends hid just out of view from the door of the house that we knocked on. Some mom and dad couple answered the door, smiling and wishing us an enthusiastic happy Halloween after we gave them our best trick-or-treat. Then, just as they're about to give us a handful of fun-sized candy bars, my friend jumps out at them from around the corner wearing his awesome looking werewolf mask and makes the loudest howling noise you could ever wish to hear from a 14 year old kid whose voice hadn't quite dropped yet. The dad of the couple is absolutely scared out of his skin, backing off from the doorway with this girlish wah sounding scream. The mom freezes for a second, all wide eyed and shocked before she just bursts out laughing at her husband's reaction. The dad's all like, that new kid, you scared the life out of me man but kind of starts cracking up too, which then just makes the mom laugh even more. Everyone is laughing to themselves at this point. It's a super wholesome moment, and it's something I'll remember fondly for the rest of my life. And thanks to the efforts of our werewolf buddy, we each got an extra handful of fun-sized bars in our candy sacks. It was a win-win scenario. So a little while later, we're all walking around still, our candy sacks absolutely stuffed with goodies that are probably going to last until December if we ration them right, and if we keep the stashes well hidden from the sticky fingers of our older siblings. We're not entirely bored yet, but the conversations have started wandering way beyond where we might be able to hit the mother load of candy next. That's when someone brings up a particularly scary story. I don't mean, ooh, super spooky skeleton story. I mean like legit terrifying. One of my buddies starts telling me the urban legend of the evil woman who got so sick of trick-or-treaters knocking on her house on Halloween that she gave them all poisoned candy and ended up killing a bunch of kids as a result. Scary enough, considering what we were doing, but totally not true, right? Wrong. Another of my buddies is all like, nah dude, that's, that's a true story and tells us how that stuff actually happened like back in the 80s or something. Apparently, and I did look this up myself later on to confirm it, this poor kid gets given a poisoned pixie stick while on his trick-or-treating rounds. He eats the candy inside, totally unaware of the sugar crystals inside are actually laced with cyanide. Yep, cyanide. Like one of the deadliest poisons known to man, same stuff Hitler swallowed to end his own life at the end of World War II. Then boom, the kid froths at the mouth and dies. It was no urban legend at all. That stuff legit happened for real. Then our buddy goes on to tell us that it wasn't some evil old lady that did the poisoning. It was his own dad that did it for some insurance thing. Like he took out life insurance on his kid, murdered him, then tried to claim on it. Sick, right? Seriously disturbing story and obviously we're all actually terrified by the prospect of it. We're walking along actually wondering aloud to each other if we'd called at anyone's house who seemed weird enough to actually do that. There was no seemingly evil old ladies that night but one of us starts joking that maybe, just maybe, the dude who we'd scared was actually angry at us and the extra candy that we'd been given had been laced with something to get revenge. Spooky prospect, I'm sure you'll agree, but a dumb one nonetheless. No one would actually lace candy with poison and give it to kids, which someone actually says aloud at one point. Then not 20 minutes later, we decided to dip into our candy halls a little early to sample some of the evening's well-earned delights. We're all chowing down when, suddenly, my buddy Tyler starts telling us how he doesn't feel so good. 
He hadn't eaten any candy up until just a few moments before, so it's not like he could have had a stomach ache from that. We're asking him if he's okay, if he needs to sit down, and if we need to get him some water from a nearby house or something. But he can barely respond other than to tell us that he feels dizzy and wants to go home. He then walks over to the curb and almost collapses down onto the grass, beginning to violently cough as he does so. And that's when he starts getting scared. I remember being all like, Come on man, stop faking it dude, this isn't funny, stop it. But he doesn't stop, and deep down I could tell he wasn't faking it. I, I can't feel my tongue, he suddenly says, and my heart just stopped in my chest. All I could think about was the candy poisoning story, how we'd been unlucky enough to actually run into someone evil enough to give us candy that had been laced with something toxic, or maybe even deadly. Oh my god, dude, it's poison candy, I remember saying out loud, which was incredibly stupid because not only did the three of us who were okay start to lose our minds out of fright, but Tyler started seriously panicking too, which obviously made his symptoms worse. Then, unbelievably, I actually watched as Tyler's face started to go all red and swell up, like his head was on its way to exploding right in front of us. One of us had ran off to get some help from a nearby house by then, though, banging on the front door and screaming for help as the rest of us watched Tyler hold his stomach and begin retching. We told him that he'd be okay, that we'd get him some help, but honestly, I thought I was going to watch one of my best friends die that night murdered at the hands of some mystery poisoner who would probably get away with the crime and go on to kill countless others. I imagine this mass funeral of kids from our town, all victims of the Halloween poisoner. The national press would get involved, the FBI. It would all go on for weeks and weeks while the town mourned the largest mass poisoning in the history of the USA. That's all that was rushing through my 14-year-old head, pure terror and speculation. But I mean, could you believe me? I was literally watching my friend's head swell up right before my very eyes, and then Tyler passed out. He was just that, unconscious, but I thought he was dead, and I was holding back, whimpering in tears by the time a pair of grown-ups ran out from the house nearby before running back inside to call 911. It was a terrible scene after that. A big crowd gathered to watch, even more showing up and gawking at the morbid scene when the ambulance showed up and stretched Tyler into the back of it. We couldn't go with him to the hospital, not realizing that the paramedics could find a way to contact Tyler's mom and dad once they had his name, which he had obviously given them. We were devastated at the idea of having to call round at their houses to tell them the horrible, horrible news that their son had died in front of us. It was horrendous, truly horrifying, and one of the most memorable nights in my life suddenly got so much more memorable, but for all the wrong reasons. We headed over to Tyler's parents' house, but no one was home. We thought we'd been spared the job of breaking the awful news to them, but in actual fact, they had already gotten the call that Tyler was at the hospital and had headed over to be with him. I told my parents what happened when I got home. Through ugly tears, I described the dizziness, the coughing, the wheezing, and the puking. My mom, who used to be an EMT back when she was in college, gave me this weird, knowing look, then headed off to get in touch with Tyler's parents while I went up to my room and cried myself to sleep. I was shaken awake a few hours later by my dad, who had some news for me. Some good news. Tyler wasn't dead and neither was Poison the reason why he'd had the terrible episode on the curb that night. You see, Tyler had an allergy, specifically to gelatin, something which is found in a lot of candies, cakes, ice creams, and yogurts. Tyler knew not to eat anything like that and had to agree to go through his candy hall with his parents later that evening so they could weed out anything that might give him a reaction. But what he didn't know, what I didn't know, and what many of you there might not know, is that some cereals contain gelatin. Yep, cereals. God knows how or why that might be the case, but it is. So as it turns out, Tyler sifted through his candy and found some chocolate cereal bar type thing and assumed that he could eat it. 
Fun fact, Tyler also checked the label himself to see if the thing contained any gelatin, but didn't realize that some products use different types for gelatin. Things like hydrolyzed animal protein, collagen hydrosylate, or denatured collagen. Obviously, 14-year-old Tyler was not a nutritional scientist and had no idea that these terms were pure semantics and that he was eating gelatin. But still, Tyler could have gone into anaphylactic shock. His throat could have closed over and he could have suffocated, right? Again, wrong. He was never in any real danger of this happening because only rarely does an allergic reaction to gelatin do that. Very rarely. Not like nut allergies, which can actually straight up kill you. Tyler just got taken to the hospital, given some antihistamines, and was kept overnight so the doctors could monitor his condition. So, in the end, everything was okay. No one died, and there was no mass poisoning in our town that year, but still. What happened that night was one of the most horrible events of my entire childhood, and I'm pretty sure you can all understand why. I love running. I'm not like competitive about it or anything, but I've been doing some casual 5Ks and 10K runs for a few years now, and I find it's a great way to stay slim and maintain my mental health. But about this time last year, I started to get a weird tight pain in my lower back whenever I was running. Turned out I had a kind of stress injury from a strength imbalance and would need a little bit of rehab to get over it. So all throughout the month of October, I stuck to a course of various strengthening exercises that were designed to help me build up my core and my glutes. It was hard going, and like a lot of injuries like mine, there was no quick fix to get me running properly again. It was a hard road of rehab and disappointment, which left me feeling pretty anxious and depressed. And it all kind of culminated on Halloween of last year, when I went for a run which left my back pretty messed up. I usually run around a big loop of a local park which happens to border a lot of housing and neighborhoods. What's more, the city council holds a few Halloween events in the park itself, some for kids, some for big kids. So naturally the place is absolutely teeming with nightlife on the evening in question, which made for a particularly interesting Halloween run. But the joy of slaloming around kids dressed in their spooky best was quickly overshadowed by the pain that began to burn in my lower back. It got progressively worse until after a measly 3.1 kilometers, I was forced to stop, limping my way along the outside path of the park, feeling shamefully defeated. Then right as I'm walking past this group of trick-or-treaters who were apparently old enough to be able to trick some poor off-licensed worker into selling them a few bottles of lager each, one of them makes some daft comment. Look at this idiot over here, one of them says. Looks like he just soiled himself. They all burst into juvenile laughter. Now, running usually makes me pretty zen, so any other time, I might just let a comment like that slide. Only that time, I'm in absolutely no mood to be spoken to like that. So obviously, I come back, hard, deliberately shoulder-barging the gobby offender on the way past him and telling him he'll be picking up his teeth with broken fingers if he keeps up that lip. Look, I'm not some hard case, but... I had a really tough time that month and I was really, really pent up from not being able to run properly. Remember I mentioned how it was good for my mental health? Yeah, that. Well, these kids were about 16 or 17 at the most, just about the right age to be put back in their place by someone older than them, only it turned out I was seriously misjudged their level of bravado, especially given the amount of Dutch courage that their bottles of lager had given them. So instead of just taking it on the chin and carry on walking in the opposite direction, the group of teenagers then turn around and start following me. Little side note here, I've seen a lot of Amara bottles type out, you what mate, as a funny way to mimic British parlance, I'll admit, it is amusing, but when we've got a group of drunk teenagers following you actually shouting, you what mate, it's not in the least bit amusing. So there I am. Getting followed around a dark part on Halloween by a bunch of costumed teenagers who are now intent on kicking my head in, and any potentially deterring witnesses are quickly dwindling. A trio or so of them wouldn't have been a problem, but like I said, 
There was more than a handful of these little buggers, meaning that if they actually plucked up the balls to do something about it, they could actually do me a fair bit of damage. Only there was one big problem. If they did happen to go on the offensive, it wasn't like I was in the condition to be able to actually run away from them. In fact, in that current state, I wasn't in the condition to be able to maintain a steady pace either. They were gaining on me pretty quickly, and as I said, the little gobby one was definitely keen to save some face. So, I kept plowing on, just sort of hoping that if they did attack, I'd have caught my breath enough to be able to properly defend myself. Only right when I do start feeling back to my best, the jibes from behind me stop, and when I actually look over my shoulder to see if they're still following me, I don't see a thing. Now, I don't want to give those little tow rags too much credit here, but having them just straight up disappear from behind me was legit unnerving. They really did just up a ninja out of sight somehow, and aside from a nearby tree line, there really weren't many places to hide. I scanned the dark spaces between the aforementioned trees for a minute or so, but didn't see anything obvious. And once I figured I was alone again, I kept on walking back to my flat. But again, like some proper horror movie, there was once or twice on the way back that I thought I heard something rustling in the bushes nearby, or thought I saw something darting among the trees nearby. It was definitely unnerving, yeah, but I really did just put it down to my imagination. Besides, how psychopathic and predatory would these kids have to be to successfully stalk me through a park like that? They were drunk teenagers, not the offspring of Michael Myers. I thought I was just losing it, but in the end, I ended up wishing that was the case. Because right as I walked onto the streets where I lived, got to my flat and turned up the path, I heard footfalls scrambling behind me. I turned to look behind me and my vision just goes white. When I come to, I'm lying in my pathway, hearing the sound of glass shattering and teenagers screaming. I try to look up to see what's going on, but I can't see out of my left eye at all. It felt hot and sticky, and for a moment, I thought it might be altogether gone. That's when the panic hit and I tried to bring myself to my feet, when another blow to my head from a foot or a fist sends me collapsing back onto the gravel. That's what you get. I hear this squeaky little voice yelp, and now we know where you live. They didn't quite know where I lived. They ended up breaking the window of one of my neighbors, which obviously they weren't too happy about. But they did end up breaking my orbital socket, which kept me in a hospital overnight. But since the house we were in had no CCTV, and there was basically no witnesses who could identify the kids in question, they pretty much got away scot-free with it. But honestly, that wasn't even the worst part about it. A skull fracture was bad, sure, but that healed with time. What didn't get any better was these kids hanging around outside my flat for months on end, pretty much every night until the wee small hours of the morning. No matter how often we phoned the police and got them dispersed, there was pretty much nothing they could do about them coming back, and the more we called, the less they were interested in actually doing their jobs. I expected the kids to actually attack me again, but they didn't. They ended up doing some considerable more damage to my car once they worked out which one was mine. Not particularly scary, I know, but the bill for getting the scratches out of the paintwork was. It just ground me down over time, though. Messing with my sleep, my mental health, everything just slowly turned to torture after the attack. So I ended up moving out, and that did solve everything. And I know they're just teenagers, and I bet there's a hundred of you sitting there like, oh, I'd have power bomb that kid right then and there. You're just a little baby for letting them stitch you up like that, but I don't care. You get yourself into a position where these feral, bloody teenagers want your blood? Minds of children, but bodies of full-grown blokes? The fear is very, very real. I don't know if this is going to scare any adult readers out here, but as a kid, this definitely scared the life out of me. My dad used to take me and my sister trick-or-treating around our neighborhood here in Toronto every year when we were kids, being a chaperone so we didn't get lost or picked on by older kids. 
He was always good like that, and me and my sister used to share our candy with him when we got home. It was a major dad tax, but we never minded. There's no way I'd have felt safe enough going out of my own on a dark, freezing night, not when I was that age anyway. So this one year, we ended up knocking at a new neighbor's house on Halloween night. They'd only moved in like a week or two before, and I don't think my parents had any interactions with them. So I imagined Dad thought that it would be a good idea to knock that night so we could get some candy while he could say hi to the new arrivals. Two birds, one stone, and all that. But what we didn't know was that these new neighbors were super hardcore Christians and most definitely were not down with the whole spooky Halloween atmosphere. So we knock on their door. The neighbor lady answers and we're all like, Trick or treat! Pretty much every single household up until that point had reacted wonderfully told us how cute we looked in our costumes, giving us candy, all that good stuff, but this lady reacts really, really badly and starts telling Dad how irresponsible he is for taking us out into the cold on a night like that. A little exchange kicks off between her and Dad, who politely defends his reasoning, even making a joke about how he got to eat a little candy for himself. The lady just stared at him blankly for a second before she starts screaming all this Bible stuff at us. She had this horrible look of pure anger on her face, all twisted up with big furious eyes and she pointed a long bony finger at us. I couldn't remember exactly what she said so I spent a little more time doing research so I could pull up some of the exact quotes that came out of her. Like I said, not totally terrifying for adults and I remember my dad shaking his head and just leading us away from the house. But to me and my sister, all the screaming about God and demons and the devil and whatnot just absolutely terrified us, and we cried so hard for a while until Dad could manage to calm us down. So one of the things that she had said was, Abstain from every form of evil. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Which I guess was her implying that you couldn't partake in any spooky fun around Halloween if you really wanted to be a good, God-fearing Christian. Another was definitely, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them and give no opportunity to the devil. She screamed that one at us as my dad took us each by the hand and led us away from the house. The final thing we heard before we got out into the open street was, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I mean, she carried on screaming stuff at us, following us outside and into the streets, as I'm guessing she started ranting at all the other parent and kid teams who were out that night, but I can't really remember what she said after that. I didn't hear over my own sobbing. Dad walked us away until we couldn't hear her anymore, then gave us each a big hug to calm us down. I remember asking him if trick-or-treating made us bad people, but he told us no. There was no harm in a little bit of spooky fun on Halloween, and that God wouldn't be mad at us for visiting our neighbors or sharing candy with strangers. That kind of thing made people and communities feel closer together, not further apart. The only thing that did push people apart were horrible neighbor ladies who scream scary things at kids and get mad at them when they don't deserve it. All that made us feel much better and calmed us right down just about in time to knock on a few more houses before we called it a night, heading home to eat ourselves into a diabetes hole in front of a Nightmare Before Christmas movie which coincidentally is still one of my favorite movies ever. Years went by, but I never forgot about how horrible that neighbor lady was to us that evening, and me and my sister grew to hate her. Y'all might be pretty happy to hear that she used to get the trick side of trick-or-treating quite a lot too, and it wasn't unusual for my sister and I to head off to school on the morning of November 1st to see them pulling toilet paper out of the tree in their front yard. But anyways, that's definitely the scariest thing that ever happened to me out of all the times I went trick-or-treating during my youth. Maybe that makes me sound a little sheltered, but as I said, I challenge any 11-year-old not to get super creeped out by a lady screaming scary Bible verses in their face on a dark, freezing night like that.
I was about 14 years old when my family had just moved to a new town. I was also lucky enough to make a fast friend at my new school and we subsequently made plans to go trick-or-treating together since it was coming up to Halloween night. Because we were 14 and lived in a fairly safe neighborhood, my parents told us that they didn't think I needed a chaperone that year. So while everything was going great and we were having fun, getting some solid candy, it was kind of cool just walking around on our own, feeling sort of grown up. We knock at one house and this middle-aged man opened the door. He seemed happy to see my new friend and me, so I assumed we were in for some grade A candy. I don't actually remember what candy he handed out, but I do remember what happened next. He asked us to come inside, which is weird, but we really wanted candy, so I guess we were dumb enough to take the bait. He disappears for a moment, and I kind of assumed that he was going to get us some candy, but when he re-emerges, he doesn't have any, only a camera in his hand. Then he asks if he could take a couple of pictures of us explaining that he liked to take photos of kids every Halloween because he loved seeing the costumes, how he was something of a collector. At this point, even being a fairly naive 14-year-old, I got weirded out, yet knew it was best not to upset the man and let him take the picture and then we could leave. So he takes the photo of us, waits for the Polaroid to come out, then hands us a pen, asks us to sign our names on the back. Me and my new friend did as we're told, but Although we'd been dumb enough to actually go into this guy's house with him, we weren't dumb enough to sign our actual names, so we wrote fake ones on the back just to satisfy him. Only then were we allowed to leave with the candy that he gave us after we signed. I don't know if this guy was on some sort of list or some sort of offender or anything like that. There were no more run-ins with him and nothing in the way of rumors going around town, but I still get creeped out thinking about what he did with that photo of me. The scariest thing that ever happened to me on Halloween was back when I was living in Liverpool for university. Halloween is always a big night for students, as is any yearly event that involves dressing up and getting absolutely wasted. But since Halloween is a really good excuse to wear considerably less clothes than usual, party-oriented students tend to get particularly excited about it. So I'm in second year at this point, living with a bunch of my student mates just off Smithton Road, which is where loads of students can get shared houses for really cheap rent. We heard that this big house party was happening just down the road from us, one of those that had its own little Facebook events page set up to keep track of invites and give people directions to the house. I remember my mates sitting around the kitchen table, all staring at the screen as they went through all the profiles of girls they said that were attending. I mean, some of them were absolutely gorgeous, so we were all definitely hyped about it. Only just a few days before Halloween, I started to feel really, really grim. I had the shakes, I was running to and from the toilet every half an hour to erupt from both ends, and I could barely keep any food down. This persisted for like 48 hours straight, and thankfully it had abated by Halloween itself, but I still felt way too rough to do any serious partying. The last thing I wanted was to end up browning myself in front of like half the girls at our uni. I mean, every lad wants to be a legend, don't they, but for the right reasons. So anyway, on the day of the house party, despite my mates insisting I make an appearance and throw together a costume, I had made the firm decision to stay at home and chill for the evening. As much as I felt like I'm missing out, I just didn't feel up to it. So about seven-ish, my mates are pre-drinking in the kitchen while I'm up in my room looking to order the spiciest curry I could get my hands on in the hopes that it would purge the rest of the sickness out of me so I could start the following week feeling fresh again. So about the time I'm burning my face off with a little chicken vindaloo, my mates are just about to head off down to the house party for a night of debauchery. There are a few final pleas for me to join them, but these are all violently rebuked. There might have been a chance of me joining them before the curry, but afterwards, no chance. I was in a full-on food coma. So a couple of hours later, I'm just chilling on the couch and wondering why British Netflix had such a dire collection of horror films when there's a knock at our front door. My first thought is that 
there's been some kind of puke-related disaster and one of the lads had to come back to get a change of clothes before heading back to the house party. I mean, this wasn't entirely out of the question, since the house party was only around the corner, safe staggering distance for anyone that had drank too much too quickly. But it then occurred to me that there was a chance it could have been trick-or-treaters. Smithen has a big mix of residential and student housing, so there's also a decent chance it could have been kids looking for sweets. So to save the house getting egged, I legged it into the kitchen and grabbed a few bits from the cupboards to offer any potential trick-or-treaters. But when I answered the door, Mars bars in hand, there was no one there. Maybe I'd just taken too long grabbing sweets, or maybe it was just some knock-and-run type deal. But either way, there was no one to be seen. So I just head back inside, plonk myself down on the couch, and get back to digesting a ton of curry that I'd just eaten. A short while later, I'm still watching Netflix, about ready to doze off when something in the corner of the living room catches my eye. You know when you're so used to looking at a certain something that just the oddest little difference catches your eye? Well, I happen to notice that there was a little less of the orange streetlights outside coming through the little crack between the curtains and the window. Like this dark shape was outside, standing at the window. I sit up all nervous and it disappears from view, allowing me to see the orange light illuminating the street once again. Someone had been watching me. I got up, rushed to the cupboard under the stairs to grab my housemate's cricket bat, then edged toward the front door. I threw it open, ready to swing at whatever was out there, but again, there was nothing. I started to feel like I was going mental at that point, that maybe I was just exhausted from being sick for most of the week. I hadn't slept very well at all during the few days prior to Halloween, and I tried to reassure myself that maybe I was just a wee bit jumpy from being overtired. I decided it was best that I get an early night, telling myself that I'd feel much better in the morning. I did a bit of washing up, got a shower, then put on some comfy clothes to get ready for bed, but just as I do, there's another knock on the door. Only this time I can clearly hear some young sounding voice go trick or treat from the other side of the door. I'd almost jumped out of my skin when I heard the door go, but the voice was weirdly reassuring. I mean, it was only trick or treaters, right? The worst that could happen was I got a few eggs thrown at me or some toilet paper lashed over the house. I walked downstairs, grabbed the handful of Mars bars I'd fished out of the cupboard, then opened up the front door. I was expecting to see a gaggle of school-aged kids, maybe accompanied by an adult supervising them, but there was just one smallish-looking figure stood in the pathway of our shared house. They couldn't have been any older than a teenager, but they definitely looked a little bit too old to be trick-or-treating. I don't imagine that they'd been particularly intimidating otherwise, but the mask they were wearing seriously gave me the creeps. It looked old, like it smelled like disgusting unwashed latex on the inside. I'm not even sure it was meant to be a Halloween mask at all. It was like an old man's face with these tiny black eyes and a big white smile stretching from ear to ear. I made some derisive comment to him like, aren't you a bit too old to be trick-or-treating? But held the handful of Mars bars out towards him anyway. I reckoned he'd just tell me to bugger off and snatch the sweets off me and leg it down the path. But he didn't. The lad just stood there, looking at me from behind the mask, not even moving to take the chocolate bars off me. I asked him if he was alright, starting to actually get creeped out by his behavior on top of the weird old mask he was wearing, but still he didn't say anything. There was something intensely creepy about not being able to see his actual eyes behind that mask, and the longer we stood there in silence, just staring at each other, the more I felt myself begin to tense up. Then right as I'm about to just give him an awkward goodbye and shut the door, I hear a loud noise coming from behind me. I didn't really think the situation through, I just reacted, running into the kitchen at the back of the house where the noise was coming from, just in time to see someone smash the back door open. About three or four people then pour into the kitchen, all wearing masks, some armed with bats, others with these big knives in their hands. I turn around and leg it back towards the front door, planning on running upstairs to my room where my phone was charging to bring the police, but to my absolute horror, Blocking the way to the stairs was the little lad with the mask on, 
only this time, he had a knife in his hand too. He'd been in on this whole thing that whole time, and as he pointed the knife in my direction, all I could do was raise my hands in this please don't stab me type of way. Get on the floor, he said, in this voice that seriously sounded like he was no older than about 14, like he legit sounded like a kid, and that scared me even more. A grown man might have the presence of mind to not hurt anyone and keep the severity of their crimes to a minimum, but a kid, I thought he might just stab me up for the fun of it. I'd heard stories about gangs all over the world making younger kids commit violence to just sort of prove themselves, and that's what had me shaking as I lay down on the carpeted floor in the hallway, face down with my hands on the back of my head. I listened as the gang just completely ransacked the house. I couldn't see exactly what they were taking, but I heard them mentioning laptops and phones a fair bit, laughing to themselves as they absolutely raided each and every room in the house. At some points, I heard smashing and crashing noises as they just took it upon themselves to commit as much wanton destruction as they liked, giggling maniacally to each other as they realized they had the time and freedom to do pretty much whatever they fancied. I thought if I just lay there, keeping still and quiet, that they'd leave me alone, but that was just wishful thinking on my part. Obviously, they had to make their way through the hallway a fair few times, and when they did, They'd either literally walk all over me, which was painful enough, or they'd get in a few kicks here and there just to hear me grimace. I think the worst part of the physical abuse was when I heard one of them say, Kick him in the balls, lad, to one of their mates. I tried to shut my legs, but they still aimed a few kicks between my thighs. Luckily, I was kind of tucked up, if you know what I mean, and there wasn't anything too delicate exposed, but still... The idea of getting my bollocks crushed under the trainer of some disgusting little thug had my heart practically jumping out of my throat. It sort of reminded me of that scene from A Clockwork Orange. They were there to rob us. That was bloody obvious, but they clearly took a great deal of joy in just being able to terrorize someone for a bit, and they seemed to get a real kick out of realizing that I wasn't from Liverpool. At some point I said something like, Just take what you want. Please don't hurt me. And they burst out laughing. I wouldn't say I'm posh by any stretch of the imagination, but I'd definitely say I'm well more spoken than your average scouser. They started mimicking me in these little voices, stamping on my head and kicking me. I just lay there, wishing I'd never said anything. After what seemed like forever, listening to those kids ferrying out belongings into the alley behind the house, they finally left but not before putting one of their knives to my throat and telling me that they'd be back to cut my head off if they so much as even saw a police officer in the area. Then as quickly as they'd all appeared, they just ghosted. I waited for a long time before I found it in me to stand up, and as I tried, my knees were way shakier than I'd care to admit. I went from room to room surveying the destruction. The place was a mess, but the thing that amazed and gutted me more than anything else was the sheer amount of stuff they'd taken. God knows how they'd got it all away from the house, but they'd taken the TVs, our game consoles, audio equipment, pretty much anything electrical that wasn't nailed down. It also looked like they'd taken pretty much all our trainers and had raided our closets for any clothes that took their liking. I wanted to call the police, really did, but with what phone? I'm almost glad I got a few kicks to the head, otherwise the sense of shame and humiliation might have been too much to bear. I ended up knocking at my neighbor's houses, but unlike me, they were way too smart to answer their doors to strangers on Halloween. It was probably the single worst experience of my life up to that point. I had to just go back inside the house and sit there in the living room couch with my head in my hands, just trying not to hold back tears. It was hours before any of my drunken housemates arrived back. Before that, I think I just sort of sat there at the kitchen table in the one room that hadn't been completely ransacked, just drinking a few tins of lager, feeling absolutely shell-shocked, until finally two of them who hadn't pulled returned home. And that's about the end of it. There's no real resolution to this story. The police couldn't do anything other than take down a list of what had been stolen in the hopes that 
any of the laptops turned up in pawn shops, but we never heard back about anything involving that. It was weird in that house for a long while after. I used to think the other lads blamed me for what happened for not defending the house property, but I realized that was just the trauma from that night making me doubt myself. I had nightmares for a while, a long while actually, and in the end my parents paid for a few counseling sessions to help me get through my skull that what happened that night really wasn't my fault, how it could have happened to anyone. I got past it in time, but to this day, it remains the single most terrifying event of my entire life. I grew up in rural Iowa, the kind of place where it's just cornfields for miles and miles around. It was a pretty terrible place to grow up, like it'll always be home to me and I'll always have a fair amount of affection for it. Home is where the heart is and all that nonsense, but even from the earliest age I can remember I couldn't wait to leave. Like put it this way, Halloween has always been my favorite holiday, but unlike the kids who trick or treat over in Cedar Rapids or Waterloo, who had actual neighborhoods to harvest whole sacks of candy from, we'd have to walk like a mile and a half at a time just to make it to the next house. So aside from the one year where our mom drove us over to Dyersville so we could actually get a taste of how those city kids lived, trick-or-treating just wasn't really an option for us. So a little backstory here, the last year we were allowed to go trick-or-treating, our immediate neighbor to the east who lived like three miles away basically told us to buzz off because we were getting way too big to be playing kids games. This guy has begrudgingly given us a few apples some years and we always sort of resented him for it. But that year, when he told us where to go, it made us downright hate him. I mean, for the entirety of the next year, me and my brother would scowl whenever my dad drove us past his house. To us, he ruined the one good thing we got to do around Halloween each year. I know we were just dumb kids, but kids are also cruel and stubborn on occasion, and I guess we were just that kind of kid. So the next year, my mom decides to take us over to Living History Farms over in Urbandale. Living History Farms is this place over near Des Moines that bills itself as interactive outdoor museum, which teaches people about Midwestern rural life experiences. Obviously, we weren't thrilled about the visit. It wasn't exactly exciting for two boys in their early teens. I mean, learning about some of the origins of Halloween was pretty cool. I mean, a kid like me was all about hearing how Halloween was the night when spirits of the dead returned to earth to wreak havoc on those that had wronged them in life. However, there was one particular little educational tidbit that got me and my brother's attention. And that was the stories of how our Iowan ancestors used Halloween as a night to play all kinds of pranks on each other. Pulling up cabbages and shrubs out of the garden was a common trick. Wagons were pushed into the lane or the street, or if the kids were feeling ambitious, they'd hoist the cars up on top of the victim's barn roof. But the most common mischief was taking your neighbor's garden or barnyard gates off the hinges and leaving it in someone else's yard. I remember the teacher lady telling us this, then me and my brother just looking at each other with this wordless kind of communication like, oh, the neighbor is going to get it this year. So that year, we snuck out of the house in the early hours of the morning, walked down to the neighbor's place with a screwdriver and hammer, and then did exactly that. We took his front gate off the hinges, walked it like a mile down the road to his other neighbor's place, then left it in the front yard. We did stuff like that for the next couple of years, each time getting progressively more bold, screwing with him harder and harder until it got to the point that we struggled to top the previous year's prank. Like it got to the point where we stole a huge section of his white picket fence and just threw it into the cornfield across the highway. I mean, we put some actual work into that, dismantling it piece by piece so as not to make too much noise and wake the guy. I mean, it sucked that we never got to hang around to see his reaction, but I guess imagining him going outside in the morning and going insane with rage was enough to keep us amused. So this one year, we rocked up to his house in the middle of the night and saw something we'd never expected to see in a million years. 
The neighbor guy obviously hated Halloween and never ever put up any decorations or anything. But that year, we turned up to see this grim reaper figure on his porch. It wasn't just some dumb looking scarecrow type thing either. It seemed like the guy had put in a lot of work getting hold of an actual mannequin of something, as well as all this spooky looking black robe stuff to dress it in. But since he was a farmer, he didn't have much trouble getting hold of the old rusty scythe that was leaning up against it. I mean, yeah, it was kind of intimidating. He'd obviously only put it there to try to scare us off, but we weren't about to be put off from our little year ritual at this point. Nothing short of a tornado could deter us from getting our revenge for having been so mean to us that Halloween night. But right as we start to dismantle his fence in almost absolute silence, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Or rather, I noticed the lack of something. So subtle that it actually takes me a minute to realize what I wasn't looking at. At some point, as we were taking his fence apart, the Grim Reaper statue thing had just up and disappeared. I stopped what I'm doing, looking around the front yard and trying to spot where it could have gone. I whisper over to my brother like, The Reaper's gone. Did you see it move? And at first he looked at me like I'm crazy. But then he too starts getting pretty freaked out. We're just crouched down, tools in hand, in the dead silence of the night, realizing that we've been a little bit overconfident in our yearly pranks. I mean, we didn't quite realize what was happening at the time, only that things were about to go horribly wrong for us. Let's get out of here, my brother whispered, and we immediately get up and start sort of jogging back towards the highway. Then, out of nowhere, the Grim Reaper is just standing there in front of us, with that big old rusty scythe in his hand, blocking our escape. It hadn't been a mannequin that was set up on the neighbor guy's porch. It was actually him. He dressed up like some dumb decoration and just stood there, still as a statue, waiting for the pranksters to arrive. There was like one drawn out moment where we just sort of locked eyes with the guy who had taken down the hood of the black robes he was wearing, and then we just bolted. But since he was blocking the way to the road out front, we had to run back through his property, climbing over a fence and into a cornfield to get away from him. He was really fast for an older guy too, like maybe it was just all that anger from having been victimized year after year, but somehow he wasn't weighed down by that scythe and those robes, which for some reason he'd opted to keep on, didn't slow him down either. I was scared sure, but I figured we'd be able to get away, but remember how I said we had to scale a fence to get away? Well jumping down the other side didn't go too well for me and I badly sprained my ankle when I landed. That was when I really got terrified, when I realized I couldn't actually get away from the guy. My brother just kept running and I wanted to shout after him to help me but I knew the shout would give away my position to the guy so I just kept my mouth shut. So picture the scene, I'm hiding out in the cornfield, so scared that I'm actually covering my mouth to keep from breathing too heavy while this furious scythe armed guy is stalking up and down the rows looking for me. So every so often, I had to just sort of limp to a hiding spot further away from him, trying my best not to rustle any of the stock so I wouldn't betray my hiding spot. I mean, thank God it was the middle of the night, and maybe the guy's eyesight or hearing was just failing him in general, but I managed not to get myself caught. I just kept on stumbling further and further away until he just gave up and headed back to his house. But Jesus Christ, it was completely and utterly terrifying, hearing him say all this stuff like, I'm going to cut you up into little pieces and feed you to my pigs. Like the voice of his was telling me he meant every word of what he said. So yeah, as you can imagine, I was pretty close to peeing my pants, knowing that I just couldn't get away fast enough. Needless to say, we didn't try any more pranks on that guy after that. I made up some excuse to my parents as to how I'd hurt my ankle and then just to use it as an excuse to stay home until it had healed, given that I was super paranoid about the neighbor guy figuring out who exactly had been victimizing him year after year. But yeah, that's my story. I know it's probably not the scariest thing you'd ever heard, and I know that we kind of deserve what we got, 
in the end. So I had a pretty weird childhood growing up down in Florida. My parents weren't always present, I mean, they weren't bad parents by any stretch of the imagination, they always provided for me and my sister, but let's just say they weren't always the most attentive because of their respective work schedules. I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted to, which, as you can imagine, wasn't exactly good for me. And one of the things I'd do which definitely messed me up a bit as a child was staying up all hours watching late night TV until I passed out on the couch. Like I love those times. I got to see all these messed up movies and stuff way before any of my friends got to. But it was staying up late like that which allowed me to see something even more screwed up than any horror movie or Cinemax flick. It's Halloween night, of all the nights for this to happen, and I'm lying on the couch in the TV room after a night of successful trick-or-treating with a few school friends. I'm just sort of drifting off while watching Nightmare on Elm Street, only really awake from the stomach ache of eating way too much Halloween candy, when I hear a noise coming from the porch. I instantly recognize it was the sound of an old school porch swing rocking back and forth, like this telltale metal creaking noise that I'm sure you can all imagine pretty well. My mom and dad are doing their weird grown up things upstairs which turned out years later that they were a husband and wife team of drug dealers, and my sister is in bed upstairs, so as soon as I realize whoever is out there is actually some complete stranger, I start getting pretty creeped out. But as much as I was pretty scared, I absolutely could not resist the urge to see who it was. I had to know. Even when I was that age, I was super protective of my little sister. So I find myself just slowly creeping on my tiptoes over towards the big bay windows of the TV room and peeking around the curtains to see out into the porch. It's pretty dark outside and we didn't have a security light back then, so I could only use the glow of the street lights outside to actually make out who was out there on the porch. But I'll never forget what I saw when my eyes finally adjusted after having been staring at a bright TV in a dark room for so long. Sitting there, Rocking back and forth on our porch swing is this middle-aged looking woman. She looked about as old as my grandma at the time, so maybe 50 to 60, wearing nothing but some old nightdress type thing. In her hand was something I didn't quite recognize at first because of what it was covered in. If I could have seen the blade shining in the low light, I'd have known it was a knife right away. But because it was still dripping with what I could only assume was blood, that actually looked kind of black in the orange street light. It took me a minute to realize exactly the kind of horror that I was facing. When I finally did, I immediately just freak out and bolt upstairs to my parents' room. They did that weird thing that they always did when I burst into their room unannounced, closing various drawers or boxes, hiding things they didn't want me to see. They were angry as usual, asking me impatiently what I was thinking just walking into their room like that, Usually it was for me to tell them I needed food or whatever they neglected to do, but this time I was just too terrified to actually get the words out. Like I'd said, they were annoyed at first, but when they realized just how upset I was, they actually took me seriously for once. Maybe they thought it was the cops or something outside. I guess they were right to be paranoid about that sort of thing. But when I actually told them what I'd seen, they lost all sympathy. I remember my dad telling me that it was just a bad dream from all the dumb movies I watched, like that wasn't mostly their fault, and all the Halloween candy I'd eaten, and that I should grow up and go back to bed. But I just kept on crying and begging him to go look, insisting that what I'd seen was actually real, and not just some figment of my childish, horror-saturated imagination. He tried to push me out of the room so that they could carry on with whatever illegal nonsense that they were doing in there, but when I pretty much just clung on to him and screamed my little head off, he finally snapped. He dragged me downstairs by the arm, so hard I almost fell down the entire flight of stairs, then into the TV room and over to the front door, apparently just to prove that there was nothing actually there. But as you can imagine, this only made me worse. He was pulling me towards the single most terrifying image I'd ever seen at that point in my life. Way more terrifying than just some dumb horror movie 
because what I'd seen was actually real life, and even though I was young, that was painfully clear to me. We reach the front door. He swings it open and drags me outside, cursing under his breath the whole time. Then he like points in the direction of the porch without even really looking himself and says, See? There's nothing there at all. Just your fri- Then he stops, because he actually sees what I've been talking about. I never saw a look like that on his face ever again. One of pure shock and terror that his kid had actually been telling the truth about something so utterly horrific. It was only then that I actually got a really good look at the woman instead of seeing the bloody knife in her grip. She was ashen-faced, like she was completely traumatized by something. Her hair was up in rollers, and the nightdress or nightgown or whatever she was wearing was absolutely soaked in blood. She turned towards us, and there was just nothing behind her eyes. They were wide, these big white and brown circles just sunken into her head, but there was nothing in them like she had no soul to speak of whatsoever. Then she stood up, that bloody knife in her grip, and said the words I'll never forget as long as I live. I killed him. I had to. I couldn't take it anymore. So I killed him. My dad just pulls me inside the house, even more violently than he dragged me out of it, then slams the door and runs to grab his gun from the upstairs bedroom. For years I wonder why I didn't just call the cops, but I suppose that's something else that's painfully clear at this point. I watch from the hallway, peeking out as he goes back outside and points the gun at her, telling him to get off the porch as the cops were on their way. This was a lie, obviously, but it was enough to get her to leave. She didn't even run, though. She just sort of stood up, all slow, and then wandered off into the night as I watched her from a crack in the TV room curtains, same spot I'd spied her from the first time. It was only like ten years later that I actually found out what the deal was. Apparently the him she was referring to was her abusive husband, who'd been beating on her so much that she'd gotten sick of it and decided to finally defend herself, albeit in a pretty permanent way. She'd finally gotten picked up by the cops later that night when she tried to break into one of our neighbor's houses, and as far as I know, she's still in prison for what she did. I also wondered why my parents were so keen to get rid of the porch swing that day and why they lied to the cops when they called, telling her they hadn't seen the woman even though they had. I guess they just didn't want anyone snooping around the house asking questions or picking up any suspicious smells that might lead to some kind of DEA raid or whatever. Nothing really changed after that, though. My parents didn't get any better at being actual parents. I just didn't stay up late anymore. Because I never wanted to be the one to discover anything like that ever again. My family has lived out here in rural Nebraska since they emigrated from Bohemia, located in the modern-day Czech Republic in the middle of the 19th century. Apparently they were part of some weird, obscure Christian sect, one that was heavily persecuted in their native Bohemia. So they took a ship to Ellis Island and lived in New York City until they were basically chased out of there too, hence why they ended up in rural Nebraska. They started a farm here, worked the land and actually became relatively wealthy for the time whilst keeping themselves to themselves. According to a family story which my grandpa insists is 100% true, it was the middle of October when my great-great-grandma comes down with some horrible disease. The family did everything they could to keep her comfortable, riding their horses for miles and miles to fetch her medicine which actually brought her back from the brink a few times. But eventually, Right when they thought she might actually be okay, her condition deteriorated rapidly and she passed away one night, just after midnight. Now, this would have been a sad occasion under any circumstances, but the date of her passing was of particular relevance to my family. You see, she died just after midnight on the 31st of October on Halloween. Like I said, my family were members of a particularly strange sect of Eastern European Christians, 
ones that, like many, believe that Halloween was a time when the spirits of the dead were particularly active. Only they believe that if a person died on Halloween, that it was possible for these long dead spirits to enter the corpse of the person recently deceased, to take over their body and resurrect it in order to perform acts of evil. To prevent this, they had to perform a series of rituals very quickly before burying the dead person as soon as possible in order to prevent the evil spirits from taking hold in the person's body. So according to Grandpa's story, they washed my great-great-grandma's body with ointment, burned sage to shoo away spirits, then buried her in the family cemetery located in a secluded patch of their farmland. Now apparently, my great-great-grandma had these two big dogs that absolutely adored her. Naturally, they were completely devastated when she'd passed on and stayed by her body for the longest time. When she was buried, they refused to leave her gravesite and no matter how much meat or animal bones they were offered by my family, they refused to come inside the old farmhouse. They thought this would just happen for a day or two until they realized the permanence of the loss and just got too cold or hungry and decided to return indoors. But night after night they slept by the grave only eating or drinking water if it was brought over to them, and even then they seemed to do so reluctantly. Then, about a week and a half after she was buried, well into the month of November they began to bark and scratch at the earth atop the grave. They would howl all night long, and the attempts at digging got so bad that eventually a long-dead uncle of mine had to go out there and drag each of the dogs inside in order to keep them from straight up digging up the grave. But even when they were locked inside... The dogs would bark and howl in the direction of the cemetery, which obviously caused the family a huge amount of distress. The grief was bad enough without the weird behavior of the dogs, but as much as they tried to quiet the animals, the dogs just would not cease their barking and howling. Apparently, it was close to driving the family half insane by the time they tried to do anything about it. They had even discussed killing the dogs just so they could get some real sleep at night. Before they took any such drastic action, they decided to check out the grave in order to make sure nothing was amiss with the burial. It was thought that maybe rats might have burrowed their way into the grave, chewed through the wood of the coffin, and were gnawing on my great-great-grandma's rotting flesh, which obviously the dogs will have been able to hear or at least smell given their more powerful senses of perception. But after hours of work digging through the frozen soil, they reached my great-great-grandma's casket and found that there was no damage to the wood, and it was all perfectly intact. But still, the dogs kept on barking. They ran out to the grave site and began barking into the open grave, so the family decided to properly exhume her to make sure nothing was amiss. What they found was absolutely horrifying. Instead of the peaceful look on my great-great-grandma's face, the one she was buried with, she had wide, dead, terrified eyes, and her jaw was wide open in what appeared to be a death scream. Huge chunks of her hair had been torn out from her scalp, presumably by her own hands, lying in patches of steel gray around her rotting head. Not only that, but her fingers were bloody and mangled, the fingernails lying around the wooden box where they'd been torn off by incessant scratching on the coffin lid, which itself bore the damage from her efforts. The sight drove her still-living husband to madness. He ran screaming from the gravesite and was never the same again. And when he realized exactly what had happened that Halloween night, he hung himself from a rafter in the barn. And he did so because he realized, despite the lack of medical knowledge possessed by the family, that my great-great-grandma hadn't been quite dead when they had buried her that night. In fact, she had merely slipped into a comatose state one which was mistaken for death by the family that was so lacking in accurate medical knowledge. And so, when she was unconscious and presumed dead, they'd taken her out to the cemetery that day and buried her alive. The dogs were barking and howling not because they could hear rats, but because they could hear my great-great-grandma screams for help. They could hear her ripping her own nails out from clawing at the wood of her own coffin, and it drove them to an absolute panic. That's why they barked and howled at night, because they knew their beloved owner was suffering so much. I'm not sure how true this whole story is, to be honest, but 
I also can't think of a reason why such a tall tale might even exist in our family. Surely a person might want to hide something like that from the world forever, but maybe it's retold so often because they never, ever want it to happen again for any reason, because the results of their poor judgment were so traumatic that it almost destroyed an entire family, one that had already survived such hideous persecution on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. But I know it's a story that, once a year, around Halloween, the elders of our family tell to the oldest of the children so that they might tell the tale in time to ensure that no matter what happens, the family never faces such a mind-shattering horror as long as it might exist. My mom married her boyfriend of a few years about five years ago now. It wasn't one of those weird, awkward affairs, though. I was genuinely happy for her. You see, my dad passed away from brain cancer way back when I was 12, so she had been a widow for over 12 years, and I know just how lonely she'd been in that time. Her new relationship with this guy was a huge whirlwind for years, with them meeting, dating, breaking up, dating again before eventually getting married. My mom felt like she was betraying dad's memories at times, and she didn't make it easy on the new guy. But he stuck with her, even when she was having rough patches, and I gotta admit, that really won me over when I realized just how much he loved her. She spoke once about him having experienced some loss in his life too, and how that experience had united them, giving them a shared experience to bond over. As I said, I liked him, and I didn't know much about his personal life or his background, but my mom was happy enough, so I really did approve of the whole thing. After she married him, she ended up packing her bags and moving into this big old house of his up in Scotland. Turns out he had a lot of money from playing the stock market and actually offered to pay the rent on the apartment me and mom used to share, which, as you can imagine, didn't get an iota of complaint out of me or my boyfriend, who ended up moving in to take her place when she'd moved out. A few months went by before we got an invite to come up to stay with them. I thought we might be able to all get together for Christmas, but as it happens, Mom and the new guy were off to winter in the Maldives at a place he owned and wouldn't be around until the following February. So we worked all around our respective commitments and the only time we'd all be available to get together happened to be one particular few days, the days surrounding the 31st of October, Halloween. As it turns out, Mom's new home was really out of the way. It was an absolute pain to get to. We had to get three trains as well as a taxi that cost us an arm and a leg. But honestly, when we finally got there, it was worth the journey. It was absolutely gorgeous. Seriously, like something out of a Downton Abbey. The estate, as the new guy referred to it, sat on a few hundred acres of beautiful rolling Scottish hillside and was just about the most picturesque place I'd ever laid eyes on. I'll admit that I was extremely nervous about getting to know Stephen, my mum's new husband, but I really was for trying my best to form some kind of bond with him. I knew how much it had mean to my mum, and I really mean it when I'd say I'd do absolutely anything to make her happy. That, and it was my first chance at any kind of holiday in years, so I was determined to make the most of it. However, it definitely wasn't easy. Not that he wasn't the perfect gentleman, he made every effort to make me and my boyfriend feel welcome there and made a point of showing me exactly how happy he could make my mom. He didn't try and play at being my stepdad, he wasn't overbearing, he was exactly the kind of guy we needed him to be, and for that I'll always be extremely grateful. But over the course of our first day on the estate, I began to feel more and more troubled for some reason. I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was, and my boyfriend actually suggested that maybe staying in something that looked like your stereotypical haunted house over Halloween probably wasn't helping. But I promise you, it wasn't that. I'm quite the horror movie fanatic, as well as being a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic, and I'm definitely not one to start sensing auras or any of that nonsense. But like I said, something just didn't sit right with me about that place, and... No matter how hard Stephen tried to make us feel at home, I still couldn't quite shake this oppressive feeling. 
I finally chalk it up to me being more upset about my mom getting remarried than I was willing to admit to myself. So, still willing to make the effort, I found myself wandering around the grounds of the estate, dragging my boyfriend in tow. Because being inside the old manor house just made me feel worse and worse with each passing minute, and the last thing I wanted was for my mom to assume that I had taken the hump with Stephen for whatever reason. God forbid that I was jealous or like resented the fact that he came from old money or something because I can assure you I'm not that kind of person. On that first night at the estate, me and my boyfriend took a bath together in this massive porcelain tub that sat in the ensuite guest bathroom. We were sitting there, soaking up the hot water that was infused with this super fancy molten brown bath oil stuff, engaged in some inconsequential conversation when he stopped mid-sentence and put a hand on my shoulder. He asked me what I'd done to my back. I was like, what are you talking about? As far as I knew, I hadn't done anything to my back at all. He then told me I had this massive purple bruise on my back. I reached back to feel where he was talking about and he was right. I felt this dull pain when I pressed down on the skin of my shoulder blade. There was actually this big bloody bruise there. I jumped out of the bath and walked over to this big fancy mirror to have a look at it and dear god, it was massive. I put it down to the strap of one of our bags digging into my shoulder as I was carrying it but honestly, I knew full well that there was no way it could have done anything like that. I tried not to get too freaked out but I'll be honest, I was really quiet for the rest of the night, right up until me and the boyfriend got into bed together to get some well deserved rest. But that night, I hardly slept. You see, the guest bedroom looked out over this big empty field on the estate. I had no idea at the time, but something about that big dark field was really, really bothering me, even when I couldn't see it from where I was lying. At one point, I got up during the middle of the night and just wandered over to the window, staring out into the darkness, not even sure what I was looking for. I was only able to actually get any bloody sleep once I'd worked out how to draw the big old curtains. The curtain rail must have been a hundred years old, so it took some doing. But with the help of my boyfriend, we did manage to close them, and only then could I actually get my head down. I honestly thought that I'd start feeling better the following day, but when I woke up the next morning, Halloween morning to be exact, I was in floods of tears. I didn't actually wake up on my own. It was my boyfriend that shook me awake, telling me that I was whimpering and crying in my sleep. He was really shaken up himself, telling me that I'd scared the life out of him and asking if I'd had some kind of nightmare. I couldn't remember any bad dreams at all, but I still felt grim, and in my panicked state, I told him that I thought that we should just get out of there. He tried to calm me down, telling me it was probably just the angst of seeing my mom with someone else bubbling to the surface, but I flipped on him, telling him yet again that it wasn't anything to do with that, how something was badly wrong with that house, even though I just couldn't exactly work out what it was. My boyfriend insisted that we should stay another day, just to see if things would get any easier for me, but I flat out refused telling him we needed to make up an excuse as to why we needed to leave so I wouldn't upset mom. So being the good boyfriend that he is, he manufactured some excuse that he had a family emergency back home and that I'd have to come with him for emotional support. He even said he could bear the brunt of my mom being annoyed with him and God, if ever there was a time I knew I loved him, it was then. As soon as we were in the taxi and on the way back to the train station, I felt like a bloody great weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I still felt proper weird for a day or two, but I think that was just knowing my mom was up in that house. Even if it was with Stephen, who I honestly still adore to this day, it just didn't feel right up there, and I just couldn't quite relax knowing she was there. A few weeks later, Stephen and mom are back down in London where Stephen was based as part of his job running a company. I was made up that they were out of that big old house, but Mum insisted on making plans for us to go up there as a family again at some point. It was only then that I just came out and told her no, that I hated it up there, how I really felt horribly uneasy and that, although I didn't know why, that I knew that there was something horribly wrong with that place. I told her all about the big weird bruise on my back, how I woke up crying that morning, the feeling of the big dark field, the works. 
I hadn't even finished speaking when she turned deathly pale. Then it all came out. She'd been feeling the exact same way. The whole time she was up there, she just didn't want to let on. She thought a bit of family time up there might do the trick, but it just hadn't. It hadn't fixed a bloody thing. She hadn't felt right about the place ever since she learned what had happened to Stephen's ex-wife. You see, remember I told you that Stephen had suffered a significant loss himself at one point? Well, it turns out that he too had lost a spouse, only not to some slow, painful disease like cancer. Stephen's wife had been suffering from severe postnatal depression ever since they had their third child. The family doctor had tried everything they could to help her, but nothing worked. And one day she had gone into the hunting shed around the back of the house, loaded up a shotgun, walked into a field, and blown her own head off. I had so many questions, but I remember only asking one at first. I asked her which field Stephen's wife had shot herself in. My mom looked at the carpet as she answered. The one just outside, the guest bedroom. I'm a male, 48, and this happened when I was a teenager. It was Halloween night. My mom and dad had a party to go to, so it was my job to take my little brother trick-or-treating. We went around the closest neighborhoods before we stopped at my uncle's house like we did every year. My uncle invited us inside to have a glass of apple cider, a piece of pie, and to gossip about the things that had been happening at my school. We helped pass out candy, watched a few of the classic Halloween movies, and generally had a good time catching up with my uncle and his wife. It's the usual thing that I had done since I was a kid. It was getting late and we were getting ready to leave when a shadow passed over the window. It was very unusual for someone to be lurking around our neighborhood. My uncle had already shut off the lights when we noticed the shadow. The first thought to go through my mind was the fact that someone had escaped from the state prison that was relatively close to my uncle's property. Ridiculous, I know, but my overactive imagination would take me to some insane lengths. My uncle told me to take my brother into his study, lock the door, and don't come out until he says to. I did as told. My brother and I quickly hid in the study and watched out the window for a few minutes. It seemed to linger on forever. To my utter improbable shock, a man in an orange jumpsuit crept towards the living room window as I saw from afar. I had to rub my eyes wondering if my imagination truly was going insane. Now my uncle wasn't and still isn't the type of guy that you want to mess around with. He served in the military so he kept a lot of guns in the house to protect his family. He was a bit of a nutcase. I'm not really sure what was exchanged between the lurker and my uncle but a gunshot scared my brother enough to pee himself. I unlocked the door to the study and ran outside to see exactly what had happened. My uncle was knelt down beside the guy in the orange jumpsuit. To my surprise, he was crying and profusely apologizing for firing the gun. It turns out that my cousin had decided to dress up as a jailbird last minute. He went to a friend's party and didn't want his dad to find out that he had been drinking, which was the reason why he was lurking around the house. He was trying to sneak in without alarming anyone, but he didn't know that his dad was still awake. My uncle shot his son without hesitation. He was questioned by the police and ended up getting rid of all of his guns in his house. My cousin recovered just fine with some time in the hospital and a story to tell now that we look back on and laugh at from time to time. He went on to graduate college and become a lawyer, actually protecting those who were wrongfully assaulted, so in the end, everything came full circle. I'm a male, 33 years old, and this happened the one time I decided to join in on the Halloween fun. My town is a small, tight community who watches out for everyone. Strangers don't usually come into town without someone knowing. Here's the events that really made me scared of the world. The Halloween carnival comes to town every year. It's a town favorite and personally the only thing I had been looking forward to because my parents finally agreed to let me go. I usually wasn't allowed to participate in the festivals due to my health issues while growing up. Let's be honest, 
Being the kid with health issues isn't the ideal way to grow up because no one wanted to be friends with me yet that year. I was excited to be going with the kids next door though. I suited up in the warmest clothes I could find, made sure that I had my inhaler and hurried over to the neighbor's house. The parents drove us to the festival, told us to keep an eye out for anyone we didn't know and to meet back at the entrance in a few hours. The first thing we did was gorge on cotton candy. My parents didn't let me have candy because it was bad for you, go figure. My stomach was aching by the time we walked across the carnival to the ferris wheel. I decided to sit down while the other kids did their thing. I was a little upset that I didn't ride with them because they were bragging about how fun it was. Stan wanted to go play the games they had, but Leela, Marco, and I wanted to go to the haunted house. We wasted about 15 minutes arguing before we flipped a coin and decided that the house was next. And that was a big mistake. The haunted house, the ghoulish favorite for teenagers and irresponsible adults, was the biggest event on our to-do list. Naturally, the line was about a mile long. Maybe an hour was spent waiting until we reached the entrance. The worker watching the front door warned us to turn back now or be cursed with the unnerving nightmares that can be caused. Stupid, I wish I would have listened to him though. Leela and I held hands while walking through the first hallway where a zombie jumped out at us. Nothing too scary. The next event was the ghost of a victim who wouldn't rest until she collected what was hers. I didn't get the chance to find out what that was because someone grabbed my arm and pulled me away from the crowd. I screamed as loud as I could, but it was useless with the loud noises and creepy music that was blasting in the cramped building. I thought it was a part of the show when I noticed that the exit was getting further and further away. My breathing started to get heavier. My chest felt like it was tightening and then I started crying. Something warm ran down my leg and I knew I was having a panic attack. I fumbled the pocket of my coat for my inhaler but dropped it when the person pulling me away told me to shut up. I'm not really sure what happened after that because I woke up to the paramedics kneeling beside me holding a mask over my face. I could finally breathe. The man that had pulled me away from Stan, Leela, and Marco was a stranger that had been hiding in the building that they used for the haunted house weeks before the carnival got there. My parents were beyond angry that I had nearly been kidnapped in a crowded place that should have been safe, but the police had failed to have enough patrol around the area. It turns out that Stan had been the first person to realize I wasn't holding on to Leela anymore. He panicked and grabbed the other two so they could get help. Their parents found a police officer and they stormed through the haunted house where they found the man dragging me down an unused corridor. I'm very lucky to have been such a fearful wimp because the other kids wouldn't have even noticed that I was gone if it weren't for them not being able to hear my girlish screams. I guess that you really don't know what kind of people can be lurking around your town, no matter how small it may be. You never really know what could happen in the most crowded of places. I was almost kidnapped in a haunted house and it turns out that I wasn't the first person he had tried to get. He had been roaming the states for years and now he's locked away in prison somewhere while I live in the mountains far from society and far from the criminals that used to be harmless. Don't trust anyone that says a crowded place is the safest. They're just not seeing the bigger picture. I'm a female, 42, and this is why I can't trust the holiday. My mom and dad adopted me when I was three months old because my birth parents couldn't afford to have a child at the time, which is why they gave me the best shot at a good life. My adoptive parents have been the best parents that I could have asked for. They have done everything for me and still continue to be my support system when things go wrong. I'm grateful for them and I'm glad that they weren't harmed on that night. Halloween was a good time of year for me. I got to spend it with my friends and family. I was able to decorate the house and watch all of the kids in the neighborhood get a good scare from our house. I generally enjoyed being able to sip on apple cider while telling spooky stories to the neighbor's two kids. They were good kids that I babysat when I was home from college. I was home for the weekend so I spent as much time with my parents as I could before I had to go back and finish out the semester. My mom had to make a last minute shopping trip so I opted to go with her. 
We had been walking down the street for about 45 minutes before I even noticed that people passing by were giving us questionable looks. That continued for another few minutes before I leaned close to my mom. What are they looking at? I asked my mom. They're staring at you, she whispered. Why though? I don't know any of them. I frowned. Don't think too much of it, honey. They probably just confused you for someone else. Uh, probably. I couldn't stop thinking about the weird looks that those people had given me. I was just walking through town with my mom before we had to pass candy out. We grabbed lunch, finished our last minute shopping, and headed home to get ready for the night to begin. The freaking sight that I went home to was bizarre. My dad had been watching the news and saw a picture of me. Apparently I had robbed a bank and shot two people who were in critical condition earlier that week. The thing that baffled me the most was the fact that I'd never done anything illegal in my entire life. The fact that I was wanted for a crime that I didn't commit sent my mom into high alert. She started talking about the what-ifs of the situation, and my dad seemed to know what she was talking about. The police showed up at my house, arrested me, and brought me in to ask me questions about the robbings and shootings earlier that week. They did release me, but they told me not to leave town because they'd be back if they had any more questions. My family was livid. The entire thing made me sick to my stomach. I laid down in my room for a while before waking up to hear someone screaming downstairs. I hurried down the staircase to see a girl who looked like me screaming at my parents. She was demanding to know why they didn't take her too. Turns out that I was an identical twin. My parents adopted me after another family had adopted her. I got the better end of the adoption because my parents had money, were educated, and had good careers whereas her parents were drug dealers and she'd been abused her entire life. She dropped out of high school, skipped college and became a stripper at some club three cities over. Her parents had told her about me when she was 21. It took her a few years to finally track me down and she stalked me for months after finding me. This girl was committing crimes in my town, and people thought it was me, all because I didn't know that I had a twin. My twin was on something, some sort of drug. She was angry and finally had enough of my mom begging for her to just leave us alone that she shot her right in my mom's leg. She ran away from the house. I called for help, and my mom was taken to the hospital. The police later arrested my sister for attempting to rob a convenience store a few blocks from my house, and she was charged for the crime she committed and sentenced with 30 years in prison. She writes me occasionally. She threatens my parents and myself because she still can't let go of the fact that I grew up with a better life. At times, I'm still baffled at the fact that she exists at all. It truly was like a horror movie. I feel bad for her, but it's not something that could have been prevented. It happens, and Halloween isn't my holiday anymore. All because of my insane twin. I was eight at the time that this occurred. I'm 16 now, female, and an introvert because the memory of that night is still fresh in my mind. I'm afraid it will be there forever. Here's a little backstory which is important to this story. The horror-obsessed neighbor that I had when I was a kid had to be the only person who truly loved Halloween. It was Miss Tompkins, absolute greatest joy in life, being able to decorate. This year, she went all out on decorating for it. The house was covered in spooky delights, tasty treats were left on the doorstep, and her famous yet terrifying ghouls were placed in coffins throughout the yard. Her house was the last stop on every kid's list simply because it was the one place that could make you scared for your life. I hadn't felt good for the week prior to Halloween, so I laid in bed sick that day. I peered out the window a few times throughout the day, but hadn't seen Miss Tompkins doing the finishing touches to her masterpiece, which was weird. She should have been outside all day, taking pride in what she had created, but she wasn't. No one had seen her since the night before, and my mom was starting to get nervous since they were friends. My older brother begged me to go trick-or-treating with him. I considered lying about feeling better just to get candy, but my dad wasn't having it. He told me that I could help pass out candy. I had soup for dinner, cold medicine, and dressed up warmly with hot chocolate. 
My dad and I sat on the steps of the front porch, passing out candy to the other kids. They'd dance or tell us a silly joke for the candy and run down the street. Everyone avoided Miss Tompkins' house because her porch light wasn't on. She wasn't looking out the windows like she normally does, and she wasn't answering my mom's calls. A lot of the neighbors knocked on her door. She never answered, so they shrugged it off as her having the flu like much of the neighborhood did, and everyone went home. My dad and I waited on the porch until about 10.30 that night. We decided to call it quits when the last of the stragglers went home, and Miss Tompkins never shot off the fireworks like she did every year before. My brother and I stayed up a little later than usual to sort through the candy he had gotten. My parents went to sleep and soon after that so did I. I woke up the next morning to an empty house. My parents were outside talking to the other neighbors about what went on the night before. I guess my mom had a bad feeling the day before. She tossed and turned all night so she decided to check and call the police. A few officers checked the area, knocked on the front door but got no answers so they called it the night as well. A patrol car had been sent earlier the next morning. He thought the coffin sitting in Tompkins' yard was cool. He walked up to the nearest coffin to admire the hard work that had been put into the decorating. I guess he touched the fake blood around the corpse's neck, and it wasn't corn syrup. Miss Tompkins' ex-boyfriend had been jealous of her new relationship. He had been harassing her for weeks about getting back together, but she refused. She told him that she was doing well since they had broken up and he didn't take that so well. He waited until early Halloween morning to break into her house, cut her throat while she was sleeping, and he put makeup on her face. He dragged her out of the house and stuffed her body in the coffin before leaving town, and to my knowledge he hadn't been caught and her death was never justified. Miss Tompkins was a good woman that just wanted out of an abusive relationship I guess she finally got what she wanted, but not the way that she had hoped. Because of how elegant her yard was decorated, it took an entire day to find her. Please be careful what or who you let into your life, or you might just end up like Miss Tompkins, just a ghoulish decoration on display for the entire town to see. I'm 18, female, and still scared about what could have happened last year. For the sake of privacy, I'll call my girlfriend Lisa. Lisa was a beautiful, smart girl with platinum blonde hair and blue eyes that can make anyone crave her attention. I hadn't been dating Lisa very long, maybe five months if that. Our relationship may not have lasted long, but I didn't have any hard feelings after the traumatic event we experienced. My girlfriend and I decided to go out with a bang for our final Halloween as youths by trick-or-treating as sirens, you know, the mythical Greek creature that lures men to their death with a special song. The costumes were on the slightly exposed side, if you know what I mean. We wore short dresses with ripped stockings and high heels which drew more attention than we had hoped. We canvassed the neighborhood, which visited Mrs. Watson's house, Dr. Harrison's house, the elderly couple whose name I forgot, and the weird guy at the end of the road. We went to a party, had a few shots of tequila, and we went to a friend's house to smoke and eventually made our way back to my house with a bag full of candy. My mom questioned us about our night on the town. I assumed that she could tell we were a little out of it, but we engaged in a friendly conversation while sorting through our scrumptious-looking treats. Being a bit clumsy on top of all that was typical for Lisa, She dropped a handful of candy which made my mom more suspicious and then my dogs Poncho and Lilo gobbled up as much as they could. We laughed about two chihuahuas licking their lips after eating a lot of caramel candies. It didn't take long for the dogs to start acting weird. They began to foam at the mouth and violently convulsing. It looked like something straight out of the exorcist. My mom frantically scooped up Lilo and Poncho. I called the police and tried my best to calm my scared girlfriend down. The police confiscated the candy. The vet sadly declared that our dogs had passed away before they arrived. Lisa and I fell asleep and woke up the next morning to the officer from the night before. The weird guy at the end of the road was arrested because he was stupid enough to touch the candy without gloves. Apparently he poisoned the candy with cyanide because... The trashy lesbians are an abomination to the world and deserve whatever was coming to them. 
he was charged and sent to prison. Lisa broke up with me a few days after the incident and checked into an institution because now she suffered from PTSD. I'm sad that my dogs passed away, but I'm grateful that neither Lisa or anyone else in my family had eaten the candy. Who knows what could have happened. I urge you to be careful when you take your little ones or anyone else out trick-or-treating. Please check the treats that you receive carefully and throw out anything that looks like it had been messed with. It's for your own safety. I'm a female, 29, and this killed my Halloween vibe. My mentally ill neighbor Ed was on medication the entire time I lived next to him. He was schizophrenic, which means that he hears and possibly sees things that aren't real. He used to freak out and have a fit about what the voices were telling him to do. His parents finally decided to get him help after he was arrested for assaulting one of his co-workers. Ed stopped hallucinating and hearing the voices after he started taking medicine, and he was better, or so I thought. You could actually hold a decent conversation with him for more than two minutes. He was a nice, kind man when he wasn't crazy. The neighbors had actually stopped being afraid to let their kids play outside. I could finally get a good night's sleep without hearing Ed's angry voice screaming for people to leave him alone, and I could finally have my boyfriend back. My parents would have had a heart attack if they knew that I had secretly dated Ed. Like I said, he was a good man while on the medicine and I couldn't help but love him. Mr. and Mrs. Cole had to put up with Ed's mental condition for a long time before they finally hit their breaking point. They sent him to a mental institution where the doctors could treat his condition electroshock therapy and whatever they wanted to call it. I couldn't do anything to stop his parents from sending him back despite him begging me to help. I felt terrible and lost without him around because I couldn't really get inspired to decorate for Halloween when Ed wasn't there to tell me which decorations should be placed where. Ed was always interested in the legend behind Halloween so I guess you could say that he thoroughly enjoyed the horrific side to things. It was difficult to fall asleep without hearing him shuffling around in his room through my open bedroom window. I would tell you the conversation that I had with Ed on Halloween morning, but I don't think it would be very appropriate due to the nature of it. The evening of Halloween was long, boring, and uneventful. My parents were at a party which left me and my best friend home alone to pass out the candy. My dad wanted me to lock the doors and call the police if Ed were to show up. Apparently he was released from the institution earlier that afternoon and left home shortly after he had gotten there. He didn't talk to me before leaving so I was worried about where he could have went. My idiot self didn't bother to check the spot where we'd met. That was really stupid on my part. My friend and I were watching a horror movie, the volume blasting causing us to not hear anything happening around the house or outside. I paused the movie for a bathroom break when we heard screaming outside. I ran to the front door to see what was wrong. Ed was hanging from the balcony of his house. The doctor at the mental institution had been bribed by Ed's dad to do whatever was necessary to fix his son. He wanted the little boy that wasn't crazy back so the doctor did just that. He terrorized Ed the entire time he was at the institution which is the reason why Ed had stopped taking his medication in the first place. My boyfriend was so desperate to escape the horrible pain of his mind that he took his own life. I never got to say goodbye to Ed, but I have never forgotten him. If you're struggling or someone you know is struggling with any type of disorder like Ed's, please, please, please listen to what they're telling you even if it sounds insane. This was my horrific Halloween nightmare. I'm a male, 17, and this happened last year. Halloween was never my thing, I just didn't care about the holiday. I had planned on staying home, playing my video games and eating pizza, but my friend somehow convinced me to go to a party at this kid's house and I knew the kid from school, I'd seen him around a few times. I was told that there was going to be a bunch of kids from my school there so I figured, what the heck. I can have free drinks, snacks, I can go hang out with friends and get away from my dad scaring little kids for a few hours. Totally worth skipping my normal tradition. 
My dad begged me to stay home and help him pass out the candy, but I just wasn't feeling it. I told him that I'd be home before midnight. He was nice enough, and my friend Jay pulled up, and I didn't waste any time jumping into the car with him. My dad probably wasn't happy about me riding with Jay since he'd had more speeding tickets than anyone I knew. Jay parked a few blocks away from the party. We walked up the sidewalk, joking about how we would get to see a fight and was happy to see our other friends waiting for us. I already had a bad feeling about the party. We weren't at the party very long before the bad feeling got worse. The party was going just as I had anticipated it would. However, who I hadn't expected to see, let's call her Marsha, was there. Marsha and I dated for two years before she found out that I was cheating on her the entire time. Things didn't end well between us and before too long she had a new boyfriend, we'll call him Dave. Dave was an idiot. He bossed Marsha around, threatened any guy who talked to her and had seen the inside of a jail cell one too many times. I was going to say something to Dave. I had finally had enough of his crap but my friends told me to ignore them. Marsha wasn't worth getting into trouble over so I left it at that and joined the crowd outside by the pool. I threw back quite a few shots of whiskey before challenging myself to win at beer pong. I kicked major butt at that. My friend tapped me on the shoulder and pointed to Marsha. Of course, she had to be walking towards me. I glared at her until she stopped in front of me. I didn't expect to see you here, I growled. Yeah, she chuckled. I wasn't going to come here, but Dave insisted on seeing the cheating idiot. <laughs> well, here I am. I wouldn't get drunk if I were you. Never know what's going to happen. She smiled. What? I thought to myself, while Marsha walked back over to her boyfriend. Why would she say something like that? I mean, I knew that she could hold a grudge, but it felt more like a threat to me. I kind of shook the thought away from my mind and stuck close to my friends. We were talking about who would likely graduate high school and become a criminal. Just the usual things teenagers like to think about, I guess. I snacked on several things nearby to try and sober up. I generally was all enjoying the company of my classmates before some jerk smacked my drink out of my hand. I turned around to see Dave standing behind me. He was livid. His cheeks were beet red and his jaw was clenched. That evil look in his eye brought out the inner a-hole in me. We exchanged some not nice words and I was the idiot who threw the first punch. Brawling hadn't ever been my strong suit. Naturally, the criminal destroyed me. I dumped my beer on Dave and he pulled a rather large hunting knife. I nearly crapped myself when I saw that thing. I knew Dave was dangerous, but I never thought that he'd bring a knife to a party. I felt like I was done. I tried to run away as quickly as possible, but I remember the entire world spinning. I was seeing spots and I was completely out of my mind. It's hard to run when you can barely form a thought. Dave grabbed hold of my shirt and pushed me to the ground. I will spare you the gruesome details. Needless to say, I now have a prosthetic hand and one incredibly sweet scar from my temple to my jaw. Dave, I will forever regret, was never locked up because he had an incredibly good lawyer and I spent a long time in the hospital recovering with incredible pain medication but I still hate Halloween. I hate Halloween, and I'm basically a decoration year-round, so no, I don't think that I'll think of Halloween the same. Halloween Revenge. It's basically the best way to never get caught because there are a lot of other criminals roaming the streets on that night. Each year around Halloween, my family gets together to tell the scariest stories we can find. Each member is responsible for one true story. The only rules are that the story must be fact and that it can't have ever been told before. With this year's storytelling get together growing ever closer, I was finding it especially hard discovering a story. Nearing my wit's end, I took a trip to the local library in search of a spine tingling gem from our misty past. Hours were spent in search of the perfect story until my attention was drawn to a small and unassuming headline on the corner of one page. It read, Daniel's Mansion Fire Cause Unknown. 
Continuing to read through the article only caused more questions. Reaching the bottom of a four-hour-long rabbit hole uncovered a shocking story of revenge that convinced me I'd found the story I'd been looking for. About a month from now, I will be sitting in my parents' living room, sharing with them the tale I've discovered. As I thought forward to this night, I figured I'd share this little-known story with others, hoping to add an air of creepiness to their holidays too. So if you're ready, turn out the lights, kick back, and enjoy the story I've chosen to call A Trial by Fire. The time is 1933 and our setting is in rural Kansas. A record-breaking heat wave and drought have led to crippling crop failures across the Great Plains. Signs of the so-called black blizzards, mile-wide dust storms comprised of topsoil were beginning to be observed. Because of this series of catastrophic environmental events, paired with a national economic depression, many families were losing their farms to locally owned banks. These banks, or more so their owners, were often seen as opportunistic vampires taking advantage of the farmers' increasingly bad luck, sucking them dry of what little they did have. In our town, the local boogeyman bank owner was named Saul Daniels, and although he was not as predatory as many bankers, he was despised nonetheless. Not as much for his habit of foreclosure and eviction of those farmers too far in arrears, but more for his agonizing inability to never deny his son anything he wished. Abe Daniels was the textbook example of a spoiled child and his constant worsening behavior because of this saw him grow from an annoying, whining little brat into a universally hated adult. He never let an opportunity to take what he wanted pass by. Any merchant in town doing business with his family's bank would ever be safe from Abe's predatory behavior. He would often brazenly walk right into a business owner's store and take what he wanted off the shelf. No one who owed the Daniels Bank, no matter the amount, would dare stop him from fear of losing the tiny bit of whatever they had managed to hold on to. Abe's desires were not limited to mere objects on the shelf. His childish mind would sometimes focus on an unlucky woman. As you would expect, they were also nothing more than objects to him. He made it clear to every girl he chose that she was helpless against his desires. The foolish few who fought his attention found themselves homeless overnight. Probably the worst example of his malevolent acts on females was that of Miss Natalie O'Leary. Miss O'Leary was a young school teacher. She had moved into the area only the year before and was soon to be marrying a young man named Martin Clark. By all accounts, the couple were very much in love. One Sunday morning, Miss O'Leary caught the attention of Abe outside of her church, and at that second, her fate would be sealed. He finally caught up with her a few mornings later at the Thompson family restaurant as she ate her breakfast. Being very familiar with Abe and his mistreatment of other women, she attempted to pay her check and leave before he could approach her. She wasn't quick enough, however, and Abe was on to her. He accosted her with a number of unseemly comments and propositions far too crude for me to repeat here. Miss O'Leary retained her ladylike demeanor as long as she could, until Abe slapped and grabbed her backside right in front of everyone. This was when she lost her temper and returned the disrespect by slapping him across his face. It was clear that he wasn't prepared for such a reaction. No one had ever dared to put their hands on him. The shock and rage radiated from him almost as brightly as the handprint on his cheek. Abe must have been unsure of how to deal with the situation and stormed out of the restaurant without a word. Everyone there that morning did their best to warn Miss O'Leary of the danger she was in, but she didn't take their warning seriously. No man or woman could strike Abe Daniels in front of witnesses and not expect severe repercussions. Severe repercussions were exactly what she would receive. Miss O'Leary's body was discovered five days later in an irrigation ditch just outside of town. She had been struck about the head at least 15 times. Various bones throughout her body had been broken so badly that the pathologist, Don Atkins, said that they were like those he'd seen in head-on auto collisions. The worst was perhaps that she had clear signs of being violently ravaged some time soon before her death. This crime shocked the entire county and surrounding counties and was surely the worst ever to occur up to that time. 
Miss O'Leary had been loved and respected by most who knew her and had no known enemies. Every citizen was greatly angered by her death and demanded the killer be brought to justice swiftly. The sheriff's initial suspect was Martin, her fiancé, despite his guilt being doubted by most. He had been seen arguing with Miss O'Leary after church that Sunday, but this turned out to be a misidentification of another couple by a nearly blind woman. Although he was doing his best to put this on Mr. Clark, he was soon forced to acknowledge to the press that he had no evidence he had committed it. It was no secret around town that Abe had assaulted Miss O'Leary earlier in the week and she had struck him in front of at least ten witnesses. He had to have been the only enemy she had had as far as anyone knew of. This made him the prime suspect in most folks' minds. It took massive pressure from severe powerful members of the town before the sheriff would bring Abe in for questioning, and even then, he was quickly released with no charges. The sheriff's rapid exoneration of Abe infuriated those who were positive of his guilt. It didn't take long for the rumors to begin making the rounds, claiming to know the actual reason of Abe's release. An unnamed gentleman at the bank provided information that claimed a veiled threat was made to the sheriff regarding the deed to his parents' farm. They were said to be several months behind in their payments to the bank, and this gentleman claimed Saul had threatened to foreclose on them if any charges were brought up on Abe. It was common knowledge that the Daniels Bank owned the deeds to the majority of the land in town and the county surrounding it. Whether Saul had made such a threat could never be proven, but most who had heard it had little doubt it was. After the release of Abe Daniels, the case of Miss O'Leary went dormant and remains formally unsolved to this day. Even though most were confident of Abe's guilt, without any real evidence or support of law enforcement, there was nothing they could do. Therefore, they were forced to bite the bullet and move on with their lives, praying one day a big break would come along and justice would be done. There was no doubt especially after reading all of the myriad number of awful things the Daniels men did, some by Abe and some by Saul, that this family were the prime example of ultimate power and the blatant abuse of this power. However, there is one aspect of this story that we cannot leave out, and that is the widespread racism aimed at the family. Kansas has a long history of supporting minorities that goes back at least to the 1850s when bloody battles would break out between the anti-slavery elements in the state and the pro-slavery ones in the surrounding state of Missouri. These skirmishes would continue all the way until the ending of the Civil War in 1865. Even in a usually open-minded and inclusive area, the distrust felt toward the Jewish family was widespread. There was a time in which this was not true. In the early 1890s when Saul Daniels first arrived in the area, he was welcomed with open arms. The county lacked any type of banking system and Daniel's arrival was seen by many as a gift from God. While not being wealthy himself, he received the backing of several of the county's wealthier landowners. By 1907, the Daniel's Farmers and Cattlemen Bank owned half of the town's properties and surrounding farms. This was around the time attitudes towards Saul and the rest of the family began to turn sour. Many of the men that had supported Saul in his early years had lost their fortunes in subsequent financial panics, but he had continued to invest his money wisely and grow into a man they could only have dreamed of once being. A few of these men had approached Saul for loans but found themselves being rebuked by him for being foolish with their investments. Those men believed they were owed the money for helping him in his time of greatest need. This was likely the root of the bad feeling felt towards them and reinforced the stereotype many of them had of the greedy Jew in their minds. In the following decades, the rising anti-Semitism in Europe was brought to the New World with the immigrants coming west. A prevailing ignorance of the people and their religious practices only served to drive the two groups further apart. Stories of practices like child sacrifice, no matter how ridiculous, were being spread freely throughout the community. Saul and his spoiled son were not the only Daniel's family members to suffer from this spreading prejudice. The matriarch of the family, Rebecca, despite being relatively liked in town, was often treated like a second-class citizen. This treatment ranged from being passed over in favor of other shoppers in the Baxter Mercantile to children's blatant name-calling in the street. 
Rebecca, being a meek yet kind little woman, took all this abuse in stride. Saul was certainly made aware of the way his beloved wife was being treated. This may have been the prime motivation behind the coldness he showed toward them. This bitterness grew worse in 1918 when Rebecca succumbed to the Spanish flu and his only son, Abraham, also did as well. It was said at the time that the only thing Saul Daniels loved more than money was his family. Most think Rebecca was the only moderating influence on Saul. So, her loss removed any amount of kindness he may have still felt for his neighbors. The boom that followed the Great War continued Saul on his trajectory to boundless wealth. As you can imagine, his ever-expanding net worth made him more and more hated by his neighbors. This period of amazing prosperity just happened to coincide with Abe's ascendance into young manhood. Rebecca's moderating influence could have possibly worked to rein in his more childish impulses, but without her around, Abe's near death made Saul virtually unable to deny him anything, regardless of the cost to himself or others. Not only did he have his own staple of racehorses and automobiles, but he would often purchase them for his group of hangers-on, only to take them away and destroy them right in front of the person if they angered him in any way. He was said to have bought seven cars in one year, only to go on and crash them soon after. Following his clearance in the death of Miss Natalie O'Leary, Abe left for an extended vacation to Europe. This should have been a period of relief for the town's inhabitants, but the vile actions of Saul would force the town to make a choice many never believed themselves capable of. Mrs. Mabel Reed was an elderly lady living on the 150-acre farm her husband had purchased from the Daniels Bank in 1927. Less than two years later, he was thrown from a horse and killed, leaving Mrs. Reed, now a widow, three months for their son Grant to find work. In the deepest depths of the Great Depression, work anywhere was exceedingly rare. Hearing there were jobs aplenty in California, Grant hopped a train heading west. In his absence, Mrs. Reed did her best to make what was left stretch until Grant had found work. At the four and a half month mark, every cent was spent and she had yet to hear anything from her son. She survived on store credit and the kindness of her fellow farmers. In a place where no one was getting by on farming, this was an especially generous act. After six months without a single letter from Grant, everyone but Mrs. Reed had lost hope. Things for her were looking very bleak. She was three months behind on her payments, and although this wasn't that long compared to many of those around her, she knew Saul could pounce on her at any second. The pounce came a mere week later. To this day, no one is sure what caused Saul to choose her for foreclosure. One theory was that he was missing his son, but the facts are none of us know his true motivations that day. He sent the sheriff out the morning of October 13th to serve her with a notice of foreclosure and assist her in the removal of her personal effects. Even after repeated requests from the sheriff to give her more time, Saul demanded he do the task quickly and quietly as possible. Unfortunately for Saul, knowledge of the foreclosure would quickly spread after Mrs. Reed's death from a heart attack while being served the notice. To his relief, the townsfolk didn't blame the sheriff for Mrs. Reed's death. They knew of the power Saul wielded over him. He was the man truly at fault for this. In almost every shred of misery that had happened the past thirty years could be traced back to him or his disgusting son. As if things weren't already awful, Grant Reed showed up on the morning train just two days later. With him was more than enough money to pay off the remainder of the deed. Upon being told of his mother's death and the circumstances surrounding it, he stepped silently back onto the train and returned west, permanently disappearing into history. The downfall of the Daniels family empire can probably be pinned down to this moment. The arrival of Grant Reed only two days too late was the last straw for most of the citizenry. A few people even proposed a theory that Saul had been alerted of his imminent arrival and foreclosed out of plain spite. Nothing shows this to be true, but it wouldn't be out of character for Saul Daniels or his son. Within hours of his return home, Abe was back to his usual behavior. At the time of Miss O'Leary's tragic death, he had been in an odd relationship with Miss Barbara Roberts, 
a daughter of Gerald Roberts, a member of the city council and owner of Roberts Men's Fine Clothing. Miss Roberts and her father became estranged soon after she and Abe began their counting of one another. Folks suggested that it was because she continued to see Abe after he had done all those things to her on their first date. Regardless of the true reason, just being believed to have assaulted the daughter of a well-respected member of the community, and a well-loved one at that, was enough to set his ultimate punishment in motion. With Halloween soon to arrive, the denizens of the town began to prepare for the worst. The holiday and the earlier parts of the 20th century were far different than it would turn out to be in the century's waning years. What had been more of an adult-oriented occasion had begun its drastic switch towards a more child-centered celebration. Although the tradition of trick-or-treating had already began for the younger ones, another much more juvenile pattern of behavior was common among the older children. In this period, the Night of All Hallows' Eve had the more popular name of Mischief Night, and the night very often lived up to this name. Vandalism was the norm in much of the country and proved to be very costly to the communities in which it occurred. What was once seen as boys will be boys started to be viewed in a more serious light. It took the coming of a war and a concerted effort to divert the attention of the destructive to less expensive hobbies. To this day, groups of energetic boys still roam neighborhoods on Halloween, cruising for things to smash, but compared to these same areas in the 1930s, this behavior has all but ceased to be a real concern. The week leading up to the 31st was consumed by multiple private meetings. These meetings were held in the homes of the few remaining wealthy and powerful people that weren't named Daniels. At the time, anyone not involved in them was left with the assumption that they were related to the yearly celebrations of Halloween, specifically the fall festival and Halloween parade held each year around this time. No one on the inside attempted to check this belief, and because of this, what was to occur on the night of Halloween was able to be pulled off without the targets getting any prior warning. Just to remove any chance of rumor, a city meeting was held at the school to announce the town's plans for the holidays. This was open to the public. A large part of the meeting covered the city's father's plans to decrease the expected rash of vandalism that coming Tuesday. That Friday, the fall festival parade was held downtown, and the night everybody had been preparing for and dreading finally arrived on Tuesday. While families held parties and opened their homes to the throngs of little trick-or-treaters, hordes of teenage boys swarmed about the town, toilet-papering trees, and smashing every jack-o'-lantern they came across. Later that night, as they slept, the fire at the Daniels' massive home on the outskirts of town began to blaze. No matter how much water the firemen dumped on it, it deemed they had arrived too late to save the home. They'd also arrived too late to save the two Daniels men, Saul and Abe. It had been one of their servants, Rose Blackmore, who had called out the fire department, but from what was discovered after, neither of the men made it out of the house alive. Also, Abe had managed to make it to the front door. He succumbed to smoke before he could escape the flames. As for Saul, he never made it out of his room. It didn't take long before questions began to arise as to the cause of the fire. Firemen had discovered the remnants of two or three jack-o'-lanterns that had been smashed on the front porch. However, it was common knowledge that Daniels did not celebrate the holiday and had never decorated their home for any holiday, even back before the death of Rebecca. Within two days of the start of the investigation, an unnamed firefighter came forward and said that when he'd first arrived, he had noticed a chain on the front doors. But when he had come back with the fire chief to show him, the chain was gone. The chief laughed this off as delusions from the heat and told the firefighter to shut up and get back to work. Later, when he discovered a similar looking length of chain under the bushes, his suspicions were reinforced. This piece of information intrigued the sheriff as he hadn't come across any chain during the course of his investigation. Desperate for any lead, the sheriff brought every man present that night in for questioning, but no one would admit to seeing anything out of the ordinary. Weeks passed with no clues, so the cause of the fire was ruled as an accident due to criminal mischief. Although no one had seen any kids in the area, not to mention with pumpkins, it was the closest to a resolution he could find. 
It was obvious nobody was going to ruin some kid's life over a stupid accident. Besides, no tears were going to be shed over the loss of that despicable family. The sheriff already had his hands full with cattle thefts and poaching. He wasn't going to be able to waste any more time on a dead-end case. So he packed up the file and moved on. As the years passed and people came and went, an occasional story about that night would drift into his office. Some of the things were just too outlandish to give any credence to, but a few matched things he'd heard before had been suspicious about then. An anonymous letter arrived in his office alleged to be from someone who'd heard the truth of the fire from someone involved in it, but without any names, he was right where he'd started. The first real break arrived in 1938. He'd been summoned to the sick bed of Ellis Norton. He claimed to have something important to get off his chest before he met his maker. The story Sheriff James heard that night would only create more questions than he had before. Ellis claimed that after the death of Mabel Reed and the rumors of Barbara Roberts' assault, folks had had enough. They began meeting in small groups gradually bringing someone else into the conspiracy. No actual plan was created until the Sunday evening before Halloween. After services that night, everyone decided on what action they would take and when. The 31st had seemed the perfect time to send those two evil SOBs back to hell where they came from. Sometime after midnight on the 31st, everyone gathered downtown and took the short walk to the Daniels place. To ensure that they would be unable to flee the house when the fire started, any and every door and window was rendered unusable. Norton didn't indicate how exactly this was all done, but did mention that both doors had been chained shut. When they were confident Saul and Abe were trapped, a large amount of kerosene was poured all over the porch and several jack-o'-lanterns were lit and thrown onto the kerosene. Once the blaze had fully taken hold, Rose Blackmore was phoned anonymously and told to call the fire department. Mrs. Blackmore had made no mention of this phone call back in 1933, but may have been in league with the others in protecting them. Since she had passed in 1936, the sheriff couldn't ask her. Ellis also recounted hearing the screams of Abe Daniels as he burned alive. The sheriff's hopes were soon to be dashed when he came to the question everyone wanted to know. Who was involved? This answer Ellis could not provide. He had sworn on his soul that he would never say, and this was an oath he was willing to honor to the grave. The only thing he would say was that it was everyone and no one at the same time. When the sheriff begged himself to explain, he simply said there wasn't a single person who was not there that night and that everyone was involved. These words ended up being Ellis Norton's last. Later that night he passed away in his sleep, leaving the sheriff even more confused than he had been that night five years ago. Even though he finally knew what happened that Halloween, he was no closer to an arrest. There was no way he could arrest the entire town, and they knew it. From all that he had learned over the years, it looked like everyone from the Daniels made to most of the fire department played some part in the murder. He would go on to let it be known around the town that he was fully aware of what had occurred. Not even he knew why he had did this. Could have been in a vain attempt to scare someone into talking, but no matter the reason, he would retire never having the answer to the questions that mattered. Supposedly, even on his deathbed, it was said that case was on his mind. One particular sensational story claims his last words were, Please, just one name. Whether this actually happened or had anything to do with the Daniels murders, we'll never know. One thing is certain, however, on a Halloween night in 1933, an entire town took it upon themselves to dole out the justice they had been deprived of for so long and did it in an especially brutal way. The fact they did this to one of the most powerful families in the entire state of Kansas and nobody cared enough to punish them for it just goes to show you how truly terrifying these two men must have really been. I was recently sitting in Starbucks fooling around on my laptop 
and overheard a group of students discussing what scared them and why. Hearing this caused me to try and think back to the first time in my life I was truly scared. I guess I'm getting old because it took me a few minutes to think of it, but once I did, I figured I'd better write it down so I'd never forget again. Just to prove to myself I hadn't just undergone one of the most useless exercises of my life, it seemed like a good idea to send you a copy so you could share it with other people. I'm not completely sure what my age was, maybe as young as 8 but more likely closer to 10, I had been foaming at the mouth waiting for Halloween to arrive. It had been my favorite holiday for as long as I can remember. I would known who I was going to dress up as after I saw the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire at the theater. My parents took me to Walmart as soon as they put out the costumes. It wasn't the best and looked a bit stupid on my fat little body, but I wore it with pride. My friends and I sat at lunch every day excitedly discussing what houses we were going to and the candy we were hoping to get. Even though trick-or-treating door-to-door was already falling out of favor, mainly due to the fault of the media repeating nonsense stories of poisoned and razor-blade-filled candy, in my small town, parents were more than happy to see their kids getting out of the house and away from their gaming consoles. Even then, the younger ones still had to have their mothers chaperone them around the neighborhood and make sure no boogeyman grabbed them, or at least that's what we thought then. Since I was going out with my older brother, my folks weren't worried about us. When we got out of school that afternoon, I ran the two blocks home and began getting my stuff ready for later. After dinner, my brother and I jumped into our costumes and lined up in the living room so our mom could take some pictures. Every second I was stuck in my house was torture. When she finally let us go, it was already beginning to get dark. I ran to the school playground to meet my friends and my brother split off for me to catch up with his. Happy to be free from the eyes of our parents for a while, we went from house to house holding out our bags and occasionally making smart aleck comments to the people whose candy we didn't approve of. Once or twice we had a clash with an adult because of her behavior, but... Being anonymous under our disguises, we were emboldened to mouth off to them and run away. Moving forward was important because we had school in the morning, so most of us had to be home by nine. Not to mention we still had to let our parents inspect our candy before we could eat any. Of course, we ate some anyway, but we knew the faster we moved, the more houses we could hit, so we did. As we began to circle around the house on the opposite side of the street... We were passing an empty plot of land about the size of two lots. A building company had just recently broken ground and several tall hills of sand were located throughout the cul-de-sac. For some reason, I happened to glance over at the empty land and noticed a tall man dressed in black standing behind one of the sand hills. He didn't move at all and at first I thought he was some kind of decoration. But when I looked away to get my friend's attention and looked back, he was gone. When my friends didn't see him, they started making fun of me, but I knew what I'd seen. I tried to act like his disappearance didn't bother me, but I was already shaken up. I did my best to forget and continued my nocturnal assault on Candy. We moved pretty swiftly going from house to house, but once again as we approached the middle of the block, the dark, scary figure came back into my view. I was relieved to hear my friends acknowledge his existence this time. He remained stock still as he watched from the backyard of the house directly across the street. Not a one of us moved and we continued to silently stare at each other. This battle of fear went on for over a minute before he slowly began walking towards us. We hightailed it out of there before he completed his first step. I remember looking back at one point and not seeing him behind us but I wasn't stopping until I couldn't run anymore. We all hit the wall around the same time. Coincidentally, we were almost back right where we'd started that night. Bent over with my hands on my upper legs, I struggled for every bit of air I could get. Even though we were still very afraid, we joked with each other, laughing probably in relief. Once I was able to finally breathe somewhat normally, I stood upright. If I recollect correctly, I was making a joke about one of the other guys, probably Steve, he was a common target for our humor and I happened to look across the street to the playground. I was mid-sentence when I noticed the shape of a person standing just out of the glare of a street light. I couldn't be sure if it was our stalker up until I stepped over a few inches so I could see without the chain-link fence blocking their upper body. 
As I moved to get a clearer look, my friends watched me closer, afraid to breathe until I passed judgment on what I was seeing. The person didn't move this entire time. This is until I got into a position to get an unobstructed view. The moment we got a clear eye-to-eye view of one another, the man stepped into the direct glow of the lamp allowing me to see him fully. All I could say was run. Unfortunately, this time we split off in different directions, likely toward each of our homes. At least, that's where I was headed. Although I was moving as fast as my fat little body could carry me, some unknown feeling made me look back to see where the man in black currently was. I imagine each one of us was convinced he was hot on our tails, but I saw him turn nonchalantly and begin walking in the direction I had seen Steve and Brian run in. They must have seen him behind them because... I heard Steve in the distance let out a scream and yell, Oh, dude, run! A few seconds later, I'd made it to the perceived safety of my front yard. My lungs burned so bad, I just dropped flat on my back and spent a couple of minutes getting myself back together. As I entered the front door, I was still huffing a bit. My brother was already back home, and when he saw the state I was in, he laughed at me and said, What's wrong? The boogeyman chase you? Did the little baby get frightened by all the monsters? He said it all in a very condescending baby talk type tone. He was being his usual idiot self, but I was too distracted by what had just happened to be mad at him. All the excitement and running I'd been doing had left me exhausted. I just walked into the kitchen and dropped my bag of candy on the floor in front of my folks and walked upstairs to bed. I was barely able to get out of my costume, but I eventually did and quickly fell asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night I dreamed that the phone was ringing out in the hall but since I was so tired I couldn't wake myself up to see if the ringing was real. When I came down the next morning to eat breakfast I was still a little groggy. While I sat at the table waiting for my food my dad asked me when I had last seen Brian the night before. As soon as he said this I was instantly sucked back in time. Every second of the night flashed through my memory like a video on fast forward. All the fear I'd felt was right there with me, as if it had only just happened that minute. I wasn't sure why he was asking me this, but I was terrified it had something to do with the man in black. Although I was afraid of what I'd heard, I asked him why anyways. He answered in a calm voice that his parents had called here looking for him last night because he never came home from trick-or-treating. My heart started pounding and I could feel sweat beating up on my forehead. I could see the fear emitting from my parents' faces. Even though I wasn't sure what it all meant, I knew it couldn't be good. All I said was that we had gone trick-or-treating and when we'd had enough, we'd split up and went our separate ways. That was the last time I'd seen any of my friends. I'm still not sure they believed me, but they had no reason not to. The urge simmered quietly inside of me the urge to blurt out the whole crazy episode, every little detail, but I suppressed it. I had no idea what Brian was doing. Maybe he decided to run away. But I sure didn't want he or any other kids at school to think I was a crybaby tattletale. If it turned out that teenager that had chased us around and scared us did something to him, I didn't want him and his buddies to find me and beat me up. These are some of the crazy things that go through a kid's young mind pretty sure it was a teenager dressed up in some outfit and my friends probably believed the same thing even if no one said it. No matter if it was an older kid dressed up it didn't make it any less terrifying. After all this was the kind of nonsense teenagers did to little kids isn't it? For all I knew it could have been my brothers chasing us around. He seemed to be rather knowledgeable about what was going on that night. At that point That was the extent of the experience I'd had in that area. I wasn't quite old enough to realize life got any worse. I had yet to discover how cruel and terrible adults could be to one another, and certainly not to children. In my world, the adults were the authorities and the older kids were the ones who bullied or beat you up. Things never got any darker than that. Rumors surrounding Brian's disappearance tore through the school. We were all a little scared and confused about the adults' reactions. Their attempts at stopping a panic from spreading was pointless. 
Every kid present that day could read the fear on their faces and just because we weren't all old enough to know why it was there didn't stop us from seeing it. One by one, Brian's friends were called to the office. A pair of police officers were joined by a counselor as they asked each of us a load of questions. Most of them were about the previous night. Despite the immense pressure on us, no one mentioned the man in black and what had happened. We never discussed it or practiced together what to say, it just seemed to be a given. It wasn't until I got home from school that I heard. My mom sat me down and told me that Brian was dead. Apparently during a search of the woods that ran between our side and his side of the neighborhood, his body was discovered lying in the creek bed at the bottom of a giant hill. We used that area to pass back and forth to each other's houses all the time. The hill was actually one side of a super high creek bank. Kids in that neighborhood had been climbing up and down both sides of that creek, leaving a few well-established trials probably since before I was born. If I hadn't already been afraid, hearing this definitely left me paralyzed. My mom asked me in a very concerned sounding voice if I understood what was going on. I just nodded and said nothing. Looking back on that, I'm surprised I didn't start bawling. I think I was just too afraid. As far as if I understood what was happening, I certainly did. Now that they found Brian dead, it was way too late to tell anyone what we had experienced. Every adult in town was going to be furious if we said anything now and my parents would have grounded me until I was 18. Just like a kid, more worried about being punished than his dead friend. That evening on the news, the story of Brian's death was the hot lead. From what I can remember, nothing was said about anybody pushing him or disposing of his body in the creek. The theory they had at the time and the decision the authorities eventually came to was that it had all been a horrible accident. The assumption was that he was running, in a hurry to get home, and tripped on his overloaded trick-or-treat bag causing him to tumble down the steep hill, breaking his neck. Hearing this reminded me of a moment that night before when I had done something similar. I was in a full speed run fleeing the final time from the scary man and tripped on my bag of candy. I very nearly went head first onto the pavement but I caught myself at the last second and stopped myself from wiping out. Once I had thought back on that, their explanation seemed possible and for several years after that I decided that was what had happened. The weeks following Brian's death was stressful, however, with the passage of time, my life was taken up with other equally as important life-altering situations. As I grew older, I would slowly lose my innocence and become the angst-ridden teenager many of us end up becoming. One particular eye-opening thing happened as I sat with my parents watching some cookie-cutter TV drama. Honestly, I wasn't paying very close attention until something about the show caught my eye. A man was holding a woman at gunpoint, and he had something sheer covering his face. This image drew me back to that Halloween night. For a moment I wasn't sure why, but then the answer clicked in my head. The man we had been running from was wearing the same thing or something very similar on his face. This is why his face had looked so scary. I asked my mom what was on his face, and she told me those were stockings something women used to wear on their legs before pantyhose became popular. I wasn't really worried about their purpose, but finally knowing what I had seen gave me a great feeling of relief. I was glad to know that we hadn't been stalked by some freaky looking monster. This epiphany unfortunately reopened another far more terrifying idea from the past, the possibility that Brian had been killed by that guy in the mask. I had grown up since then and I would seen enough movies to know that kids get taken out by creepy strangers all the time and nobody knows it. I remember I had asked Steve a few days later what had happened after we split up. He told me that the man did follow them at first, but the point at which they separated at his house, the man was nowhere to be seen. They both just assumed he gave up or went after some other kids. Brian walked off toward home and that was the last time he saw him. I know I never saw that scary guy again, but I'm sure none of the other guys had either. I have no doubt they would have said something if they had. 
Sitting here the last few days and writing this all down, I've been reminded of a lot of great memories and a few terrible ones from my childhood. Even though I've had my fair share of terrifying occurrences in my life, and I may share some of those in the future, the hair-raising events of that night and the tragic ones that would follow were the first to leave an actual permanent scar on my memory. To this day, I still can't be sure what was the real cause of my friend's death. I've often turned the facts over in my mind. Just getting there, we have to decide who or what was actually chasing us that night. Friend, foe, or perhaps something we've yet to identify. I recognize that this question is much less important than the how, but nonetheless, it still plays a part in the mystery. Reaching the true goal, we can finally ask the how. Was Brian pushed to his death by the man in black? Did he truly just trip on his bag of candy while running as quickly as his short little legs could carry him while wearing a vision-obstructing mask in the dark? Not to mention, carrying the terror with him of being pursued by an unknown entity, always expecting it or him to pop up out of nowhere. Maybe this thing renewed its chase and Brian, out of sheer terror, flung himself from the cliff, not thinking of the drop-off ahead of him. Heck, it could have been caused by something I hadn't even considered yet, or all of these things at the same time. I'm doubtful that myself or anyone will ever know the truth of how Brian lost his life. I haven't even really discussed the possibilities of this all being the result of some prank gone horribly wrong, and the teenagers were way too terrified to come forward and take the blame. At the end of the day, I haven't even considered the chance of this anonymous person abducting him, doing his awful act, and disposing of his body where he was found. As you can see, the web surrounding this mystery is elaborate indeed, but when it comes to me, I think I've achieved my goal of passing the facts on to you the way I remember them. I think this is where I'll bow out and leave this enigma for another person to muddle over, at least for today. Happy Halloween, and thanks for listening. With Halloween coming around, I thought I would share something terrifying that happened to me a few Halloweens back. While it doesn't involve creepy ghosts or monsters, I guarantee it terrified the life out of me and still does today. At the time this happened, I wasn't currently enrolled in school, but most of my friends were attending our local county community college. Four of them, two guys and two girls, had been living together in a house roughly two miles away from the campus. In the early weeks of October, I received a text from one of them saying that they were planning a big party the weekend before the 31st at their house and I was invited. I said yes, of course, and made sure to tell my boss I would be taking that weekend off. Normally, I would have gotten a bunch of pushback, but I had accrued more than enough vacation time to cover it. A couple of days prior to the party, I realized I would be attending the party alone, and that's certainly no fun, so I asked one of the girls from work to join me. She didn't want to go without her boyfriend, so I reluctantly agreed. I wasn't trying to complain, I just simply didn't know the guy. I've never liked drinking around people I didn't know, so I was relying on my other friends to protect me from anything creepy happening. The night of the party arrived, and I chose to show up a little early so I could help my friends get everything in order. A few hours later, the other attendees began trickling in, and by ten or so, the party was raging. Sometime after 11, the first keg was floated. One of the guys at the party helped me tap the other one and pump out the foam. Since he was the one with the nozzle, I handed him my cup to fill. At exactly the same time, a friend I had not seen in years came up and said hi. When I looked back to the keg, the guy had filled my cup and handed it to me. Being a nice little girl, I thanked him and my friend and I walked off to catch up. We spoke for a good 15 or 20 minutes before nature called. After I peed, I began feeling really tired. Considering I'd been drinking for several hours, I figured I just needed to rest until I got my second wind. I searched a couple of rooms before I found an unoccupied bed I could lay on. After I closed my eyes, I don't remember anything other than what I thought was a dream of my friend's boyfriend throwing me on his back. I remember thinking it was a real weird thing to dream about. My next memory is of a bright, cold room. People's voices faded in and out, similar to tuning a radio. 
When I opened my eyes and the room came into focus, the urge to vomit overtook me. After I barfed, I heard the voice of my work friend next to me. I remember specifically I wanted to say something, but I was way too tired to stay awake. I must have fallen asleep again and slept for a while because when I woke up, the sun was shining in my face. It was so bright it made me sick to my stomach. Now I was much more coherent, but I felt like I had the worst hangover in history. My friend's voice was there again. I fought the heavy feeling in my eyelids until I could finally get a clear look at my surroundings. I was in what appeared to be a hospital room. The girl from work and her boyfriend stood next to my bed and they both had a happy but still concerned look. At first, I tried to speak, but my throat felt super rough and congested. I cleared my throat and asked, What happened? Did I get alcohol poisoning or something? Every word hurt to say and my voice resembled tires on gravel road when I heard it. No, I'm sorry honey, but it, it looks like somebody roofied you. Don't worry though, no one assaulted you, you just, just get some sleep and we'll talk about it all when you're feeling better. I was concerned about what I just heard, but she fortunately said nothing happened, so I wasn't too terrified, at least not at the time. Sleep took me once more, and other than waking up once or twice briefly, I slept through the night. That morning I was far more lucid, but the sick feeling was still with me. When I opened my eyes, my friend from work was still there standing at the foot of my bed, but at least now she had a smile on her face. I found out later she went home for the night and returned that morning. How do you feel? I let her know I felt much better and we spoke a little while before the nurse came back in with food. Not much of it got eaten, but I was thankful for a cup of orange juice that came with it. This was the first time we'd been able to really talk since it happened, so she briefly laid things out for me. The following will be her words describing the events of that night. Jeff and I hadn't seen you for a while and I became curious of where you were and a little worried. I made Jeff come with me as I waited through the party, asking people if they had seen you or knew where you were. Everyone said no, so I began looking, going room to room, checking if you were in one of them. When I came to the third door, I opened it and saw two guys standing over a girl who was asleep on the bed. I took a couple of steps into the room and saw that it was you. When I looked at the guys, they both had a sheepish look on their faces like little boys who had been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. This made me really uncomfortable. Jeff must have known what they were up to because he walked up behind them, looked them in the eyes and told them that unless they wanted to get the life beat out of them, they better leave. That's just what they did. I didn't recognize either of them, but you may. If we see them around again, I'll point them out to you. I tried to wake you up, but you wouldn't move. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't get you to wake up. What little energy you had, you used to fight me. This is why I had a feeling you'd been drugged. I asked Jeff to help me get you out of there into the hospital. I was certain your condition wasn't due to beer. I'd spoken to you less than an hour before we found you and you looked completely sober. Since I hadn't much luck in getting you to wake, Jeff just picked you up and threw you over his shoulder, kind of like a bag of flour. Despite the context, I couldn't help but chuckle. You fought him a little, but nothing he couldn't handle. We whisked you away to our car and brought you to the ER. They did some tests and they came back positive for a cocktail of roofies and a couple of other drugs. The doctor said you were lucky because combining those amounts of drugs with alcohol could have easily have killed you. I didn't mention what situation we had found you in at first, but once the test came back, it seemed like the right thing to do. They contacted the police and Jeff and I spoke to a couple of officers about the party and how we found you. Since you're awake now, don't be surprised if they pay you a visit. That's it. Everything up until today. Now that I've heard about how close I came to being assaulted, I was starting to freak out. I didn't hesitate to thank her and tell her to tell Jeff how truly thankful I was. Just like she suspected, two cops showed up later that day, a few hours before I was discharged. I honestly didn't know how I'd been drugged and couldn't think of anyone who would have wanted to do that to me. Of course, my mind was still a bit hazy. I promised them if I remembered anything, I'd call them right away. When I made it back home, 
I figured I should call my boss and tell him I needed a few more days off, but when he got on the phone, he was very compassionate towards me. He mentioned that Gail, my friend from work, had already contacted him and explained my situation. He told me I could take as much time as I needed and hoped that I was feeling better. After I thanked him, I hung up. Never in my entire life had I ever expected that man to show anything other than contempt toward me. Goes to show some people aren't all that bad, and sometimes they can surprise you. That evening, I had a little to eat and turned in just after eight. The next day was spent curled up on the couch watching Netflix. At lunchtime, I was able to eat an entire sandwich. It was nice being able to get my appetite back, since my stomach was still growling a bit. I checked the cupboard for some snacks and noticed a pack of red Solo cups out of the corner of the eye, and then bam, it all came back like a gunshot. The guy who had helped me with the keg was staring me in the face. Then the entire scene replayed in my mind. My friend coming up behind me and saying hi. I turned away to talk to her and look back to see the same guy holding out a red Solo cup. I take it and say thank you. In less than an hour, I was unconscious. He had to have been the guy that drugged me. The only problem was I didn't know his name or even who he was. I'd never even seen him before. I do remember that he was cute and I was planning to strike up a conversation, but that was before my old friend interrupted. Now that I had a good idea of the culprit, I was excited to tell the officers. Then the realization hit me it would be a pointless exercise without a name. Thinking on my feet, I quickly called up one of my friends that lived in the house. She didn't even know about what had happened to me. Some friend. No matter. I asked if she knew who the guy was, but she didn't. She did offer to ask the other three roommates, but when she returned to the phone, she said none of them had any idea who he was. It's likely he was just a crasher or was a guest of another student. This sunk my hopes of solving the case quickly. I didn't bother to call the officers and tell them. My only real hope now was that someone turned him in, but I wasn't holding my breath. It is possible he was one of the two males in the bedroom with me, but Gail nor Jeff recognized them. It looked like I was SOL. That's how it all ends up, pretty much. I've went on with my life and done my best to put the whole terrible mess behind me. I do admit that I was real shaken up a while, but I've made an effort to use it as a learning experience. Since then, I've separated myself from that group of people and stopped going out to drink. I'd known them for a long time, but their indifference towards the girls' safety at their party made me so angry that I just began to think less of them. It's been almost three years since that party, and I've never heard from the officers again. As I expected, nothing ever happened. This Halloween will be a quiet one for me, celebrated at home with my boyfriend. If you go out... Be safe and don't drive if you're drinking. If you're a female, be very careful. Don't let your drink out of your sight. Don't take a drink from anyone, sealed or not. Most importantly, don't drink too much and lose control, especially around strangers. No matter the environment, that one heartless creep could be waiting for the right opportunity to make us move. Don't become a statistic. Being unsure of how to begin this story, I figured the best way would be to just come out and get to the point. On Halloween night, I was 12. I almost killed my best friend. Rather blunt, I know, but it happens to be completely true. I do suppose I should probably provide a bit of context so everyone reading or hearing this won't go away with the impression I'm a total psycho. I'll do my best to explain myself in this situation without being too long-winded. The story goes something like this. The house I grew up in was located on 30 acres, about 6 miles outside of the nearest town. It had been in my family since just after the Civil War when my Confederate veteran ancestor moved to the state from Louisiana. The first house that he built upon buying the land burned down within 5 years, so he was forced to build the one my family had been inhabiting for the past 140 plus years. It wasn't anything grand, but was enough for my parents and I to be happy in. The distance from town meant I had to take the school bus back and forth every day, 
and I didn't have many friends close by to play with. Some weekends I would spend in town with kids from school and others, those friends would ride the bus home with me and spend the weekend on our farm. As a teenager, I didn't think there was anything to do, but as a younger kid, we never ran out of things to occupy us. One specific weekend happened to coincide with Halloween, so my folks told me to invite a handful of kids out to the farm. Obviously, we couldn't trick-or-treat in the middle of nowhere. My folks loaded us all into the suburban and brought us into town where they were having some kind of candy handout at the mall. When it was over, we went back to the farm and played some games on my PlayStation for a while. That got boring eventually and asked if we could go outside and play hide-and-seek. My mom said yes, but we had to be back by 11pm. I'd always had less restraints on me when I was growing up. Being out in the country meant you had to allow your children more freedom than to the kids in town. Where I grew up running the woods, hunting rabbits and squirrels and walking miles across open fields to go fishing was the norm. Most of my friends couldn't even leave their yard without an adult going along. I can only assume that's how everyone in the family grew up and my parents didn't see anything wrong or dangerous in it. The night was a perfect one for hide and seek. The temperature had yet to grow cold and there hadn't been any rain in several weeks. I gathered all the boys in a circle and laid out the boundaries and rules for the game. A few of them had stayed over the night before so they were pretty familiar with the area. I guess at this point I should mention that our house stood across the road from an old 19th century cemetery used by the surrounding farm families. It was used all the way up until the 1960s when they ran out of space to bury the dead. I'd grown up next to it so I wasn't scared to play there but when I mentioned that it was inside the hiding boundaries, a couple of the boys got kind of freaked out. I assured them the place wasn't haunted and only after a lot of coaxing and a small bit of shaming, I convinced them to play. We played a few quick games of rock paper scissors until we had our seeker and began the game. Me and another boy ran straight for the cemetery and found their hiding places. I'm not sure where the others went. Once the seeker finished counting, he started the search. Two or three made it to the tree that served as a home base pretty fast. We in the cemetery were the last two left. The seeker was soon combing the cemetery for us. The boy that had hidden there with me blew past the kids seeking and made it home untouched. I tried to do the same thing, but the boy was ready this time and I became it. The game started again and when I finished counting I headed to the most used hiding spots first. I did have an obvious advantage but lack of a moon made seeing in the dark very difficult. A few boys got past me within the first minute. You know the ones that hide so close to the home base they can almost touch it. There's always one or two of those in the game but the remaining two were hidden really well. What seemed like ten minutes or so later I still hadn't found them and I was beginning to get sick of looking. Right before I was about to give up, my best friend Troy popped up from under a rotten log on the edge of the cemetery and made a break for home. The hiding place he was in forced him to run away from the road and deeper into the cemetery. Then he cut back towards the road, bringing him dangerously close to me, but I missed him as he passed. We were both running our fastest, however, I was just a bit quicker and right on his tail. All he had to do was make it across the narrow road and the six or so feet to the tree and he was home free. We were perhaps just a little less than halfway across when this old blue and grey truck came barreling down the road. It was so close by the time I first saw it, I could have reached out and touched it. Maybe not, but darn near it. I did the only thing I could think of doing and threw my body against Troy's in the hopes I could knock him out of the path of the truck. I don't remember being worried about myself, just him. He was my best friend after all and I'd known him as long as I could remember anything. I slammed shoulder first into the ditch and it hurt like a mother. Almost positive the truck had run him over, I looked just in time to see Troy rolling toward me. Miraculously, he was okay other than a few scrapes and a little road rash. I pounced on him and checked for any signs that he had been hit but found none. My hands were shaking and I felt like I was about to barf but so relieved I started chuckling like a lunatic. I looked up the road and the truck was nowhere to be seen. This wasn't scary as much as confusing. It was after 10 o'clock at night and a truck I'd never seen came barreling out of nowhere, 
down a road that saw maybe two or three cars during the course of a day, and very rarely after dark. The thought sent a shiver through my body, but wouldn't really begin to trouble me until much later. I helped Troy up and we did our best to shake the near miss off. The other boys were in utter disbelief that we'd survived and kept asking us if we were okay. I was a tad sore and I imagined Troy was about the same. Some of the boys were scared. I could tell by their expressions that they may start crying any minute. This was the last thing I wanted to happen. I repeatedly assured them that we were completely fine and there was no need to be upset and in a few minutes they began to calm down. I made all the boys promise not to tell anyone but especially not my parents what had happened. My biggest fear was that I wouldn't be able to play outside after dark anymore. Also if the other guys folks heard about it they may not let them stay the weekend anymore. I barely had any friends as it was. The game was over for the night after that and it was getting close to 11 anyway so I called it. We returned to the house and played games until it was time to go to sleep. The remainder of the holiday we spent our time building a fort in the woods behind the cemetery. That ended up being the last game of hide and seek for the year. Soon after the first of November, fall finally began in full. As we grew older, the weekends at the farm became fewer and fewer. A few of the boys there that night got other friends and one boy, Nicholas, lost his life after his car was struck by a train at an unmarked crossing. Despite this, I look back at those days with an endless happiness. I still talk to Troy about it once a month. He's currently stationed at Fort Hood in Texas with his beautiful wife and two daughters. We never fail to laugh at how close we came to getting killed that night, only to be overtaken by confusion and fear surrounding the circumstances in which it happened. As for me, I'm in the process of moving back to the farm with my new wife. My dad and I have been building us a new home a few acres away from the old one and hope to soon be moving in. I moved into town right out of school because i have been offered a job at one of the manufacturing places and stayed there until a month or two ago when I began my own business working out of the house. I told my wife many times how fun it was growing up there and we agreed there isn't any other place we'd want our kids to grow up in. Seeing as Halloween is coming up soon, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, not just Halloween. Don't forget the night is really for the kids. Let them have as much fun as possible while they still can. And one more thing, please don't forget to remind them to look both ways when crossing the street, not just when they're trick-or-treating. It should really apply to the rest of the time, too. As we slowly enter the fall season, I'd like to share a story with you that happened to me a few years ago. I have mentioned this story to some of my close personal friends and family, many of which don't believe me, and that's fine. They probably think I'm just joking around or trying to scare them, but I know I experienced something that night and I wish I had a better explanation for it. At the time these events took place, I lived on a quiet street a little outside the city but not quite into the suburbs. My street had a big rundown house at the very end of the block that was across from an unused parking lot and an out of business bar. The person who inhabited the house before it became dilapidated was Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan was an old curmudgeon in every sense of the word. Every time my friends and I would walk by the house, she would yell at us and make some insanely random comment like we were trampling her garden or using her garbage to play hide and seek or some other incoherent nonsense that wasn't true. Even though my friends and I did get into some adolescence trouble around the neighborhood, we never did anything to Mrs. Morgan. Our parents always told us that we should try and be nice. I mean, she was a widow and had no children, so it must have been a pretty lonely life. Rewind about three years ago when Mrs. Morgan unfortunately passes away, and the house becomes abandoned and, I believe, eventually condemned. At least there were signs on the boarded up windows and doors, but I never got close enough to read what they said. Needless to say, it became an eyesore for the community in what was a pretty quiet and uneventful street. My girlfriend at the time only lived a couple of blocks and I would usually walk to and from her house when we hung out. It was literally a four minute walk top so it was no big deal. 
I would pass Mrs. Morgan's abandoned house and the empty parking lot with the out-of-business bar every time I walked to and from her house. Now fast forward to a few years ago, the last time I ever made that walk. It was about 3am on Halloween night, I guess technically November 1st, and I was walking home from my girlfriend's house. I was supposed to be home way earlier in the night, but we both fell asleep watching scary movies and pigging out on the extra candy her parents didn't hand out. As I made it to my street and started my walk past Mrs. Morgan's house, I heard a noise. I stopped for a minute to make sure it wasn't a skunk because for some odd reason that's the first thing that popped in my mind when I heard the noise. I slowed down a little bit and looked at the house as I proceeded cautiously. That's when I noticed the front door that was usually boarded up and had a sign posted on it was now open. I tried to rationalize why the door was now open, saying to myself it was probably the wind, but then again, it was a beautiful calm night. I then paused in front of the house and looked directly at the front door, and that's when I saw her, Mrs. Morgan, right there, staring back at me. I knew for sure it was her, but how? She had passed away and the house was clearly unlivable for anyone else. At this point, I was so scared that I just shouted something out. I don't even remember if it was words or just noises. The figure stepped onto the front porch and continued to stare at me. I broke my stare and just started running back to my house, turning back every now and then to see if she was still staring at me or perhaps following me. I made it back to my house probably 30 seconds later and opened the side door and went down to my room. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I'm not sure if I was overtired or just had scary things in my subconscious with it being Halloween and watching movies all night, but I know I saw Mrs. Morgan standing there only a couple of feet away from me. Whether it was a true paranormal encounter or something that my mind made me think I saw, I will never know for sure. But hey, they always say that the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest on Halloween, and now... I actually believe it. When I was 21, I lived with my two friends, Bruce and Ollie. We lived in a small house in a nice family-friendly neighborhood in the suburbs of our major city. Ollie owned the house and occupied the master bedroom on the main floor, and Bruce had the other bedroom on the main floor. My bedroom was on the mostly finished basement, which was great because I had a ton of privacy and a lot of open space. There was a side door that could be accessed from the basement so I could come and go as I pleased without bothering the other roommates. We were all pretty close, but it was nice to feel like I had my own living space, even though there were three of us in the house. At the time, Bruce and I were huge fans of Halloween and the fall season in general, but being adults and having full-time jobs... It wasn't really ideal for us to go out and attend Halloween parties like a lot of the other people we knew. Also, Halloween fell on a Tuesday this year, so instead we decided to just watch some horror movies in my basement bedroom and just hang out and relax. After we watched a couple of movies, we started to get a little bored. It was about 11pm and the trick-or-treaters were home and most people were in for the night. Knowing we had to work in the AM, we decided it would be a good idea for us to go on a quick walk and call it a night. There is something about the air on Halloween night. It's like when you go on a vacation to Florida and the night breeze just feels and smells different. That's how it is on Halloween. It's nostalgic and can almost give you a euphoric feeling. Anyway, as we started to walk in the quiet and somewhat desolate neighborhood, we approached the park. Now we walk through this park all the time during the day, probably at least 50 times at this point. It was a little park right in the middle of the neighborhood. The park had a main entrance from one of the busier streets and a back entrance from the street we lived on. The back entrance was covered with a lot of trees and a very small wooded area. About 30 yards from the entrance, there were three baseball fields, a pavilion, and a basketball court. We walked into the back entrance where all the trees were and it was nearly pitch black, but there was a low orange hue from the street light barely making its way through the trees. As we walked through the wooded area, we both stopped abruptly. We thought we saw a man standing at the end of the path. The figure was completely still, and it was so dark we couldn't be sure what it was. I called out, Hey! to the figure, but 
No response. I suggested we should turn around, but Bruce said we should check it out, which was unlike him because I was usually the braver of us two. As we got closer, it was clear it was a man standing there. The man was completely still and had both of his hands in his front hoodie pocket. His head was down facing the ground. Trying not to freak out, we decided to slowly back up and make our way to the street and our house without further confrontation. Before we even moved, we heard a noise next to us coming from both sides. Trying to focus our eyes in the darkness, we saw two more figures moving towards us in the woods. Unlike the other guy just standing there, these people were approaching us. I wish I could explain the feeling I felt inside me during this point. It's like the sinking pit in your stomach when a cop pulls up behind you with his lights on but 100 times worse. Fighter flight kicked in and we turned and sprinted full speed out of that park and onto our street never looking back to see if they were following us. We ran right to our house and locked the doors behind us. While sitting in the basement, we had all the lights off and we were trying to look out the basement windows to see if we could see if anyone followed us or possibly saw the house we went into. We were so scared we didn't know what to do. Were we in real danger? Was it someone just playing a prank? After about half an hour or so, we decided that they most likely didn't follow us and it was probably okay to go to sleep, especially considering we both had work in the morning. At about 2.30 in the morning, Bruce woke me up. He said he thought he heard something outside his bedroom window. I went to his room and looked out the window and I could see a pumpkin laying in our backyard. This was concerning because we didn't have any pumpkins outside our house. We didn't set any up for decorations or anything like that. For the second time tonight, we were terrified and decided to go into the living room. While in the living room, we made sure we had the house lights off and began looking out the front windows. Within the first minute of looking, there they were. Three men standing in the middle of the road just staring at our house. We thought about calling the police, but what were we going to tell them? There are three guys not standing on our property who may or may not have thrown a pumpkin in our backyard. We just sat in the living room for about 10 minutes trying to think of something, anything we could do. We made sure the front door was locked and grabbed a baseball bat and I think a kitchen knife. We looked out the window again and the three men were gone. Nothing but the illumination from the street lights. For the rest of the night we stayed in the living room watching Sports Center until we eventually dozed off. Morning finally came. As we got ready for work, we just agreed it was probably just a Halloween prank and we should move on and forget about it. However, when I got to my car, there was a note on my windshield that said, Happy Halloween, with a smiling face sticker on it. What I read next gave me the same feeling I had just had a few hours before when I thought we were in real danger. At the bottom on the paper it said, P.S. Good thing you lock your doors. What would these people have done if the doors were unlocked? Bruce and I both decided to call in from work and stay home that day. Nothing else of note happened regarding this incident, but it's just a reminder that it doesn't matter how quiet and nice a neighborhood you think you live in. On Halloween, anything can happen. Alright, so you guys might not find this creepy or scary enough, but I thought it was worth sharing. This is something that I experienced when I was a kid, probably between the ages of 10 to 14. Our Halloween tradition was that my parents and I would meet up with my godparents and their son and go trick-or-treating around our neighborhood. This has been a tradition with my older siblings as well, so it's fair to say this tradition has started even before I was born. Anyway, we follow the same route every year. The highlight being stopping at the local funeral home that was only about three blocks from my house. The funeral home had a big party in their parking lot every Halloween. They provided cotton candy, candy apples, donuts, cider, popcorn, balloons, and probably even more, all free. If you wanted a balloon, which every kid did, you had to shake the hand of the person in the full-on movie set quality gorilla suit. I hated doing it because the gorilla shook your hand so hard I borderline thought my hand was going to break. So every year it was the same thing, if you wanted a balloon you had to shake his hand. 
I developed kind of an anxiety as it related to the gorilla, so I would just grab the snacks to avoid the person in the gorilla costume. Also, I was getting older and I really didn't care about balloons. But it seemed as though the gorilla would follow me around and put a balloon out in his right hand like he wanted me to take it. I tried my best just to avoid it and hurry my parents on so we could continue trick-or-treating. They thought it was the funniest thing that I was scared of the gorilla. I really don't think I was. I think I just thought it was weird that a grown man dressed in a costume would shatter kids' hands in order to give them a balloon. So this story revolves around one Halloween where we followed the same routine as previously mentioned. I ignored the person in the gorilla costume when it came to that part of the night and had a pretty uneventful night trick-or-treating. I remember I was still at the age where I had a bedtime and my parents had to check my candy. Yes, they were those parents. I was still impressionable enough that horror movies scared the crap out of me and I couldn't even watch them because then I couldn't sleep with the lights off. For whatever reason that night I felt particularly uneasy and scared. I had avoided scary movies so I could get a good night's sleep, but for some reason I was unsettled. I ended up sleeping on the floor with my chocolate lab and my dad passed out on the couch, which gave me some sense of relief. I got up in the middle of the night to let my dog out. I knew she had to go out because she was pacing back and forth. She was quick and came right back in, but on the way back to the living room I saw something in the street. It was a figure that seemed to be just standing there. I crept up to the window on my knees to get a better look so I couldn't be seen. I swear to God it was that gorilla holding the balloons, literally standing right outside my house. I didn't know what to do. I was scared, but more scared that this person was going to approach my house. I woke up my dad, who was snoring so loud I was surprised the neighbors weren't awake. I told him there was someone outside, and he got up immediately and opened the front door, but there was no one in the street no one around at all, at least that he could see. I told him what I thought I saw and he said it was probably just a bad dream or my imagination. We turned the TV on in the living room for a while because I think he could tell I was unsettled and was having trouble trying to fall back asleep. I can sit here today writing this and honestly tell you, I don't know what happened. I never had any other episodes where I thought I saw something that wasn't there. I don't sleepwalk. I don't often have nightmares. I don't know how to explain what I saw. It was a long time ago and now I'm an adult who takes his own niece and nephew trick-or-treating, but every time around fall I always think about this experience and try to come to a logical conclusion to explain what happened. I still can't figure it out and probably never will. I wonder if that funeral home is still open and if the guy in the gorilla costume is still there. Let me start this story by saying I have only shared this story with a few people up to this point. I trusted a few close friends who I thought would believe me, but that's about it. I can remember the events of this specific night vividly. My parents own a camp on a local lake about 25 minutes from my hometown. It's pretty awesome to go there, bring friends, and basically do what we want. My friends and I would usually throw smaller parties out there all summer long. There was always activity on the lake, but nothing that really ever raised any alarms. We kind of just chalked it up to either boats, wind, or animals if we thought we saw something in the lake after it got dark. One Halloween night, I decided it would be a good idea to skip the Halloween party that was taking place in town and bring my boyfriend back to the camp house for the night so we could be alone. My parents thought I would be at said Halloween party and would be spending the night at a friend's house. We arrived at the camp pretty late around 9 or 10 p.m. One thing I remember about the camp is how dark it was, void of any street lights and usually only illuminated by the stars in the sky. My boyfriend and I stayed up for a couple of hours talking, eating, and I think we played a board game or something like that. I would guess we fell asleep at some point after midnight. After about an hour or so of sleeping, I woke up suddenly to what seemed to be a loud blast, like a gunshot but distorted somehow. I just remember it being so loud that I couldn't even remember where I was when I woke up. I looked over the couch and my boyfriend was somehow still asleep. I got up and looked out the back door window which had a view of the lake. I saw something that looked like a light, 
or a ball of light over the lake. I stared at the floating light in confusion trying to figure out what it was. Was it a flashlight or something glowing from under the water? Without really thinking, I slipped on my flip-flops and I went outside and approached the shore, still staring at the light, squinting my eyes trying to make out what it was. It was an orange-colored light, maybe 75 feet out into the lake in what seemed to be floating a couple of feet off the top of the water. After about two minutes of continued staring and squinting, the orange color changed to a bright purple and several white specks of light came out of the purple glow and hovered all around the glowing orb. As I started to freak out as to what this could be, I was forced to my knees by the loud blasting noise I heard earlier. I started to plug my ears, collect myself, and turn back to the house to grab my boyfriend. I saw a huge flash, and the next thing I remember was waking up in an Adirondack chair on my neighbor's yard the next morning. My flip-flops that I wore outside to get a closer look at the lake were gone. I had no idea how to explain the events of the night and, long story short, I went to the doctor and after seeing neurological specialists, they don't show any sign that I could have had an episode. I've been told that it was most likely a vivid nightmare and that I was sleepwalking and that's how I ended up on my neighbor's porch. Also, that would explain why my boyfriend never woke up. However, I believe this night I saw something otherworldly. I don't believe in the paranormal and until this point I didn't believe in the extraterrestrial. But this didn't feel like a nightmare. It felt real. I can still see the images and hear the noises from that night. I know many of you may not believe my story and that's fine. But I feel like I wanted to share the experience I had that night. I'm no longer with that boyfriend and even though he was concerned for my well-being, especially immediately after the events, I don't think he really believed my story either. Needless to say, I spend less time at the camp and am reminded of this night every year around this time when Halloween decorations start popping up in the stores. The events of this story took place when I was 18 and in my senior year of high school. I'm 27 now and still have horrible flashbacks from that Halloween night. My friends and I liked to party in high school, and Halloween was obviously one of the best nights to go out and party. We got to dress up in sexy outfits and have an excuse to act a little crazy. My friends usually drew all the attention from the guys we went to school with. I was still friends with all the boys, but none of them really ever showed any interest outside of friendship. Anyway, on this particular Halloween, we had a party at my friend Steve's house. Like a lot of high school parties, no one knew how to handle their alcohol. At about 11, the cops had already been called for a noise complaint. The party scattered and everyone ran as to not get detained or get their information taken by police. My friend Amy, who was getting into a car with her boyfriend, told me to jump into the car with her friend Dave and he would take us to another party, which I begrudgingly decided to do. The car ride was weird. Just him and I who didn't know each other and didn't really have much to say. Awkward. The car smelled like Slim Jims and body odor and looked rather messy. Dave had a mask, which was on his lap while he was driving. He had a hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, and brown work boots on to complete the costume. He also had a scraggly beard and greasy hair. I tried asking questions to make the drive less awkward, but... He didn't really answer them and didn't seem interested in holding a conversation. Finally, I asked what school he went to and he responded, I dropped out of college a year ago. So I asked, well, how old are you? He responded in a shaky, almost nervous voice, I I'm 25. This freaked me out a little bit because he was older than me and he just dropped out of college at the age of 25. Also, he was 25 and was just leaving a high school party. Trying not to let him in on the fact that I was kind of nervous, I asked, So, how do you know Amy? And he responded in his shaky and unflattering voice. He said, who, who, Who's Amy? I sunk into my seat, pinching my sides, not knowing what to do. She's the blonde who told me to get in the car with you. He responded with a very stoic, Oh, her. Yeah, she told me you were single. 
I didn't respond. I honestly didn't know what to say. Did this guy really not know Amy? Or was he just tipsy and confused? I texted Amy as we were driving to tell her how angry I was, but she didn't answer. About 10 or 15 minutes in the car, which seemed like forever, we arrived at a house. It didn't seem to be a very nice part of town, or at least an area I was accustomed to going to parties. I looked for Amy's car, or any car I recognized, but it was just too dark to point anything out. We approached a red door with chipped paint lit up only by a dull front light. Dave didn't even knock and just walked into the house, so I followed him, hoping to see a familiar face. The house was cold and smelled awful. We walked into the front room, which I assumed would be the living room. It was dirty and had an olive green shag carpet with an old brown couch. The walls were white with chipped paint and stains everywhere. Piles of pizza boxes and beer cans lined the floors. The room was only lit by one lamp that was on the floor and it gave off a very low light. On the brown couch there was a man and woman sitting very close together but not really moving. They looked to be passed out or maybe just drunk. We walked into the kitchen, which was just more of the same. Trash and that horrid smell of garbage. In the kitchen, there was a man probably in his 20s who looked like he may have been using. He gave Dave a high five and introduced himself to me as Skip. He looked at Dave and back at me and smiled. His yellow teeth and bug eyes made my skin crawl. The other man in the kitchen was an older gentleman, maybe in his 40s or 50s. I couldn't tell. He said nothing and just looked at me. I felt sick to my stomach, and the only reason why I didn't run out of this place was because I had no clue where I was, and had no clue if these people were capable of anything dangerous. Again, I texted Amy with no answer, deciding to not call as my phone only had 5% battery. Dave escorted me into the back room, which was kind of like a screened-in porch. I felt a brief moment of relief seeing about 6 or 7 people out there. There were only two girls out of the bunch and they were half naked and looked like they weighed a maximum of 90 pounds. I could feel everybody staring at me but at least there was a group of people and I wasn't secluded or alone with this Dave. I know it sounds crazy but I felt almost safe being around this larger crowd but this temporary relief faded very quickly when the two girls left with all the guys who had been on the porch. They re-entered the house and disappeared out of sight. As I sat in this screened-in room trying to think of my options, Dave finally spoke up and said, I think you're really cute. I said thanks and kind of shrugged it off. He got up and started to rub my back and began breathing very heavily. After about five minutes of the most unpleasant back rub I had ever had, he stepped in front of me and asked if I wanted to go somewhere more private. I said to him in a terrified, cracking voice, I'm... Sorry, but I'm not that kind of girl. I could see the displeasure and anger in his face, and I could feel the tears coming. Then nothing short of a miracle happened. One of the girls who went inside just a minute before began to scream erratically, swearing and yelling at everyone in the room. Dave ran upstairs, leaving me downstairs in the back room alone, and without even thinking twice, I got up and climbed out the window and ran. I didn't care that I didn't know where I was, I wasn't going to stop until I was to a gas station or a 7-Eleven or something. I was running down the street, staying close to the sidewalk, trying not to bring any attention to myself. After what seemed like a few minutes, I luckily approached a 24-hour Walmart. I walked in and had the night manager call my parents as my cell phone was now dead. It was about 30 minutes from my house and my parents were on their way. Just as I thought I could relax and try to put these horrifying events behind me, Dave and his friend Skip walked into the Walmart. They didn't see me, but I couldn't believe that they were in the same store. They were looking around like they were looking for something or someone. Was it me, or was I being paranoid? The next day, Amy called me and apologized all day, crying and asking what she could do to make it up to me. I got some solace that she confirmed the person I got into the car with was actually Dave and not some random guy, but was still left traumatized thinking about what could have happened. It's been almost 10 years since that night and I know it could have been a lot worse and I'm lucky that I was able to leave with no physical harm but still wouldn't wish the experience I had that night on my worst enemy. I haven't seen Dave, Skip or 
any of the people I saw that night and hope I never do again. Halloween has always been one of my favorite nights of the entire year. From the pagan origins to the more modern take of trick-or-treating, corny movies, and dressing up, I just can't get enough. One Halloween, similar to many others, my friends and I decided that we were going to go trick-or-treating. Now, admittedly, we were probably a little old, but it was our tradition, and we always had so much fun. We went from house to house getting candy and getting some looks from parents who probably also felt we were a little old. It was a largest group of people, including my current crush at the time, which made the night even more fun. The houses in this area were the ones that gave up full-size candy bars, and most people had their homes all decked out in state-of-the-art Halloween decor. As we approached one of the last houses before we were going to call it quits, I noted a particularly scary figure on the front lawn. It looked like a person waiting to jump out and scare us as we walked by. It was a tall figure with a white mask and black covering the eyes. It was hard to tell if it was a mannequin or a person because it was so still. As I walked by, the tall figure grabbed my arm, causing me to almost crap my pants. The man got down to my face and said in a slow, soft voice through his mask, Tag, you're it and then ran into the backyard of the house. We all screamed, laughed, and ran to the front door for candy. Of course, we just assumed this was part of the homeowners trying to scare people who were trick-or-treating. We got our candy, and as I walked away, I turned back to the lady in the doorway and said, That tall guy was really scary, but you might want to tell him not to grab people so hard as they walk by. The woman looked at me like I had grown a second head. I asked if she was alright, and she responded in an almost nervous voice, you're the second young lady tonight to tell me the same story tonight. My husband's inside and we don't have anyone set up outside to scare you kids. Now I'm officially creeped out. I ran to catch up to my friend still thinking it was still all possibly part of a scare and the lady was just messing with me. The group of us stayed out for a little while longer. Some of us broke off from the larger group and began to walk back to my house. We decided that first we were going to walk by the house where the incident had occurred earlier in the night to see if the tall guy was set up for another scare. When we walked by it, the entire house was black, like they had ran out of candy or left for the night. From the sidewalk, I looked into the backyard and there, the same guy with the white mask. He waved at me and my friends told me to just ignore it and it was obviously someone who lived there and was trying to scare us. Once we were almost to my house, I looked back and saw the guy was following us. I yelled, Hey, what's your problem? The entire group then turned around and tried to duck out of the way so we wouldn't see him. At this point, I think my friends could tell I was getting generally freaked out. Once we got inside, I felt more safe and my mind was able to drift away from thinking about that guy. We all hung out for a little while, trading candy, gossiping, and watching TV. Occasionally, someone would make a comment about me being scared of the tall man, and we all laughed and just had some fun with the situation. Once my friends left for the night, I got ready for bed. I was sitting in my bedroom, taking my makeup off, and I just glanced out my window. And there in my backyard was a person. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought I was seeing things. I went downstairs into the living room to see if I could get a better view of the figure in the yard. The tall man in the mask was now at my back door and was trying to break into the house. He was shaking the door handle and trying to open the door. I screamed for my dad, and then he saw I was standing there. He just looked up and waved at me again, just like before. My dad came barreling down the stairs and the guy didn't even move. My dad called 911 and luckily they were nearby because they showed up in two minutes. They arrested the guy and took him in from the backyard to the cop car. I'll never forget how he looked. They removed the expressionless mask and somehow his real face had even less of an expression. He was clean cut with short dirty blonde hair. His eyes didn't even blink and his mouth remained shut. There was no expression, almost a lifeless look. But as they put him into the cop car... He took one last look back and a creepy smile came across the lifeless face. 
a smile of a person who clearly didn't have a full comprehension of what was going on. I still think back to that Halloween night, and even with how bad that experience was, I am thankful it wasn't worse. Halloween night is always accompanied with a feeling of fear, even if it's a small amount, perhaps it's just psychological, but there always seems to be an eeriness to the night at least in my experience. During the events of this story I lived in a small quiet town in the upper northeast region of the United States. My hometown is filled with lots of forests and being somewhat of an outcast I would usually just hike on the trails around my house. I would get out of school and just walk for hours before I came home. The older I became, the more deep into the woods I would go. When I was 16 years old, I found this little cave tucked deep within the woods. It was probably about 200 yards or so from the main road. The cave sat at the base of a small cliff about 30 feet high. It had a pretty big opening and the deeper you went into the cave, the more narrow it became. The cave seemed almost man-made, like it was carved into the side of the cliff. About 20 feet or so into the cave was the back wall with all of these strange rock formations of all different sizes. Also off to the right there was a small little tunnel that I tried to explore one time but gave up due to the fact that it was barely big enough to fit through and not to mention it was accompanied by pitch blackness. So for the next two years I would often visit this little cave. When I would have difficult days in school or just needed to get away from home I would go. I would read there, meditate, or just listen to music. I would always think of crazy origin stories for the cave like it was some kind of special place with an interesting backstory. In reality, it was probably nothing of the sort, but it was fun to imagine the possibilities. My senior year of high school, I decided I was too old to go trick-or-treating and I didn't have a friend who even asked me to do anything, so I thought it would be a really great idea to get some candles and go to my little cave and read some scary stories. I figured since Halloween was on Friday, I could stay out all night and read. My parents trusted me and really never worried about me because I was responsible but had never gotten in any kind of trouble before. At about 9pm I gathered all my belongings for the night and started my hike to the spot. I wanted to wait until about 9 o'clock-ish so all the kids were off the streets and it would be really quiet. From my house it would probably take me about 45 minutes or so to get to the cave. I know for some people that may sound crazy to walk that far, but for me, it was therapeutic to be outside in the crisp fall air, especially on Halloween night. Shortly after 10, I started to close in on my destination. As I approached the large opening of the cave, I thought I could make out a low orange flicker coming from the walls of the cave. I turned my lights off and slowly approached. I immediately felt disappointment as I crept slowly to the opening. Someone else is using the cave, I thought, but what I saw was not somebody reading or just hanging out. There were four women in the cave, probably late 20s or 30s, all holding hands. They were standing in a circle and seemed to be speaking in unison, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. There must have been hundreds of candles lit because it was illuminating the entire cave, even several feet outside the cave. I couldn't make out what the women really looked like but they sort of looked ragged or dirty, their clothes being loose and baggy. I sat and just stared at these women for several minutes trying to figure out what they were doing, which turned out to be a huge mistake. As I sat from the bushes and observed, the women suddenly stopped chanting and abruptly turned and stared at the small hole in the wall. I swear at this point I heard a growl coming from the cave, not like a growl from a dog, but something different, something distinctive. I saw a movement from the small tunnel inside the cave, and before I knew it, the four women all snapped their heads back and looked right at me, looking at me through the bush. But how could they see me? It was pitch dark out, for God's sakes. All four women in perfect sync slowly brought their fingers up and pointed at me, and in a flash, they all began to run at me. I turned and ran as fast as I could. As I made my way towards the main road, all I could hear was screaming and laughing, or was it crying? I didn't know, it was hard to tell. As I was closing in on the main road, I turned one time to see if the women were still behind me, and not only were they behind me, 
one of them was inches from me. Her teeth were yellow, her eyes were big and black, and she had the most haunting smile I've ever seen. I turned and ran as fast as I could, never looking back again. I got home that night and just cried because I had no idea what else to do. I'm now 26 years old and still have not gone into another forest by myself. I'm not sure what I saw that Halloween. People playing a prank. I honestly can't tell you, but I know that I never went back to find out. Road Rage by Eric Kuhn Barreling down the exit at 80 miles an hour, for Josh, driving was a competitive sport for which he had no safety concern for himself, his Corolla, or anything else. Getting off the exit, he slams on his brake and stares down the trail of 5 mile an hour traffic that stretches out before him. He swears under his breath and instead of immediately merging, he races to the end of the merge lane. Here, He ends up next to a green Honda Civic and tries to cut in front of him, but for some reason the Civic isn't letting him over. Josh moves forward, but the Civic matches his advances. What a jerk. Can he see him trying to get over? Josh hasn't lost a game of chicken yet and he wasn't about to let this be the first. This guy better have good insurance, Josh thinks, as the two cars inch closer and closer to each other. He would wear a scratch or two on his car as a badge of honor, but he didn't want to speak for the other guy. Right before the front left headlight of his Corolla kissed the front right headlight of the Civic, the green car stops and Josh pulls in front of him. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Josh joins the sea of cars, intending to forget about the green Civic and continue on his journey. Honk, honk, honk. Josh slams on his brakes and glares at the green car behind him through his rearview mirror. Oh man, this guy. Josh wasn't a stranger to messing with people in traffic, and he could mess with this guy for as long as he needed. The Civic's front left turn signal flashes yellow, but Josh decides to be one step ahead of him and merge to the left lane, staying in front of the Civic and preventing him from moving ahead of him. Josh slams on his brakes and the Civic does the same. If only his reaction time was a little bit slower, I could claim he rear-ended me. Josh could feel the rage coming from the green Civic and laughed. He felt like Emperor Palpatine. This time not using his turn signal, he saw the Civic lurch to the right back into its original lane. No, no. Josh slides into his right lane and slams on his brake once again, still ahead of the Civic. This time, the Civic stalls and lets Josh drive away. Smell you later. An hour later, Josh is sitting in Rockwood Diner, picking from a plate of chicken wings and fries. Thinking back to the incident with the green Civic, he was proud of how he acted. He was perfectly calm during the entire thing. His heartbeat never even got up to a minor panic rate. He sloppily sticks a whole bone in his mouth, sucks the sauce off of it, and spits it back into the plate. The bone makes a loud sound when it hits the porcelain. Other patrons are staring, but Josh doesn't care about them. He's enjoying himself, wiping barbecue sauce onto his shirt and belching like Jabba the Hutt. While sucking on one of the bones, a loud horn outside makes him jump, and in one quick second, the bone slides down his wet tongue and into his throat, where his next breath freezes in place. For the next few seconds, Josh sits in silent stillness, trying to breathe in harder and harder, only trapping the bone in his throat more and more. Suddenly, his trachea clenches shut and Josh starts to bang madly on the counter. The patrons who were staring before angrily now stare in horror. Josh, feeling his chest and neck tighten and constrict, falls off his stool and onto the floor. His vision becomes blurry as his brain loses oxygen. People around him start screaming and someone grabs the phone to dial 911, not knowing the gesture would be futile. Someone runs up to him and looks at him in horror. Josh's lips were turning a dark blue and his eyes are bulging out. Before he dies, Josh looks out the window. He sees a chorus of black dots circle around the setting sun, and a tear rolls down out of his eye. Mainly because he can't hold them that high anymore, his eyes look down at the parking lot. Right in his field of vision, he sees a skinny, tall figure standing in front of a green Civic. 
that was smiling. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, strangers don't always have the best candy. <laughs>